Merlin's Air, Book 2 of the Beast Brigade series by Matt Tyler, available on Amazon and YouTube. Chapter 1, Little Fox. A wisp of fog curled through the narrow cobblestone lanes of Constanta, as if the very air sought to strangle the scant light from the street lamps. The mist swirled in the wake of a young boy, sprinting as if the devil himself were at his heels. His breath came in ragged gasps, each exhalation forming a cloud in the night air. The only witnesses to his flight were the houses lining the roads, which in the fog resembled ghostly rectangular monsters, their windows like the eyes of spectres watching his passage. Behind him, a trio of half-glimpsed wraiths glided effortlessly, patches of darkness, with eyes glowing an eerie crimson. They were vampires, and they reveled in the hunt, their laughter filling the air as they closed in on their prey. The boy's eyes darted frantically looking for refuge. He made a split-second decision and veered into an alley, his slight frame barely squeezing through a narrow gap between two buildings. Shrieks of amusement followed him. Where did he go? One voice called out in mock disappointment. The boy glanced back as he ran, but though he'd heard them clearly, the trio hunting him seemed to have vanished. He followed the alley to its end, racing out onto another street where he saw one of his pursuers, a dark cloaked woman. She growled at him like a beast, and he ran as fast as his legs allowed, fleeing from the sounds of her low malicious cackling. He dashed through a fence opening, tried a door handle, which was locked, then raced to another. Also locked, he ran back out onto the street. Help, he called. Help! Shutters closed, lights went out. The people of the neighborhood where the poor boy found himself offered him no aid against the gang of vampires who'd been prowling their streets for weeks. Dismayed, he checked to see which direction his home was. It was a long way, but he might make it. But not everyone would leave a boy out on the streets alone. An old woman opened her door and shouted, Let him be, you ghouls! She carried on, calling for the police, for a priest, for an angel. She gestured for the boy to run to her. Come now, hurry. He darted her way, but a fiend leapt in front of the old woman and stretched out his hands, fingers tipped with sharp claws like the talons of a raptor, and rushed towards her. She yelped and slammed shut her door and the vampires howled with laughter, while the boy swiftly changed streets, veering left. He'd never run so fast. The mist curling about him touched his face with tiny, frigid kisses. Every sound of an unlatched shutter tapping in the wind, or leaves rustling in trees, renewed his terror. Objects in the fog took on frightening profiles, and more than once he pivoted away from some black shape, barely glimpsed, thinking it was one of the creatures. After a time, it might have been a minute or an hour, he concluded that he'd not seen his pursuers for several streets and slowed. He jogged into a dark alley and hid. For a moment, hope surged within him. His chest heaved as he leaned against the cold, damp bricks, drawing in ragged breaths and clutching his knees. He looked behind him and saw no signs of pursuit. A sigh of relief escaped his lips, just as a shadow fell across him. He looked up and his blood froze. One of the vampires hovered above, hanging upside down from the eave of a nearby roof. The creature's face was an abomination of beauty like a marble statue in a state of decay. A twisted smile revealed elongated fangs, stark white against his ashen lips. His eyes glowed an unholy red, casting a malevolent luminescence that seemed to pierce the boy's very soul. You're a good fox, young one, the vampire hissed, dropping to land silently on the stone. The boy's heart sank. He turned to run, but the other two vampires materialized from the mist, blocking his path. The first was a woman with flowing white hair cascading over a tattered ebony gown. Her eyes shone with red hunger, devoid of humanity. The second was a hulking brute, his disheveled appearance contrasting with his unnaturally graceful movements. He looked as if he'd just walked in out of a farm field, fresh from the plough, accepting his ghastly skin, unnatural eyes, and the long claws he held in front of him that seemed to writhe in the dim light. The three vampires stepped forward in unison, bearing fangs that shone bright in the darkness. Just as the lead vampire reached for the boy, a gleaming blade sliced through the air, severing the creature's outstretched hand. A guttural growl filled the alley as Hank Bravo stepped into view, his eyes ablaze with a feral light. Enough. Hank Bravo emerged from the shadows of the room, 
brandishing a sword inlaid with silver. You will not harm this child. There was a clank from the shadows, heavy steps, another clank. Radu, Hank's loyal companion, emerged from the darkness, rusty broadsword in his hands, his desiccated body clothed in an ancient chainmail overcoat. A good evening to you, fiends, he said with a fierce scowl only slightly ruined by his large blue-white glowing eyes. The vampire's heads bobbed in the air like snakes waiting to strike, their faces contorted in rage. The wounded one clutched the stump of his wrist, black ichor oozing between his fingers, but the woman stepped forward, a cruel twist to her smile. Foolish hunter, we've been looking for you, she seethed, then, as if summoned by her words, more shadows leapt from the rooftops, landing gracefully. Some wore remnants of noble attire, tattered and blood-stained, while others wore the garb of commoners, their clothing ravaged by time and violence. Their eyes shone with a ghastly red light. Soon a half-dozen of the blood-sucking monsters surrounded Radu, Hank, and the boy, each one a grotesque parody of humanity, twisted by their dark curse into something nightmarish. The vampires closed in as Hank and Radu stood protectively before the boy, who shivered against the cold brick wall. His wide, terrified eyes darted from one monster to the next as he murmured fragmented prayers, hoping these mysterious men could somehow save him from the creature's thirst. Hank tightened his grip on the sword, reassured by the familiar leather of the wrapped hilt digging into his calloused palm. His piercing gaze tracked the vampires as they fanned out to surround their prey, their footfalls unnaturally silent. Beside him, Radu hefted his immense broadsword, the rusted metal scraping against his ancient male hauberk. This appears to be a trap, Hank, Radu informed him. Despite the peril, Hank's lip quirked in wry amusement. Trust Radu to lighten the mood with his innocent appraisal of the situation. Totally without guile and fiercely loyal, Hank had quickly come to rely on his indomitable friend. He gave Radu an almost imperceptible nod. It was time to let Blades decide this matter. These beasts were just another nightmare to be slain so that others could walk the streets in peace. With a collective hiss, the vampires attacked, a blur of gnashing fangs and talons. But Hank and Radu were valiant fighters. They moved with practiced efficiency, guarding each other's flanks with calm assurance. Hank's sword flashed repeatedly in the fog, biting deep into cold, dead flesh, steaming where it contacted the silver-inlaid blade. The acrid stench of smoke and rotting meat enveloped him. He dodged left, felt the rush of air and fangs snapping at his throat. A vampire collided with Radu's ready sword, crumpling into dust with an unearthly wail. One of the larger creatures, unnaturally fast and graceful, charged Hank, knocking aside his sword, which clattered to the ground. Hank's pulse was already racing, and now, unarmed, the beast was clawing at him from the inside, working hard to get out. It felt like hot lava coursed through his veins instead of blood. He fought away the wolf in his breast and nearly died because of it. The vampire clawed his chest savagely, yet Radu was there, his own pitted blade taking the monster's arm. Hank settled back against the alley wall, bleeding and in agony. The pair of vampires still able to fight mercilessly closed in. One went for the boy. Radu rushed to intercept this attack, but it was a ploy. The other used the opportunity to go for the wounded Hank. He had no desire to give in to his beastly side, yet he must live. He released his restraint. Hank became aware as dawn's cold blue light was chasing away the fog. He crouched atop a grassy hill, a river spreading below him. In his hands, he held a bloody piece of bone. He dropped it in horror and stumbled back. Blood covered the grass and the city was a dark smudge in the distance. You are a man again, Henry Bravo, Radu asked, stepping from some trees. Raw terror clutched Hank. Did I harm the boy? No, though it was a near thing, you swiftly defeated that enemy and then took care of mine as well. But afterwards you went for the boy and I had to discourage you with Pommel Drake to get you to let him be. Hank sighed with relief. The boy was unharmed. Did I attack you? No, you never tried to harm me. That was curious. Perhaps some vestige of conscious thought had come to him while he was changed. But why had the metamorphosis caused him to lose himself? When he had changed during the battle in the village outside Norilla Castle, he had kept a grip on his self-awareness. Of course, that had been weeks ago now. He had not changed since then and didn't know what to expect. 
Now he knew he'd lost control again. This complete loss of control, awareness and memory frightened Hank. He looked down at the bloody bone he'd been gnawing on. A lamb, Radu told him. Hank's stomach gurgled, sour. He made a face at the blood and bone. Distasteful, yet he also yearned to pick it up and chew on it some more. He fought off this baser instinct and shivered, was damned cold without clothes. Radu had thought of that. He tossed Hank some garments. Here you are. I thought you might like to walk back to the city dressed rather than naked as the moment you were born. Hank nodded to his friend. Thank you, Sir Radu. As they walked back towards the city, Hank considered what had happened. He couldn't lose control like that again or someone would get hurt. He must find a method to control it. Tibet. He must get to Tibet. Chapter 2. Constanta. The perpetually chipper Radu frowned and sighed, and Hank believed he knew why, though he did his best to ignore his friend. Hank sat hunched over a sturdy wooden table, writing in his journal with a flickering candle nearby, the light being more a matter of habit than necessity. With his enhanced wolf sight, as he was starting to think of it, he didn't need extra illumination. He looked at what he'd just written and read it aloud. Alas, another day in Constanta, a lovely seaport, though we wished to be away on our journey. He scratched absently at the rough stubble along his jaw and glanced up at the ornately framed but shabby mirror on the cracked plaster wall. A pair of faintly glowing golden eyes stared back at him. He experienced a moment of disassociation where he saw the face of a stranger. The scowling figure with its dark countenance effortlessly blended into the shadows as if it were an extension of the night. And those eyes. He found them unsettling. It was him, however, the new Hank Bravo. Werewolf. Gentlemen, this last, he thought with a sardonic grin. Am I a former monster hunter, Radu, or a current one, he asked. His stalwart companion, the zombie knight, Sir Radu Tanase, knight of Transylvania, stood nearby. We hunted those vampires to extinction, did we not? Hank grunted. A distant woman outside the window bellowed angrily and he tensed, but then another faraway person, judging by his slurring a drunken man, answered with just as fierce a shout, their argument no concern of Hank's, he supposed. There were taverns and dens of ill repute near the hotel, and every night there was at least one tussle and plenty of shouting, both in gaiety and anger. Tatiana, the lady of Norilor, had given him a purse of gold and silver, and they might have secured more suitable lodging. But Hank thought it best to remain unnoticed and to conserve the money for the long road ahead. He sighed heavily, the sound hollow in the cramped room. Hank Bravo, once a celebrated man, toasted in the finest spots on the eastern seaboard, was now what? Certainly, he was no celebrity. He missed the comforts of his old life, but even more, he missed the man he used to be. The elixir he'd drunk with Tatiana deep in the mountains of Transylvania offered some control, but the beast still wanted to rage inside him. He hoped that somewhere out there was a more permanent cure. There was a secretive knock at the door. Hank caught a scent of chemicals and an unwashed body, the pungency of herbs and plants. It's our chemist, he said to allay Radu's concerns. Hank opened the door a crack. Mr. Smith, the small balding man asked. He held a brown paper bag. Hello, Dr. Popu. Hank let the man in. The chemist was a nervous sort and sweat stood out on his forehead. His suit was threadbare and he was generally disheveled. I have medicine, Popu told him, handing Hank the bag. You match the formula? I match it most well, a very interesting arrangement of ingredient, the chemist said, his English stilting. How does it work? One dose per day, that is limit. Do not take more. Take it before breaking fast. Hank glanced inside and found a brown bottle of liquid, along with a few small dose drams with lids. Even with the stopper secured, it stank, but it smelled very near the old formula Hank had given the man, though his keen nose caught one difference. I smell alcohol. Surprised, the man rubbed the back of his neck. Yes, I diluted with alcohol as solvent to dissolve ingredients. Keep lid closed and won't be problem. I was unable to discover what preservation liquid was in old formula, 
Shaka briskly before partaking. Hank handed the chemist two gold florins, which the man grasped with dirty fingers and held in a white-knuckled grip tight against his chest. Hank had found the man working as a compound mixer in the back of an apothecary. A former licensed chemist, Popu was addicted to opiates, an alcoholic, and slept in a small closet near the shop where he worked. Radu detested the man, which was why Hank spoke to him in English instead of having his friend converse in Romanian. It was also the reason that Radu was carrying on as he was, sighing and frowning. Hank told the shabby man, I'm going to try this tomorrow and if it works I'll come and buy more. The chemist nodded, his eyes alight with the prospect of more profit. If it doesn't work I'll also find you, Hank warned. The man drew himself erect, straightening his shabby coat as if to put on an air of respectability. Don't worry, don't worry, the chemist said. You try. If work, you purchase second batch. If not, I fix. He exited the room like a hare pursued by a wolf. Radu reproved Hank. That was foolish. I doubt you procured what you ordered. It's worth a try, Hank replied. He'd given the chemist some of the partially successful elixir that Tatiana and he had made in the caves below Norilor so that the man might match it using the sophisticated devices at the apothecary shop. It might harm you, mayhap even kill you, Radu warned. True, or it might give me the control I need. The ghoul frowned, unhappy but unwilling to argue further. Hank went back to the desk and set the package down. A faint sea breeze blew into the room billowing the sheer curtains of the window at his back, the fabric pressing against him. Sense of Constanta came to him, the smell of the ocean harbour nearby. Sea odours partially masked the smell of waste from densely populated areas. The tang of brick buildings, wood smoke so omnipresent, Hank had to think about it to notice it. And something else. He sensed a particular blend of sense in the air, but being inexperienced in the wolf game, he suspected it might be false. Inhaling again to see if he could catch it, he smelled horses, cows and other animals. Grilled sausages, cornmeal and cabbage rolls, wafting up to his room from kitchens all over the neighbourhood. All normal. Perhaps he'd been mistaken and no. It was there again, gun steel treated with oil, wood, leather belts and wool uniforms. Was his sense of smell accurate? And if he smelled police or soldiers, what did it mean? Is there anyone on the streets? Hank asked. There are three drunkards and a woman seeking company, and I think one boy skulking in an alley who is a thief, the zombie replied. All normal, eh, Radu? Satisfied with his friend's keen eye at the window, Hank still had a sense of unease. Perhaps it was the strange sense in the air. Soldiers, he believed. Perhaps it was their present difficulty. He and Radu were having no luck finding passage to Tibet, the land where Hank believed he might find respite from his curse. Part of the issue was his reluctance to select a suitable route, though he was aware that no matter which they chose, the going would prove lengthy and difficult. There were three options that most travellers used to get to India from southern Europe. First, there was the overland route. This path would take months of difficult travel over notoriously unsafe caravan routes. Hank did not favour this option, though it might be safest for his fellow passengers. Second, they could travel around the Horn of Africa. This route also required months of long, hazardous travel. Hank sat back in his chair. He needed to calm himself. They would find a way. Likely they would take the third route, which was becoming more common in recent years. This method involved taking a boat across the Mediterranean to Alexandria, then traversing rail or van routes across Egypt to the Red Sea, followed by a steamer through the Gulf of Aden to Bengal. From there, They'd use a riverboat up the Ganges, followed by an arduous overland trip, travelling through a country Hank didn't know at all, but which he'd been told was some of the most forbidding in all the world. I hope my answers lie in the mountains of Tibet, he said, mostly to himself. Radu, however, heard him and nodded, determination etched into the lines of his decayed face. Don't worry, Tovarish. No matter how far or how long it takes, we'll find a cure. A faint smile tugged at the corner of Hank's lips, despite the uncertainty that clouded their future. Having Radu by his side was a comfort he couldn't put into words. The loyal knight had pledged an oath to help Hank, and the quest meant everything to him. I'll go back to the port tomorrow, Hank said while closing his inkwell. He lay on his bed. Perhaps there'll be a ship. 
Indeed, Radu concurred, while gazing into the darkness beyond the window pane. As a gust of wind rattled the glass, he suddenly stiffened, his spine straightening like the haft of a spear. Hank, we have visitors. The warning made Hank's heart race, his pulse pounding in his ears like the beat of an ancient drum. He leapt to the window and followed Radu's gaze, spotting a formation of soldiers and police officers marching toward the inn, their lanterns casting eerie shadows on the cobblestone street. Damnation, he muttered under his breath. Perhaps they are not here for us, Radu said. His jaw dropped open and his eyes glazed over. Another of his fugues. They seemed to appear more often of late. After a few moments, the knight shook himself. Who are you? Where am I? Where is King Vladimir? Hank spoke gently to comfort his friend. Long gone to his eternal rest, good Sir Knight. And Princess Veronica? There was pain in the zombie's eyes now. Then he settled. Ah, my apologies, Hank. I lost myself for a moment. From below, the clinking of rifles, clomp of boots, and rattling of swords in hands brought Radu back to their current predicament, and he clapped his hand to his cheek. They're coming. What do we do? Hank thought a moment and then told his friend exactly what they'd do. But out on the rain-slicked street, the soldiers moved as one. There were Turkish officers among them, distinguishable from the local soldiers by the red fez hats they wore, topped with golden tassels. They sat on horses looking bored, while the police captain did the work. Stay vigilant, men, the captain barked, his features hardened with grim determination. They say the target is a cunning and dangerous foe. Do not let your guard down. Yes, sir, the men replied in unison, their voices echoing through the rain-slicked streets. The captain gave the signal, and the soldiers surged forward, their boots pounding against the wooden floor like an ominous crescendo. The splintering crack of the door being kicked open shattered the tense silence, sending a shockwave through the cramped room. Hank's eyes widened as soldiers flooded in, their muskets aimed and bayonets affixed with practiced precision. The lead officer barked a crisp command in Romanian that Hank did not understand. The man's uniform was immaculate, the crisp lines and polished brass buttons a testament to his authority. Three soldiers strode towards Hank, one with manacles in his hands. They gave him more incomprehensible orders, snarling and jabbing bayonets towards Hank's chest. They asked him questions and grew angry with his shrugs and responses in English, their faces pinched and full of suspicion, their bodies smelling of fear. The wolf blood thumped in his veins. He could unleash the beast and tear through these arrogant soldiers. Though he would likely die in the attempt, he would enjoy the feeling of clawing away at them first. He'd kill several, he bet. No. He breathed deeply and put his hands out, and the soldiers roughly slapped the manacles on him. The men moved with ruthless efficiency, upending furniture and slashing dingy pillows. When they came to the wardrobe, it took only moments to find Radu's dismembered body parts neatly stacked on the shelves. The soldier who found the gruesome evidence cried out in alarm. Others gathered around. The grisly remains startled, even the captain. He barked more orders. They bagged Radu's body parts and carted them away. Flanked by armed men, the soldiers roughly led Hank downstairs and out into the night. A small crowd had gathered at the inn's entrance, roused by the noise. Some watched the spectacle with curious eyes, while others were less sympathetic. With a shove, the guards forced Hank down the cobbled street towards an uncertain fate. Chapter 3. London. The dignity of the Privy Council of Great Britain would not allow the assembled lords to physically throw Dr. Albert Frail out of their presence, no matter how much they might desire that result but they did make it clear that he should depart with haste, or they'd call the guards. We haven't time to listen to ghost stories, Frail. There's work to be done, one of the council members bellowed near the end, as close to anger as they'd let themselves stray with a commoner among them. When finally, he'd loaded himself down like a mule with his presentation materials, only dropping his map case twice and scattering his papers once, he bid them good day and departed. Dr. Frail remained unfazed by the rejection of his ideas, even by such an august panel of lords. He'd never given much credence to the opinions of others, 
Not that he was an arrogant man, far from it, but he had a certain advantage over most he'd found when undertaking complex reasoning and hypothesis. It sometimes took others a while to catch up, he knew. Frail had the special gift of confidence that many truly brilliant people do, meaning that he didn't doubt for even a moment that his cause was just. In point of fact, he found himself angry as he departed the council chamber. Head hung low and muttering, he trudged along, thinking he might enjoy charging back in there and giving those stuffed shirt buffoons the what for. It had served them right if they lost India, because they wouldn't listen to him. Adrift in his thoughts, he didn't see the man stepping out into his path until they nearly collided, causing Frail to cry out and drop a significant portion of his belongings once more. The man, an aristocrat by his bearing, wore a dapper suit and carried an ivory-handled walking stick, his eyes direct and calculating like a diligent tax collector reviewing his books. "'Your conclusions are sound, Dr. Frail, but your request was doomed to fail,' the man pronounced. Frail stooped and tried to gather up his scattered materials once more. He was surly, and so replied with, "'I'm most grateful for your assessment. Perhaps you should have given me that advice before I spoke with the council.' Perhaps I should have, the man said. I did not expect them to be so disagreeable, Frail said. A weakness of those who believe they have nothing else to learn from the world, I found, the man said. An interesting observation, mister. My name is Ernest Primcourt. Frail stopped retrieving his dropped items and eyed the man cap to toe. He was special aide and counsellor to the Queen herself. How may I help you, Count Primcourt? Frail asked. Perhaps we might help each other. Primcourt said, crouching and gathering some of the spilled items. Soon they had it all in hand. Primcourt asked him, Have you heard the story of John MacDougall, the surveyor? With that, the aide to the Queen took a few strides down the hall, and Frail hurried to catch up, calling out, I have not. Primcourt slowed to allow Frail to walk beside him, then told him, He claims to have seen a sword in a remote temple far into the hinterlands of India, a curved blade cloaked in shadow, no matter if it was day or night. Frail's voice held a note of awe. The Chaya Talwa. I'm sorry? Primcourt asked. The Shadow Sword, Frail translated the Sanskrit. Perhaps it was near a volcano whose walls were sheer black rock. Narakund, Frail whispered, more than a touch of awe in his voice. Primcourt gave a clipped nod. It might have been Narakund. Did this surveyor describe the sword? Frail asked with suspicion. He was sure there was many a fine blade in India. Primcourt fashioned the shape of a bend in the air with his hand. The blade curved and tapered, with the inner half resembling the white of bone, and the outer half resembling the black of pitch. It possessed a fanciful black sun gem for a pommel. That sounds like the shadow sword. Was there nothing else? An inscription which the good Mr. MacDougall attempted to replicate. I can show it to you if you wish. Oh yes, I certainly wish to see it, Frail said, his mind bouncing around, thinking of all the questions he suddenly had. I must interview this surveyor. Ah, uh, I wish that were possible. He expired shortly after returning from the jungle. Frail said with solemnity, How unfortunate. May he rest in peace. May he rest in peace, the Count echoed. He must have undertaken his work with a team. Might I speak with one of them? Frail asked. Not unless you've a method to converse with the dead, I'm afraid. Mr. MacDougall was the sole member of the jungle expedition to emerge from the jungle. Frail came to an abrupt halt. The entire expedition is dead. Primcourt did not slow, waving for Frail to follow. A dangerous place, India. Frail's breath came in quick gasps, but he fought off the coughing fit, attempting to work its way up his throat, and once again caught up with Primcourt. The assumed dangers of India did not lead to his coughing fit. Rather, his blood quickened and his lungs seized at the thought of the sword found at last, actual evidence beyond his books and scrolls. Such excitable notions always constricted his chest, throat and lungs, making him work for his breath and cough to the point of choking. By providence, this time he fought off the invisible iron snake, which wanted to throttle him almost immediately. He realised that was not the only miracle occurring. There was another... He turned to Primcourt. It sounds as if you believe me. Count Primcourt beckoned Frail towards a pair of beautifully trimmed double doors. Two intricately dressed guards with tall spears guarded them, 
and a powdered man, also richly garbed, stood nearby. At Primcourt's approach, the guard stepped aside, and the powdered man opened the door. I'm not the one you need to convince, Primcourt said, gesturing toward the opening. Frail wet his lips but found it difficult to speak. Finally, he managed. Who is inside that room? Primcourt drew himself to rigid attention, then announced, Her Majesty Victoria, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland Queen, Defender of the Faith, and most importantly, for this discussion, Empress of India. Dr. Frail, eyes wide and mouth agape, allowed Primcourt to lead him into the room. Chapter 4. An Offer Leaning his head back against the damp stone wall of his fetid cell, Hank wrestled with the wolf inside, which felt like holding the leash of a large, unruly dog that had spied a rabbit. The room within which the soldiers confined him was cramped, dark, and reeking of mildew urine and unwashed bodies. He longed for a breath of fresh air to clear the foul miasma, but the tiny grated window near the ceiling provided only a feeble wisp of relief. Shadows clung heavily in the confined space, broken only by thin shafts of daylight that slipped through the bars of the door. The cell's gloomy interior matched the darkness in Hank's mood as he sat hunched on the lumpy cot, the only furnishing provided. It had been two days and Hank was ready to bear his claws and tear right out of this stone-walled prison. That was not just a dream or a fancy. He had the power to do so. Why not exercise it? If he decided to go, the door wouldn't stop him for long, even with the thick wood and iron reinforcement. The beast would shred it to splinters. But Hank kept tight control, taking deep breaths as Tatiana had taught him. He must obey the law. If he ignored the laws of the land, he was no better than the werewolves who attacked livestock. He repeated the wise young Tatiana's words, pulled from his memories. Calm yourself. The beast feeds on your fear and anger. You must control the beast. It does not control you. Though dubious that simply strengthening his mind would help him prevail against the vicious wolf blood, Hank tried to follow her guidance. It was mostly a frustrating experience, yet he believed her when she told him there were places in Asia. Among the Chinese and the Japanese, the people of Tibet and the Hindi, where monks controlled every part of their bodies completely. After what seemed an eternity, Hank heard the heavy door to his cell screech open on rusty hinges. He looked up to see two faces standing in the doorway, lit by the flickering orange glow of a torch in the hall. It was Bella, her dark hair bound up in a rigid bun at the back of her head. She wore her customary black, though she'd refrained from donning a cloak today, which meant it must be quite hot outside. Her piercing eyes watched him intently. Beside her stood a man Hank didn't recognize, dressed in a fine three-piece suit of dark wool that looked starkly out of place in the dingy prison. The man held himself with a rigid posture, his hands clasped neatly behind his back, and an air of pompous formality surrounding him. His neatly trimmed moustache and stern visage gave him the bearing of a government bureaucrat or law official. To call Hank surprised would undercut it drastically. He eyed his pair of visitors speculatively as he slowly stood up, the frame of the bed creaking. Well, Hank, you've looked better, Bella said, her tone conversational yet guarded. She spoke with her usual directness. Hank, with a raspy voice, dryly mentioned his liking for the accommodations, while pointing out the limited menu and lack of sheet changes. Bella's lips quirked in a hint of a smile. Before her expression turned serious again, she glanced at the man beside her. Allow me to introduce Count Ernest Primcourt, a representative of Great Britain's government. We're here to assist you. Primcourt stepped into the cell, peering at Hank with his chin held high. His fine leather shoes squeaked on the grimy floor. He glanced at the surroundings with distaste and didn't offer his hand. Mr. Bravo, my superiors have an urgent need of your particular skills, he began, one eyebrow raised as if he was asking a question. I'm authorized to negotiate the terms of your release, contingent upon your cooperation. Hank's eyes narrowed with suspicion. Why would the British government want anything to do with a supposed monster like him? Sensing his suspicion, Primcourt added, I understand you may be hesitant to trust me, but this mission is of the utmost importance. The very future of the Empire depends upon it. Hank considered these words. 
He wanted to know why he should care about the British Empire. Instead, he asked, What help can I offer? Primcourt replied, If we secure your agreement, I promise a full briefing. You help get me released from this prison, and I help you with some errand, is that it? Primcourt waved an arm. More or less. What's the task? Hank queried. I'm afraid I can't tell you that until you agree. Hank laughed dryly. You'll have to do better than that, Limey. Primcourt turned to Bella. Are you positive we need this man? I don't like his belligerence. Bella nodded and placed a hand on Primcourt's wrist. He muttered and stepped out of the cell. What did that mean, that hand on the Brit's wrist? It was too familiar by far for Hank's comfort. Bella leaned toward Hank and whispered, Hank, don't you want out of prison? You're in here for murder, you know. How dangerous is this errand? Is there a chance I'll live? Of course, you think I'd set you on a dead-end task. I don't know any more, he told her with more honesty than he'd intended. I wouldn't. I'm doing my best to assist you in this and in other matters. How's that, he inquired. We're heading to India, Hank, she blurted. That will take you near Tibet. Primcourt's booked us first-class fares all the way. With luck, you'll be able to help me, and perhaps even find the knowledge you seek to help you with your curse. The last word she whispered. Hank was seized with a sudden desire to kiss her, not because of the supposed aid she offered, just because she was so close. He smelled rosewater, leather and silver, her earmarks. She tapped his chest with a firm finger to keep him at bay. Help us, and perhaps we can help you in turn. Your liberation may lie in the dark heart of the Indian jungles, Hank. India. The word sent a tremor through Hank. He'd never been there and knew very little about it. Jungles, cobras, tigers, exotic people with colourful clothing, the infamous East India Trading Company, famines and floods that killed staggering numbers of people. In his mind, it was like Africa. It held a certain primal allure, but it was also one of those far-off places where people died a lot. Tell me what I'll face there. I mean, why do you need me at all? I'm sworn to secrecy, Hank, but this is something only someone like you can do. That was an interesting statement. What could that possibly be? He looked at her closely. She was not meeting his eye. What was she hiding? Who's this prim court to you, he asked. She showed him her hand. There was a large engagement ring on it with a flawless diamond. Hank put on a smile and forced his hands to unclench. Congratulations, he said. She waved the topic away as if it had not just about stopped his heart and switched to a new one. If we're successful in India, we'll create a team sanctioned by both Britain and the US, whose mandate is to investigate occult crimes. We've talked about making a headquarters somewhere central, and Ernest and I will run it together. Central to the US and Britain? Where's that exactly? We'll figure it out when the time comes. I have some ideas. The plan is... I help you solve this problem in India, and you marry another man. Now she looked up and met his eye. You didn't think it would mean I would marry you, did you? He shook his head. No. I foolishly let that chance slip away. I was simply confirming the details. And of course we'd want you on the team, Hank. He sat back, tapping his chin. You marry another man, and then I work with the both of you, and see your marital bliss every day. Most excellent. I sense a note of sarcasm. In response, he raised a single eyebrow and scowled. Then another notion occurred to him. And if this venture in India fails? This is an experiment of sorts, you might say. Some within our governments are against the idea of this team. Our cooperation with the Brits has its opponents, who likewise have their detractors within their own borders. If I refuse to help, what happens to me? She pulled a paper from her vest and threw it down on his bed. It was a request for extradition to the United States. She set another paper on top of that. The President has raised your bounty to $25,000. That's a hefty bounty on my head. I might even turn myself in for that much. Don't be flippant, Hank. This is serious. He looked at the sketch on the paper. It showed a ragged-looking man with a wild beard and the eyes of a madman. Did he resemble that picture? There seems to be a conflict here, Bella. How can I join a government team if I'm being hunted for crimes by that same government. The President will pardon you in return for your help. Oh, that struck him. A pardon. Bella stepped forward. I've also procured a writ of protection from monster bounties for you, contingent upon you aiding us. And I'm told 
Great Britain would also honour the pardon. He decided to be bold. Perhaps it was the wolf blood pumping through his veins. What if I want you instead? That startled her, and she looked out in the hallway, probably at that knit prim court. Don't be foolish, she whispered. Hank sat on his luxurious bed and considered her offer. The flirting profession of his love had been a long shot. There'd been little chance she'd fling herself into his arms, but he'd had to try. Still, her proposal offered many possibilities. He had a chance at improving his life greatly if he accepted. He wanted a cure, most of all. But who knew how long it would take to obtain such a thing? This agreement would allow him to operate in both American and British domains without worry of being hunted. Protection from hunters, he whispered with reverence. It's true, Hank, a writ of protection from both Britain and America. But why? This jaunt to India will be incredibly dangerous, Bella admitted. He grunted staring at the stones on the far side of the cell. He'd spent a lot of time looking at them, counting the cracks and imagining faces in them. What of Radu? he inquired. I'm sure we can also negotiate a protection order for him. That was intriguing. Radu was new to this modern world, and Hank had some obligation to make sure hunters did not hound him endlessly. I may need your help digging him up. He's likely in a pauper's grave somewhere. We had this plan, that he'd pretend to be dead, then come and break me out when it was convenient. Bella's eyes widened, but then she nodded. It was some measure of their strange lives that she was only mildly surprised. She nodded again and said, I'll find him. But Hank didn't hear this response. He wasn't unduly concerned about Radu. He knew the irrepressible ghoul would dig his way out of any trouble that pretending to be dead, truly dead, had gotten him into. His mind churned, on one hand, Bella's offer was a fine one, but he meant what he said about wanting Bella more than these other things. Who was this prim court prig? He was undoubtedly rich and handsome in a dainty, lifted finger, tea swilling fashion. If older than Bella by at least a good ten years. By way of comparison, Hank offered her what? Not much. We must go, my dear. We have dinner with the ambassador, prim court said, while leaning in from the hall. Bella turned back in the doorway. Leave word with the guards if you accept our offer, and we'll arrange your release. We'll send a man to collect you and take you to an inn. Perhaps one with slightly better dining options and clean sheets. He smiled at her joke for a heartbeat. Primcourt's eyes were hard as he leaned around her. We sail in two days, Hank. Make your decision with haste. After they left, his night was filled with endless pacing, wondering what he was going to do. Chapter 5. Anantavan In the heart of India lay a remote stretch of the most forbidding jungle in the world, dark as the deepest cavern and hot as a sun-baked desert. It was a tangled mire of pungent and unwelcoming foliage, with twisted vines coiling around grotesque, blackened trees, and a knee-high carpet of noxious grasses and thorn-covered bushes. No easily navigable routes wound through the land. It was on the way to nowhere, and offered no riches of soil or minerals to be exploited. Uncharacteristically for a patch of jungle, perfect stillness enshrouded the land. An oppressive silence hung in the gloomy branches of the trees and clung to the misty ground, as if normal movement and sounds dared not intrude. One might be forgiven for assuming this tropical forest was a single predatory intelligence lying in wait and watching all who entered or that it was a place on the eve of a momentous event, like an executioner awaiting the condemned, or a long-denied tomb ready to receive its occupants. A Nantavan, which translates to endless forest, was a perilous and unforgiving bit of terrain. Unsurprisingly, very few entered the forest. On maps held by the East India Trading Company, it was outlined in small red X's, with the legend for that symbol noting, this area contains nothing of value. On maps drawn by natives, cartographers often denoted it with the black mark meant to represent a skull, and the Hindustani word shunya, meaning an empty place, or a place where nothing exists. Those few who knew of it believed it held a single landmark of note, a sheer-sided, conical, volcanic crater thrusting above the jungle floor, like the devil's black finger pointing accusingly at heaven. Besides being of visual interest, however, this landmark offered very little to those who might exploit it. 
its sides held no passable way to ascend to the top of the crater, and the composition of the crater itself was basaltic and contained a very low diversity of minerals, according to surveyors. In other places, such a spectacle might have brought curious tourists, but the crater did not encourage this sort of interest, cloaked in impenetrable jungle as it was, and those who looked upon it from afar found it unsettling the feature resembling a pointed pimple or an ugly scar. The crater was not a reason many visited this gloomy land. In truth, Anantavan held two other notable secrets known only to a select few. One of these was a peculiar giant statue of a hooded figure tucked into the base of the crater walls. It was an idol that did not show any effects of time, though it had been in place for centuries. No vegetation grew within reach of it. Any branches that extended into its aura withered, and the trees themselves died. When rain fell, no drops touched the idol, and when the sun pierced through the canopy, it remained in shadow. This idol was not some long-abandoned relic of a cult or a lost civilization. It was the key to the third notable feature of Anantavan. The folds of the figure's stone cloak held hidden triggers that, when pressed in a specific pattern, opened a hidden door in the crater's side. Narakund, as the realm beyond this door was known, was said to house the Chaya Talwar, the Shadow Sword, guarded by its jealous protector. This was the third important feature of Anantavan, and the one least known to the world. It was a portal to a place not of this world. The Guardian had purposely allowed the knowledge of its existence to spread, recently even arranging for a few select foreigners to get a glimpse of the blade. Master, how did you know the foreigners would solve your puzzles now? One of his followers asked. They stood in the Guardian's council room, a cavernous chamber deep in the centre of the crater that was often called the Inner Sanctum, though it was not really in the normal world. It was the room from which he plotted and prepared and watched the sword. To aid him in his design, several special mirrors stood near the walls, showing many sights from around the world, as if they were openings to those places. The Demon King watched these mirrors at all hours of the day, though they were not his only method of gathering intelligence. I read the stars my phantom, the Demon King said. The phantom, as he called one of his minions, was in his child form now, perched on a stone column shaped like a fanciful dragon, watching his master intently. The Demon King enjoyed the unending curiosity of the boy, though by now he would have been a man if he'd not been turned into a vampire, the Demon King realized. Another pair of minions in the room held no such innocent curiosity. They were sisters, the oldest, tall and bent, the younger squat and built like a bull. They always wore their shadow cloaks, even safe here within the inner sanctum, though the Demon King had ordered them to keep their heads bare that he might see their faces. When they moved, their cloaks bent and twisted the light, and parts of them vanished, so that at times there were just two bone-pale heads floating above the pitted stone floor. The squat one had a cruel twist that never left her pouty lips. Teach me how to read the stars, master, she said. She'd asked before, and it amused the demon king that the sisters plotted and schemed against him, for that surely was what motivated her request. She wanted his power, both sisters did, and they would do whatever it took to obtain it. They imagined themselves sly and cunning, hiding their desires well, but the demon king knew. I will, my pet, he told her, and saw the glint of anger in her eyes, quickly concealed behind a smile and nod. Pet was the name he'd given her. The boy presented a question, curiosity shining in his demon gaze. But how did you know the foreigners would dispatch an expedition to come here? The demon king smiled patiently, the way a benevolent father should when asked a question by his uninformed children. A good web has more than one string, he told the boy. I arranged for a quantity of gold ore to be found here and delivered into the hands of those who would lust after it. I knew their greed would drive them to send someone to inspect the land. From there, it was a simple matter to allow the leader of the encroachers to see the sacred blade. The boy counted each point on his fingers. You intentionally placed writings in texts and on shrines many years ago, knowing that someone would eventually find them. One. You arranged for a British surveyor to glimpse the Chaya Talwar. He held up a second finger. And your designs are aligning during a time of war and chaos in India. 
He held up the three fingers, then dropped them and asked, But how can you know the woman you'll marry will travel with the expedition that comes to steal the saber? The demon king walked back to his throne. The seat and back were made from his enemy's bones, while the armrests were crafted from the skulls of his most formidable foes. He tapped his fingers on one of these as he sat back, lounging. I possess many agents in many lands, a nudge to one man and a whisper to another, while an unseen hand plunges a knife into the back of a third. In another place, a horse suddenly gone lame, a child dead of a fever. It has not all fallen into place perfectly, but even my alternate plans have contingencies, and one of these has borne fruit. She will arrive with the others. The boy's face held amazement, which the demon king found still delighted him. It was a powerful boon to be worshipped. The lanky older sister stepped forward, her feet scraping along the stone, her voice deep and unhappy as always. And what of the threats that come with her? This learned man with his machinations and this heir of Merlin, you once told me they pose a threat to our existence, that they might steal the sword. The demon king waved one arm casually. Yes, we must destroy the man of science, and Merlin's heir must be brought to me. Let me attend to this, my lord, I will accomplish this for you, the stout younger sister said, her nostrils quivering, lip peeled back in an eager snarl, and in return you will set me above these others as your rightful second. No, my pet, you have too much fury for this task, and I know you and your sister both are jealous of my new bride. I am not I serve as you see fit, my lord, the woman declared, attempting a tone of servility, though her eyes glowed with a baleful crimson she could not contain. The older sister, a woman as cold as a dead snake, gave a tight-lipped smile to her sibling and declared, It is I who can perform this task for you, my lord. I who can do this thing without passion. The demon king shook his head. I think not, my beauty, he replied. The woman flinched at her own moniker, Beauty. How she hated the name. He continued, What I require for this task is neither fire nor hammer. A stealthy, well-aimed blade will be the tool I use. The demon king nodded at the phantom. The boy jolted upright and leapt down off his perch, performing a complicated gesture that gathered his shadow cloak around him, like the darkness itself had come alive to wrap him up. He also grew to the correct height for a night shadow, a towering figure wrapped in the black of night, his skull stretching until he resembled the two sisters. He knelt before the demon king, eyes glowing with fervor. If it be your wish, I will strive to do your bidding, he said. It is my wish, my phantom. Noting the reactions of his other night shadows, the sisters, the demon king saw frigid hatred from his beauty and blasting rage from his pet. If they possessed the power to skewer with their eyes, he would be impaled. The demon king found pleasure in both the jealousy of women and the worship from the boy, despite recognizing its pettiness. Chapter 6. Upon the Indian Ocean The steamship sliced through the calm azure waters of the Indian Ocean with stately purpose, white foam curling back from its bow. Hank leaned on the polished wooden railing, gazing out at the endless sea stretching to the horizon. The bracing salt air kissed his face, a refreshing change from the fetid gloom of his cell. It had been weeks since they left Constanta, bound for Egypt, and then crossed the dry desert by train. Now, finally, they were on the last leg of their journey that would end at the port of Bombay in the southwest of India. A brown-skinned sailor passed him, using a broom to sweep the deck and singing something incomprehensible. They called them Laskars, the Indian sailors, and they were everywhere about the ship, outnumbering the passengers five to one. He watched the man with the broom move out of sight with mild interest. Unease simmered within Hank, though he wasn't sure what caused it. He knew little of the mission that now controlled his fate, bound as he was by the contract he had signed. Hoping his trust was not misplaced, he pressed onward. Bella had not exactly avoided him during their journey, but they'd spoken little, and she'd kept close to Primcourt. He'd had little time to ponder what came next, due to the challenge of keeping Radu hidden and safe on the trains in Egypt, and it had all seemed so far away then, as if India might never come. Now, however, their next step would see them there. Admiring the view? came a clipped voice behind him. 
Hank turned to see Bella approaching, dressed in an elegant gown of emerald silk, no doubt in preparation for their dinner with the ship's captain later that evening. She'd pinned her raven black hair back, accentuating the penetrating quality of her green eyes. Very hard to beat the views at sea, though I've spotted something just as lovely, he said, leaning back against the railing. It beats a mildewed jail cell at least, Bella replied, joining him at the rail, her gaze drifting across the shimmering expanse of blue filling the horizon. Did you lock me up in that jail, Bella? he asked. Her face was unreadable. Me? Did I come and put the manacles on your wrists? They stood in silence. Hank enjoyed being by her side even when she was lying to him. A party of Spanish merchants and their wives passed in fine dinner dress, the women wearing wide hooped dresses, the entire entourage speaking Spanish in rapid fire exchanges. Down the rail a few single young men drank and lounged. John Company, as the East India Trading Company was called, was undoubtedly their employer. There was a whole string of them on board, all young, eager, and going to India to make their fortune, as Primcourt explained it. Several soldiers were mixed in with them, stripped down to simple red, blue or tan jackets and blue trousers in the heat, and here and there an Indian servant stood close by with large mats of woven bamboo tied to poles they called punkas, which they waved back and forth to create a fan of air. Hank noticed the group of young men watching him and Bella, then realised it was just Bella their eyes lingered upon. He stepped closer to her protectively, giving the men a frown. The wolf was not amused by their stares. Bella ignored them, turning to face Hank with her chin lowered slightly and eyes large. She must know that her beauty was a weapon, and she used it when she wished, even if it was just to look innocent. I asked for your help because I need someone I can trust. He flinched. You trust me. Her lips curled. Well, I need someone I know, at least. If you start acting like a ravening beast, I'll still put you down. Now that was the Bella he knew. Why would you need my help? What happened to your private army? She sighed. The East India Trading Company would be displeased with foreign soldiers on their shores, even if it was a small army and a British government representative. Will we need an army? She shrugged. Perhaps. She adjusted her dress in a most unladylike manner. Damn, I hate wearing these things. But your mother would very much enjoy seeing you in such formal attire. Bella snorted, then grew serious. Hank, do you know the name Nimrod O'Toole? Hank's eyebrows rose. Of course, cutthroat, brute. Wasn't he executed after that bank robbery in New York? That's the man. Apparently the execution didn't take and he's meeting us in India. He's coming on the expedition. There's bad blood between you two, if I recall correctly, Hank replied, searching his memories. I'll say, I killed his brother. Then why in the world would you invite him on this journey? Hank asked incredulously. I didn't. Primcourt hired him before he knew our history. Anyway, it's too late to just send him away now. So I'm here to protect you from a member of our own expedition? Wonderful. It's more than that. You'll be indispensable when we reach our destination, she offered cryptically. He didn't press her on that, instead considering the criminal and killer who'd be with them. He'd heard rumours that Nimrod had slaughtered a dozen men in the south before the law tracked him down to a cabin hideaway in the swamps of Louisiana near Baton Rouge. They'd shot him to pieces, according to the tale, yet months later he'd shown up in New York City, where he'd been nabbed robbing a bank. This time they'd hanged him. How did he survive the rope, he asked. Wish I knew... Primcourt assures me that the man has turned over a new leaf. The President has taken a special interest in him, apparently, awarded him clemency, and wants to reform him. Apparently, the President himself recommended Nimrod to the Queen. They turned to look out at the waves. Had she worn this dress to throw him off his game? Did she know how lovely she was? He realised she was speaking. There's more trouble too, Hank. India is a powder keg at the moment. They say rebellion is fomenting. The Indians are unhappy with British rule. Imagine that, just as we were in America. Hank realised his words were biting. He was irritated at the notion of handsome, arrogant, earnest Primcourt and Bella together. But his words were true. Many lands were growing tired of their yokes of colonial oppression. Hank studied Bella's profile, trying to read her inscrutable expression. She looked so vulnerable at the moment. Those powerful emerald eyes pulled him. Tell me more about this venture. 
I told you I'm sworn to secrecy. Right, I won't tattle if you don't. You're a rascal, Henry Bravo. Pa, you're always the one getting me in trouble. She squinted. Truthfully, I don't know all the details, but this could be very good for my career as well, Hank, Bella said carefully, her eyes still fixed on the distant line dividing ocean and sky. The President's promised that if I can pull this off, I'll get the funding for that team of monster hunters I mentioned to you. Imagine it. A woman leading a government entity. Hank nodded, a pensive frown creasing his brow as he turned back to look out over the empty sea once more. Official monster hunters. A creature cadre, if you will. She tapped her lips. I like the name Fiend Force myself. Fiend Force? He hoped he put the proper amount of disdain into his tone, but just in case he also scowled and gave a tiny shake of his head. Creature cadre is no better, she replied, dismissing his own suggestion. Hank tried a few other names in his mind, but nothing had the right ring to it. Beast Battalion, he asked, though half to himself. She did not pass up the opportunity to shake her head at his suggestion. He turned to other matters. Who else will be involved in the expedition, Hank asked. You've told me very little thus far. Bella hesitated a moment before responding, weighing her words with diplomatic care. There are a few other key players, yes. Dr. Frail, a scientist who will accompany us, is one. She outlined the doctor's impressive credentials and expertise in many sciences, though she kept the details vague. Hank listened intently, gathering each crumb of information to slowly assemble a clearer picture. In affairs such as these, knowledge often meant the difference between life and death. The sound of measured footfalls approaching from behind interrupted their hushed conversation. Even if Hank had not seen Ernest Primcourt approaching, he would have known it was a prig coming from the clipped march of the highly polished shoes. He could have set his watch by those taps. The Count of Primcourt wore a grey suit, his chin thrust into the air, as only those born into aristocratic dignity could manage. There you are, my dear, he announced, inserting himself between Hank and Bella in a way that seemed almost territorial. The captain's dinner is soon to start. Hank bristled inwardly at the dismissive manner and the man's arrogant air of entitlement, but simply nodded politely. The wolf wanted to know if this was a challenge. Hank pushed the beast away. Primcourt was engaged to Bella, after all. Hank must remember that. This wasn't a territorial dispute between two wolves. Bella gave one of her brilliant smiles to her fiancé, then told him, Of course, shall we then? Chapter 7 Trouble Brewing Primcourt offered Bella his arm, which she took with a thin smile. Hank followed them to the dining hall, unable to shake the uneasy feeling that Primcourt posed a threat. Perhaps Bella did as well. They'd hidden things from him, had him thrown in jail to make him biddable, and now were keeping knowledge of their venture from him. He was on the outside, looking into whatever their schemes were. Primcourt, especially, engendered suspicion in Hank. He would need to be cautious around this aristocrat. Of course, he wasn't sure what kind of threat he was to their lives, or was Hank merely jealous at the threat Primcourt posed to the affections of Bella. In the wood-panelled dining hall, they sat at the captain's table, fine china and crystal wine glasses glinting in an overhead chandelier's light. Aside from the captain himself, a distinguished older man with white mutton chops. They were the only passengers afforded such prominent placement Though there wasn't a bad table in the hall, everyone was dressed in finery and Hank smoothed his jacket, his attire a bit on the shabby side. The meal commenced with multiple courses paired with wine, served by white-gloved stewards. As it progressed, the atmosphere relaxed, aided by the free-flowing libations. The captain, a friendly Brit, told excellent stories, and Hank grew more at ease as the meal progressed. Finally, the sumptuous dinner was winding down, the diners leaning back with satisfaction. Primcourt dabbed his mouth with his cloth napkin and let out an exaggerated sigh. A fine meal, Captain, he announced. It's a welcome taste of civilization before we dive into the wilderness. He chuckled before continuing. Yes, India will be quite the change from the refinement of Europe, from what I hear. All that raw jungle teeming with snakes and exotic diseases. Do you know much about India, Captain? The older man unbuttoned his dinner jacket. I'll say I'm intimately familiar with it. 
I was billeted there myself for three years in the Queen's Navy. I love the place almost as much as I loathe it. Why would that be? Hank asked. As the Count says, it's a confounding land. There is wild beauty unlike anywhere else in the world, yet also danger unlike most other places. They have an ancient culture that was old before most of our ancestors were crawling out of the rocks and learning to make fire. Prim Court tutted at this, yet they've not progressed. Britain's firm guidance has been the best thing to ever happen to the place. I'm not sure the Indians would agree, the captain said. Well, it's a good thing they have no say in it, isn't it? Primcourt asked with a smug smile. Bella stood up. I'm quite tired, I'm afraid. These sea voyages wear on one. The men stood. The captain said with a slight bow, Of course, my dear, with a delicate constitution such as yours, you must be careful. Hank let out an involuntary snicker, which he quickly stifled under Bella's dark glare. Mr. Bravo, Captain, Mr. Primcourt, good night. She marched away with ladylike grace, only slightly ruining it by swishing her behind a bit to free some gathered cloth. The captain's good nature dropped away for a moment as he turned to Hank and Primcourt. I shouldn't take a woman to India right now if I were you. I'd have her stay on the boat and go back to Africa. And why would that be, Captain? Primcourt asked. There is trouble brewing. No one should go there except more troops and John Company men. Primcourt drummed his fingers on the table. A trifle alarmist, wouldn't you say, Captain? The captain's face flushed, yet he controlled his voice and words. There is rebellion in the wind. Rebellion, that is very dramatic, Primcourt responded. The John Company is annexing Oud, taking it away from the Indian rulers. The Brahmins are grumbling, and even the Mohammedans and the Hindus are aligning to protest against Lord Dalhousie's policies. Lord Canning has replaced him, Primcourt said. The captain stood now, picking up his cigarette case and hat. Primcourt's attempts to soothe the man were as insulting as his barbs, but the man kept at it. I'm shocked at your anxious speech, Captain. Perhaps you should take a holiday and calm your nerves. Do what you will. I simply thought it my duty as a gentleman to warn you that your lady should not go to India. The captain's face was flushed, his cheeks tight. And you are quite wrong about one thing you said, Count Primcourt. There are 180 million people in India. If they decide to fight for their independence, they certainly will have a say in who rules them. The distinguished seafarer walked away without another word. The coward. Each British soldier is worth ten of the natives, Primcourt muttered. Hank had heard such silly claims before. He got up to leave as well, not saying a word to Primcourt. Might he be wrong about the dangers Primcourt posed? Perhaps the prig was dangerous because he was a pompous fool, not because he was some devious schemer. That night Hank tried the elixir his back row chemist had made and didn't leave his quarters for two days, his head feverish and his body aching. Bella knocked on the cabin door the second day. She kept it up as at first no one answered. Finally, Radu opened the door, hidden in a hood and the room at his back in darkness and musty from sweat and low circulation. Miss Blackthorne, he said with a half bow, let me in, Radu. Henry is um, not well. She brushed past him and found Hank shivering, and pale as a sheet sprawled on his bed. Is it seasickness? No. Radu seemed on the verge of saying more, but Hank groaned. Just a tad under the weather, I'll be good. As new in no time, he croaked out. Radu explained what had happened, and Bella grew more livid with each word. How could you be such a fool? she yelled at Hank. Ouch! he held his head. Please scream more quietly. She sat next to him. What was the desired goal of such a stratagem? A simple experiment, which was a success in my estimation. A success? Yes, my body reacted in the same manner as in those caverns under Norilor Castle. I simply need to learn to control the dosage and build up some immunity to the effects. You're absolutely a foozler, Hank. An utter imbecile. Don't talk so sweet, Bella, or I'll get the idea you've taken a liking to me. She stormed out. In the coming days, Hank tried again and was sick off and on for two weeks as he adjusted the dosage. Eventually, he learned he could take just a few drops of the cure using a rubber dropper he bought from the onboard chemist, and he suffered few ill effects, while the wolf blood seemed to dull to an almost imperceptible level. It was quite wonderful. Chapter 8 Shadow Dreams Hank slept poorly one night while the ship traversed the open Indian Ocean 
after breaking away from the rugged sandy shores of the Arab states, he was pursued in his dreams through dense, vine-choked jungle by a faceless, cloaked entity. The unknown entity was completely cloaked in a black energy resembling shadowy cloth, with a deep hood obscuring any distinguishing characteristics. The opening where the face should draw his attention. He sensed a powerful, intense malevolence radiating from that black hole. The unknown being's loathing bore down upon Hank with a crushing, suffocating weight. He woke physically weakened and emotionally drained, gasping for breath and wearier than when he closed his eyes to sleep, but without the ability to rest, even with the gentle rocking of the boat. He had been a prey animal in that nightmare, caught in the sights of a relentless predator. Discomforted, he went for air and found Bella alone near the prow of the ship, gazing out at the horizon, which was just beginning to glow with the coming sunrise. They stood together without speaking, for the time it took for the sun to peak red over the horizon and paint the ocean gold and crimson. Do you ever dream of shadows? Bella asked, breaking the silence. Hank's spine tingled at her words, recalling his own nightmares. I have dreamed of them, he admitted. Some internal reticence in sharing his vulnerability kept him from telling her he just had such a dream. It would be like admitting to his fear, and he could not do that. I do as well, a lot. They are everywhere in my dreams, she replied. She kept saying the word dream, but what he just experienced was not in that classification, not in that species. He'd had a nightmare that took on physical form that caused him physical discomfort. Had she experienced the same thing? Did you just dream of a shadow? he asked. Just now, I mean. She did not answer him, but tapped at the rail, as if signalling a change in the topic of conversation. A fortune teller came to me after we left Norilor Castle and were descending out of the Carpathians. Passed right through my guards with them none the wiser, she said. There was already an evil aura to the air, but now a shroud of heavy clouds covered the sun, throwing them both back into pre-dawn darkness for a moment. A fortune teller, he managed, though she'd thrown him off with her topic change. He'd seen his own fortune teller in those mountains and wondered if it had been the same woman. Bella was trying to keep her voice light. At first I mocked her, but she had the most persuasive way about her. I finally let her give my fortune, though I should have sent her away. He discovered he didn't want to know what the fortune teller had told Bella. There was something in Bella's eyes that told him already, in her eyes and more, a downcast turn of her mouth. A gloomy pall hung over her, matching the cast of the sky. He had to ask, though, he had no choice. What did she say? She said, if I go to India, I'll die in shadow, Bella said, then attempted a smile. She didn't quite succeed. An unwelcome fortune. She laughed now, the notes of the gesture hollow. It was all rubbish, of course. He tried to play along with her light mood, but he assumed his attempts were as weak as her pitiful pretend gaiety. Finally, he gave up and told her, I understand the foolishness of making decisions based on signs and the words of soothsayers, but I feel a similar reticence. I'm not sure we should go. What? Because of a fortune? I never took you for one to run away at bad omens. All the same, you might delay your trip. Not possible, Bella replied. Why? What's so important to you that you must go now? I've made promises. There must be other ways to honour them. I'm sure whoever you gave your word to would like you alive at the end of it. She shook her head. Not this time, I can't delay. She rubbed her arms as if cold. It was just an old fortune teller, Hank. A woman who takes coin to spout fiction to gullible fools. He did not understand why his feelings were so strong about this. But they were. He tried again. Find a reason not to go. We can stop in one of the port cities. You'll be unaccountably ill. She leaned back and snapped her fingers at him, as if he was being unreasonable, which perhaps he was. Relax, Hank. Don't start jumping at shadows. She was just an old charlatan. Plus, I'll have you there to keep me from dying. I see ephemeral fingers played about Hank's head and ran across his arms, causing goosebumps to rise. I have a bad feeling about this, Bella. You shouldn't go. It might just have been the wolf and its natural wariness, but a lead weight settled in his gut. He considered going to the helm and forcing them to turn the ship around. Bella laid a hand on his arm. 
I have to go, I don't have a choice, and you won't stop me, right? Her eyes were at once vulnerable, yet still the strong ones he'd fallen in love with years ago. I won't stop you, he told her, while trying to come up with ways he might. Short of a mutiny, he wasn't sure how. Radu appeared, joining them at the rail. Bella had told Hank the story of going to dig the zombie out of a pauper's grave back in Constanta, only to find the zombie had put himself back together and clawed his way out himself. Ah, hello, Mademoiselle Blackthorn, the zombie had said, brushing some dirt off his shoulder. Quite a pleasant night, isn't it? Apparently it had been quite frightening to be buried down under the ground in a mass grave with those other bodies, Radu had told Hank later. The poor ghoul had been locked up since then for safety, only allowed out in the early morning and late evening. There was no need to scare the other passengers by having a dead man walking around. Look there, he said, pointing toward disturbances on the glassy sea near the ship, a pod of dolphins streaking through the water, keeping pace with the steamer's passage. Now that is a good omen, Hank said. He turned, smiling, only to discover that Bella had left to join Primcourt, who was standing some distance away in his dinner jacket. Hank wondered if he slept in a coat and tails. He gave the British man a lazy salute, then turned back to the rail. Primcourt caught Bella going into the dining room. He glanced back at Hank. Is he aware you're saving his life? She shook her head. He tried to kiss her, but there was a shadow there, he sensed, and she didn't respond. Am I? she asked. Saving his life? Certainly. It was join up or be strung up, wasn't it? She nodded. He tapped the rail a few times. You should inform him. Take that jumped-up scamp down a peg or two, Count Primcourt said. I don't like the man's lack of propriety. He doesn't care for you either, Bella informed him. I shan't miss a wink of sleep over what that come-from-nothing gutter bum thinks of me, Primcourt told her. Come from nothing. His background is similar to mine, she replied. Primcourt puffed out air while his eyebrows drew in, as if his face were a blacksmith's bellow. You're completely different, my dear, completely. Bella leaned on the rail, then turned to look at Hank. He was laughing while discussing something with Radu. He glanced over at her and winked, and she scowled back. Hank was a scamp. Beside her, Primcourt was a cold slab. He'd never laughed in his life. The ship sailed on, threading its way east toward the strange lands of India. Chapter 9. A British Officer Lieutenant Ram Singh stood crisply at attention before his commanding officer's broad mahogany desk, shoulders squared inside his scarlet uniform jacket as he focused on a point on the wall just above the other man's head. Proper protocol must be maintained at all times here in the inner offices of the British East India Company's regional headquarters. One careless misstep could undo everything he'd worked toward these past few grueling years. Lieutenant Singh reporting as ordered, sir, Ram announced briskly, offering a sharp salute that he maintained until Colonel Warthel deigned to return the gesture with the barest of arm waves. Only then did Ram relax into parade rest, feet planted shoulder-width apart, hands clasped behind his back. The Colonel wore a golden monocle, which he used to inspect the lieutenant with a squinting eye, his knobby fingers tapping his desk blotter impatiently. I've received word of a highly sensitive matter, he began abruptly, one requiring the utmost discretion. He paused as if weighing his next words with care. Frankly, this task calls for subtler skills than you possess, but my superiors insist you be assigned a role. A sepoy. He said the last word with derision, Sepoy was the term for Indians serving in the East India Trading Company's army, though Ram was technically part of the regular British army and should not be labelled a sepoy at all. It was all rather confusing even to Ram who'd been born here. They even placed British army regulars here under the command of the Trading Company, and he only held his rank at all because he was descended of the Maratha warrior princes, and the company had wanted to curry favour with his father in exchange for more help against the French and their Eastern Indian allies. Of course, even with that, it had also taken help from British friends to secure his commission. Who the hell do you know, Singh, to have the Lord Governor giving me orders for you directly? Worthel asked. He licked his thin lips. I'm not certain, sir, Ram replied. 
I'm not certain either, Lieutenant, but I find it damned irregular. He tapped the folded paper on his desk multiple times. That the Lord Commander believes you worthy of such an honor is mysterious, the Colonel added, puffing at his mustache as if he couldn't fathom the stupidity of the world sometimes. Ram had to concentrate to keep his expression neutral as the Colonel continued to denigrate him. I am honored to serve in whatever capacity required, sir, he replied in a clipped tone. Colonel Werthel made a non-committal sound low in his throat. Let us hope your capabilities prove adequate to the task. He neatly squared the stack of papers before him and folded his hands on top. Report to the Regency Inn at the noon hour. You're to accompany a team led by some count or other and some Americans. His lips curled in disgust, the same as when he said the word sepoy. Inland, on an expedition, you will act as head porter, guide, and logistics officer for the expedition. I trust you can handle the arrangements? Absolutely, sir, Ram answered crisply. After a brief hesitation, he ventured to ask, Might I inquire as to the nature of this expedition? The colonel's eyes flashed and he frowned, studying the orders. I haven't the time to bother explaining everything to you. The Count will brief you later. For now, just make the preparations. Dismissed. With another brisk salute, Ram pivoted sharply and marched toward the door, his heels clicking in precise measure on the stones of the floor. At the doorway, he saw the colonel studying the orders with a frown, realizing the colonel was also clueless about the expedition. The pompous snoot was correct. This was most irregular. He turned and departed without another word. Only once he was down the hallway beyond the colonel's sight did Ram allow his stoic mask to crack. What was this expedition? Jaw clenched, he made his way briskly through the marbled corridors bustling with clerks and officers, all of whom were British and servants, all of whom were Indian. A quartet of officers watched him walk by, all sunshy British men, whispering and watching him. One said something and they all snickered like bully boys. It had been much the same when he had attended school in London, the Anglos mocking him. He stopped when he came abreast of the four ensigns. Something you wish to say to me? They all sobered. One of them, a weak-chinned ginger with a limp moustache, stepped up near him. No, nothing. The man's breath smelled of onions and old cheese. Nothing, sir, Ram corrected him. They were all his subordinates in rank. One of them giggled. The ginger's lip curled, a look of undisguised contempt in his eyes. Ram's gaze hardened and the man stepped back involuntarily. Ram whispered just loud enough for the four men surrounding him to hear. I don't put an ounce of stock in what you trumped-up errand boys gossip about, but if you have something you wish to say to my face, come find me any time. Now the smirks dropped away. Errand boys? The hell you say, you damn blackamoor, one of them uttered. Ram stepped into the centre of them and let his hand fall to his sword hilt. He knew it was a mistake but didn't care. Apologies, you're a cowardly rearguard errand boy, not a one of you worth the basest enlisted man, he told the ensign, stepping right up to him. The man's face turned a deep plum, his mouth opening and closing, but said nothing. Ram gave a contemptuous grin. Well, any of you cowards have an ounce of steel in you? This was how he dealt with bullies in England, though a voice of caution in the corners of his mind warned him to stop. The redhead who was now behind him moved slightly and Ram thought he might raise a hand to strike Ram from behind. He whirled and lunged at the man, though it was just a bluff. He had no intention of attacking any of them. The ensign stumbled backwards, crashing against a desk and tumbling to his backside. What the devil's the meaning of this? An authoritative voice bellowed. Colonel Werthel stood in the hall. The Blackamoor attacked us, one ensign said. He's as savage and mad as all the rest, Colonel, said another. Werthel regarded the four ensigns. They were his lackeys and not one of them worth the contents of a chamber pot. Werthel waved an irritated hand. Get to work, gentlemen, and be quick about it he told them. He crooked a finger at Ram and the lieutenant stepped up to his commanding officer. The superior officer whispered while studying him with his monocle. There might be some charges mixed up in this whole hullabaloo. Best you suppress those primitive impulses, eh, lieutenant? You're an officer in Her Majesty's army now, Singh. Best start behaving like one. Chapter 10. The Bazaar.
As Ram walked out of the building into the baking heat of the Bombay sun, a formidable Pathian sergeant with the grey eyes and lighter skin so common in that region joined him. You've a fierce look to you, Tool, the man said to Ram. Ram's eyebrows rose at the sergeant using the meso word for boy, but ignored the insolence. I let my temper get the better of me, Zothan. The Pathian chuckled and they walked on. He said, And the sun also rose this morning. I find no surprises with either. Don't peck at me, Hen, I'm in a foul mood, Ram warned him. Not that it would matter. Zothan had been his mentor, servant and friend for as long as he could remember, and they often bickered and teased one another, like an uncle with his nephew, regardless of Ram being a prince. The sergeant, however, must have sensed some raw discomfort in his friend, and did not mock him any further. Instead, he asked, What did the illustrious Sahib Firangi want? There is to be an expedition. Ram gave Zotan the barest outline of it, which was all he knew himself. He said it all bitterly. Despite attaining the hard-won rank of lieutenant, it was abundantly clear his superiors still considered Ram someone to assign to the most menial of tasks. Now, he'd likely be acting as guide to some pompous aristocrat and some of his American friends on holiday through India's wild interior rather than acting in his stead as a full officer. And this, when there was a rebellion unfolding. Zothan took a different view of the task. I think there must be more to this venture than some simple jaunt into the wilds with a Sahib Firangi and a pack of other Anglos, or else any escort might have done. You believe so? Ram asked and gave it some contemplation himself. Ram passed through the colonel's words. Some trumped-up count, he'd said. Could it be? Was the Count of Primcourt here? Ram owed the man a great deal, and he knew of no one else who would put in a special request for him. But why would he be here, and to what purpose? And why now, at the worst possible time? You may be right. It may be that Count Primcourt is a participant in this jaunt. Ram said. Zothan grunted. He did not need to ask who this Firangi nobleman was. The only time he and Ram had not been together in their lives had been the years Ram spent in England while the ward of the man Ernest Primcourt. What does he want of you? Zothan asked. I'm not certain. Zothan was powerfully suspicious of all Firangis, but especially of those who came from England. A soft milk land that makes people so weak their skin is pale as milk he often told Ram. Zothan gave his own opinion of the Count now with a dismissive grunt. He needs your strength because he has none of his own. The Count has been kind to me. Without him I'd never have obtained my commission, Ram reminded his friend. The sergeant laughed. He looked down at the tan sepoy uniform he wore. He despised the perpetually uncomfortable thing. To hell's fires with him, then. They passed into the bustling Paca Bazaar with its potent smell of spices and foods and rows of brightly coloured fabrics and hanging rugs, and Ram noted cold, hard eyes on him from merchants and shoppers alike. Then he realised the uniform was the focus of the angry scowls, a symbol of the Anglos, as if he was their representative, which he supposed he was. He must be off his mark today. He'd forgotten he was wearing it. If he'd remembered it, he would have changed before entering the bazaar, considering the current mood of the land. He appraised the situation. The surrounding crowd was a seething mass, though he doubted any would dare attack him alone. Too many knew who he was, knew of his father's band of warriors, and they all knew and feared the wild foreigner Zothan, who came from a barbaric place far to the north, or so they whispered behind his back. The pair was as safe as they could be here in this place, not of their people, while wearing the uniform of the oppressor. However, the mob must be feared. If some spark set them off, they would form their own mind and operate under their own savage whims, and Ram was unsure if they'd avoid attacking him if that happened. Best to be cautious. What news? Ram asked, his eyes alertly scanning those around him. A fool of a believer fired on a lesser Firangi sahib, then put another man and a sahib sergeant to the fine point of his blade in Barakpur. Ram took this in as they came round a bend. Two Brits killed and he looked around to get his bearings. He desired morning chai and could inquire about porters at a nearby shop. They'd likely need them. It was because of the new long rifle guns and the pig grease cartridges, Zothan told him. The fools, Ram said. 
though he gave no indication whether he meant the British, for using pig and cow fat to smooth the liners of bullet cartridges that must be bitten to be used, or the singular rebel who'd attacked and killed two British soldiers. They came to the tea shop and sat alone on a shaded veranda, watching the bustle of the people hurrying about. Do you suppose any of these people know how close the country is to anarchy, Zothan? Ram inquired. I would wager most have not the slightest inkling, Zothan replied. Ram sniffed at his tea, letting the vapours cleanse his airways, then took a sip to test its heat. And what do you suppose they would do if they knew? As you often say, my Raja, there are sheep, dogs and wolves. Most people are sheep. But will they follow a shepherd if one appears? Zothan leaned in close to Ram. There is to be a meeting of the rebels tonight. It is said that Mohammedans, Hindis, Sikhs and Parsis will all attend. That was alarming. If all these groups, who bore great enmity one to another, were willing to cooperate, rebellion must be close. So much for talk of sheep. Will we join them? Zothan asked. Ram sat back. Although Ram's family on both sides were nobility, that meant very little in the British Empire. If he garnered any respect at all, it was because of his lineage. Ram belonged to the Marathas, a noble warrior class known for their fierceness in Lower Asia. They'd beaten off the Chinese, been the bane of the Bengals, and of course fought many campaigns for and against the Mughals. Before the British had appeared, they'd been picking off Mughal states one by one, along with the Sikhs and Punjabs. One hundred years ago, his grandfather had fought off the British at Ardas, giving their people a generation of independence. But in the end, the British had beaten them all, using their superior tactics, artillery and weapons. Now the John Company used the Maratha like attack dogs against the French, Portuguese, Dutch and even fellow Indians as the need arose. Ram, however, had taken a different route. Unlike most of his family who became mercenaries, he wanted to be a British officer, commanding from within the ranks. He thought it the best way to ensure a better future for his people. But it was always his plan that he would use this knowledge to one day push the British out of India to regain independence for his land. Was that day at hand? No, it was far too early. He needed more time to learn and gather the skills and tools of warfare to form a council of generals and wise leaders. However, India would not wait for that. It seethed like a sealed cookpot. Soon it would boil over and explode. There were no widely recognized leaders, however, and no central objective. Instead, there were a diverse set of princes and sepoys who were all preaching rebellion, each with their own plans and beliefs. If they all set off their miniature rebellions right now, it would cause panic for certain, yet Ram doubted it would be enough to obtain independence. Could he allow it to happen, however, without joining? Could he let his fellow Indians fight and die without him taking part? Or worse, could he join the British loyalists who would fight against the natives? The divisions among the peoples of India were another issue he knew would arise. If there was rebellion, it wouldn't just be natives against the Anglos, it would also be an opportunity for revenge and for profit, or many would see it that way. There were deeply held divisions among cultural and religious lines and much enmity. Sikhs, Mohammedans and Hindis had all been killing each other for centuries, the Parsis had started riots over the killing of stray dogs only two years back. The Mohammedans had rioted and killed many Parsis for printing an image of their prophet in one of their newspapers. There were many such examples across all the religions and cultures of India. And there were the bandits, who would smell opportunity in the spilled blood and emerge from their gutters and holes, claiming allegiance to whatever side gained them the most loot, and switching just as fast to another party when it suited them. Many would die, most of them innocent, most of them natives. He cringed. He might find himself fighting against his own people to prevent bloodshed. And now, if he surmised correctly, Count Ernest Primcourt was coming to India with no advance notice. Ram owed the man his loyalty. He might have to protect him in the coming weeks. He slammed his fist on the table, rattling the cups. Eh, boy, don't spill the tea. Did you determine what we will do? Ram looked down into the swirling liquid in his cup. I'm not certain. Chapter 11. Arrival in Bombay.
As the steamship approached the coastline, navigating through rows of anchored trading vessels, Hank observed a fleet of much smaller, nimbler native boats zipping between their larger cousins, heavily laden with vibrant exotic fruits and other curious cargo. To the port side of the gently rocking ship, the land drew his eye. Most of the shore was sandy beaches covered in patches of samphire bushes and lined with coconut trees, their fronds waving lazily in the sea breeze. But further inland, shadowy jungle-covered hills loomed over the shoreline, a dark and inscrutable wilderness. It was as though the very heart of India beckoned, mysterious and untamed, filling him with both excitement and a touch of dread. When the ship passed the breakers, entering a sheltered channel leading into the harbour, he observed scenes of unfamiliar life unfolding on shore. Men in lengths of light cloth wrapped around their waists toiled in flooded paddies, their bent forms mimicking the egrets wading through the shallow waters. Nearby, a woman draped in rippling fabric, the colours of a brilliant sunset tended to emerald shoots, while a child with skin like polished teak played at her feet, his only garb a simple loincloth, they passed a white stone temple with curving architecture that Hank found most pleasant. Two small bulbous towers topped the roof and a reedy horn played inside. He smelled cow dung fires, heady hot dust and jasmine. Stretching out, he could almost touch the tall spindly bamboo trees leaning over the water. Further along, sandy brown scars covered the land, the telltale sign of construction projects underway everywhere along the shore. The building frames of warehouses and other offices were abuzz in constant activity, the native workers scampering about across bamboo scaffolding with supplies, while others used hammers and hand-cranked drills, and everywhere lines of natives threw up clouds of dirt and sand while digging with picks. Under already completed warehouse roofs, large bales of cotton in stacks 30 feet high awaited ships to carry them away to Britain and other lands. Well, Henry, are you ready for India? rasped Radu, coming up beside him at the railing, his weathered features alive with childlike awe. As ready as I'll ever be, my friend, Hank replied quietly while studying Radu. They'd convinced the undead knight he couldn't go about India in his armour, and so he wore a shirt, pants, and a hooded robe to conceal his face. He looked almost... normal. You've joined the Franciscans, eh? Hank chided him. I'm a naked wretch without my armour. Radu replied, looking down at his garb with one lip curled. It will be fiercely hot here. That may not bother you, but I still believe you're better off leaving it behind for now. It'll draw unwanted attention, if nothing else. The knight grunted, then looked out at the sights. Not much of a city, he declared. There must be more than what we can spy from this spot. The captain told me it is a place of some two hundred thousand souls. That many, Radu gasped. They must be out of sight behind those hills. The city might not have been impressive from their current vantage, but the port was plenty busy. As the ship entered Bombay's crowded harbour, Hank found himself assaulted by a barrage of strange cries and pungent scents. Barefoot men with turbans yelling melodically secured the vessel with anchor ropes tossed from on high. Across from their mooring, a cargo carrier was being loaded with burlap bags stacked twenty feet high that read pepper, cinnamon, or ginger. While Hank took in the bustling scenes with wide-eyed wonder, a roiling mixture of exhilaration and foreboding coming over him. Here lay worlds unseen, cultures beyond what he knew. He pondered the hidden dangers that might lurk within the lush but deadly labyrinth of the jungle, now drawing inexorably nearer. Could they survive whatever trials awaited? As the babble of the exotic port washed over him, Hank took a deep breath. Ready or not, a new adventure beckoned in the fabled realm of India. Hank took a deep breath as he stepped onto the bustling pier, the cacophony of Bombay hitting him fully for the first time. All around him, dock workers shouted to one another as they loaded and unloaded ships. Vendors called out to the new arrivals, hawking wares and fresh produce. In the distance, beggars cried for arms amidst the general commotion of a major colonial port. People of every race on earth milled about the pier, Men wearing intricate jewellery and turbans traded and conversed with others in embroidered robes. Chinese labourers in their conical hats worked diligently on the docks or in the shipyards, and there were dozens of other Asian races that Hank could not identify, wearing all kinds of garments, some of which were so bright they almost blinded him.
the wealthy of all races, British and Indian alike, were routinely followed by a train of porters and servants. Meanwhile, others, mostly Indian, were so poor they were nearly naked. British colonial administrators and soldiers swarmed over the port, in suits and uniforms, their servants and assistants scrambling about to assist them in counting, measuring, inspecting, and inquiring about everything coming and going. One of these British officers, in a crisply pressed red uniform, greeted them as they descended from the ship. He had a golden monocle, which he used to inspect the new arrivals. Colonel Werthel, at your service, he said with a polite tilt of his head. Welcome to India, Count Primcourt. Behind him, two slovenly escorting soldiers with sly eyes watched all around them. If they hadn't been wearing the uniforms of British soldiers, Hank would have pronounced them cutthroats or thieves. Primcourt shook the colonel's hand. Thank you for the welcome, colonel. Please call me Mr. Primcourt. I've no wish to draw attention to myself here. Werthel leaned in close to the count. Very good, Mr. Primcourt. I don't suppose you'd share what brings you to our shores? I only ask so I may better assist you. Primcourt returned a diplomatic smile that didn't reach his eyes. A simple archaeological survey, nothing more. We appreciate your hospitality, Colonel, but I assure you we shall manage just fine on our own. Werthel's genial expression faltered almost imperceptibly. I see. Well, we simply must have you for dinner at the club tomorrow evening. It's the only place in this whole damned country you can get a decent brandy, he said with a conspiratorial wink. It will give us a chance to discuss how best for you to avoid trouble in this country and let you catch me up on the news from London. I appreciate your hospitality. We shall do our best, though I'm unsure of our schedule right at this moment, and I have a great deal of planning to do with my team. The colonel turned his monocle on Hank and Bella. Of course, of course, they're welcome to join as well. I'd love to hear the latest from the colonies as well. Hank frowned at the pompous colonel but kept his mouth closed. The windbag was still speaking. Well, I thought someone should welcome you to our verdant shores, you know. Please have one of your... He waved his hand dismissively at Hank. People contact my office and we shall arrange dinner. Or tea, if that is all your schedule allows. Primcourt shook the British officer's hand again. Thank you, Colonel. As the man departed and loaded into an open-air carriage, joined by his two louts, he waved an arm at them and donned a friendly smile. So glad you've come, he said. Then his smile faded, and he barked at his driver to take them away. Primcourt and Bella shared a look. What do you suppose that was about? Bella asked. Primcourt's brow drew into a pensive knot. That man is our guide's commanding officer. He's under orders to keep his nose out of our affairs, but it seems he's just too nosy to do that. News from the colonies. Pompous ass, Hank said. He could make trouble for us if he wanted to. We'd best be careful around him, Primcourt replied. As porters loaded their luggage onto a waiting carriage, Bella pulled Hank aside, her voice barely a whisper. Remember, Nimrod is here. He will be at the hotel. I'm not sure how he'll react to seeing me. Hank acknowledged her warning with a subtle nod. That was a concern, and the nosy colonel's obvious snooping was another. Their carriage rumbled through Bombay's crowded streets, allowing glimpses of bustling markets and whitewashed buildings tucked side by side. Hank marvelled at the sights, so unlike the cities he'd seen before. It was a curious mix of bamboo, wood, stone and steel, like the old world had just collided with the new in a jumble and crash, and things were still being sorted out. Primcourt waved his hand out of the window. It's a new place, this Bombay. Was just some fishing huts and small islets before now. But Her Majesty will see it improved. Turn this place into a jewel. Two hundred thousand people was hardly a new place, Hank surmised. When they arrived at the elegant inn selected by Primcourt, a bearer escorted Hank upstairs to a well-appointed suite decorated with teak furnishings and vivid silken wall hangings depicting fanciful figures with strangely contorted limbs. After freshening up from the dusty carriage ride, he ventured back downstairs to the airy lobby. There, a gaunt young man in a badly rumpled suit greeted him enthusiastically. To call him pale was accurate, yet he also had an almost green pallor, along with deep purple bags under his eyes. Hank almost named him some kind of creature, a ghoul like Radu, perhaps, until he recalled Bella had told him the doctor suffered from a stomach condition. 
Dr. Frail at your service, the man announced, pumping Hank's hand with a vigor that belied his fragile appearance before introducing the mousy brunette beside him as his assistant, Clara. The young man pushed a wild lock of unruly hair out of his face and asked Hank, What is your specialty, Mr. Bravo? Hank contemplated that. Mostly I fight monsters, I guess. Frail's eyes widened. Clara clutched at his arm and uttered, Oh my! Then Hank smiled and Frail let out a guffaw that was something close to the braying a donkey makes. Soon he was coughing, and Clara patted him lightly on the back until he gently waved her off. He brought out a handkerchief and wiped his mouth. This sickly man was going on the expedition. Chapter 12 Redcoat Spy Hank stepped out into the bustling street, and a new world overwhelmed his senses. One thing he'd always found enjoyable about his occupation of bringing monsters to the sharp edge of his blade had been the chance to explore new places. But this, India, so much to see and experience. Across the way, barefoot native workers toiled on a brand new, stately colonial building. An elephant stood nearby, giant ears swatting at flies. Each leg of the mammoth beast was as big as a tree trunk. A turbaned man perched atop it was goading the enormous creature to lift timber beams up to the workers. He heard the barks of unfamiliar languages as other workers moved about. A man in a faraway tower sang, his voice echoing out across the city, the call mournful and somewhat hypnotic. Some structures were exotic in the most pleasant ways, with curving balconies and towers, each window a decorative glassless latticework with some form of long tan window shades drawn down inside. Yet not all was strange. Ladies strolled in fine dresses, parasols aloft, and diners lounged at a sidewalk cafe as if this were a city in the West. But puzzling and perhaps troubling sights also abounded. Turbaned policemen manned barricades at either end of the street, twiddling yellowed bamboo canes while avoiding the pounding sun. Most buildings had guards, more cane-wielding natives and the occasional white man cradling a rifle or pistol, Clearly, dangers lurked to require such defences. A lone redcoat leaned against a building across the road, hidden in the shadows. Hank recognised the pinched face and shifty eyes, one of the louts who'd accompanied Colonel Werthel to the docks. Strange to see him stationed here alone. Had the pompous colonel dispatched him to spy on the new arrivals? Hank meandered across the street, as if taking in the sights, then made a beeline toward the soldier, whose hand drifted toward the musket leaning against the wall. "'What you want?' the man challenged in a surly, street-savvy British tone. "'Thought I recognised you from the docks,' Hank replied evenly. The redcoat's eyes narrowed. "'So what's it to you?' Hank stepped closer. "'Didn't catch your name, Corporal.' The soldier eyed him speculatively, perhaps even with a bit of wariness. Most people, especially Americans, wouldn't know one of Her Majesty's corporals from a general. Still, he continued his belligerence. Why you want to know? Hank cracked his knuckles. Might want to mind that attitude, friend. The man gave a derisive snort, pointing at all the security. One whistle from me and them native coppers gonna come running sure enough. You'll be in a cut then. I'll let them beat you down. Hank felt his blood rising. Call them. The soldier looked as if he might, then seemed to think better of the notion... Why don't you just get on, mate? No need for any trouble. He waved Hank away. Hank held his ground. I asked your name, Corporal. The soldier jutted out his chin, and I didn't give it, so bug off. Hank stepped closer, voice ominous. I'll just ask Colonel Werthel directly, then make sure you're disciplined. The Englishman's defiant look faded. After a reluctant pause, he muttered, Corporal Shuck, with a sullen scowl. Hank noticed Shuck's hand drifting toward his musket once more. Hank allowed his own to brush his sword hilt. I'd rethink that, friend. Shuck's hand snapped back. He took a wary step backward. Wasn't planning to use it, he insisted. Hank leaned in, rumbling, Corporal Shuck. I'll remember that name. With that, he turned and strode off, half expecting a musket shot in his back. But none came, and he crossed the street without incident. Nearing the hotel, he spotted a disturbance at the barricades. 
an Indian soldier in a British uniform argued emphatically with two native policemen, gesturing at the opulent Regency Inn. The fact the Indian was regular British Army was interesting. Hank didn't know there were any sepoys, as the native soldiers who fought for the British were called, in the actual British Army. Must be a new thing, though he admitted he was a stranger to this place and its customs, and the relationship between the East India Trading Company and Britain was confusing to him. As Hank stood outside the hotel entrance, he noticed the Indian Army officer growing increasingly angry as he argued with the policeman. The man was tall and powerfully built, with a warrior's hardened stare that Hank recognised from his time among fighting men and women. But neither his hard look nor his uniform mattered here. Apparently this street was off-limits to native visitors, even military men. Hank pondered the situation. Was it so different from back home, where black people were banned from many public spaces, even in the north? After a final stern warning to the belligerent policeman, the imposing soldier turned and marched away, dignity intact. Hank admired his stoic strength in the face of such disrespect. With that curious confrontation over, Hank turned his gaze back to the redcoat spy. With a casual wave to the scowling corporal's shuck, Hank headed for the hotel entrance. Primcourt had rented a second-floor lounge for their meeting. The balcony doors were open, allowing a fragrant breeze heavy with the scents of orchids and aromatic curries from the kitchens below to waft in. Hank had left Radu in their room. Best let me gauge the others before you're out and about, he explained. The knight was disappointed after being cooped up on the ship. It's temporary, I promise. We'll find a method to disguise you soon. A few more days at most. But you said my disguise gave me the appearance of a normal man, Radu said, frowning. Maybe for a quick glance in passing, my friend, but we're to spend an entire day planning. We'll be in close quarters. I don't think you'll be able to disguise yourself under such circumstances. Radu sighed and reluctantly agreed. A few more days, he muttered. A sudden afternoon downpour began as Hank entered the meeting room, the torrent tapping the windows and drenching the balcony. Despite the rain's cooling efforts, the air remained hot and oppressive, sticking Hank's shirt to his back as he settled into a chair. The others trickled in shortly after Hank. Bella cut a striking figure in her khaki hunter's garb, twin holstered pistols prominently on display. Primcourt entered, accompanied by two map-laden bearers, dismissing them imperiously once they'd deposited their cargo on the dining table. Despite the sticky heat, he wore a formal suit and vest. He announced to Hank, Here, you'll refer to me as Mr. Primcourt. None of that Count Primcourt business. I wish to maintain a low profile. Hank nodded, looking at the porters leaving the room. He doubted Primcourt had ever done any sort of manual labour and wondered what the man considered a low profile. Would he forego a footman? Forego the twenty servants everyone seemed to have here? Or perhaps that was unnecessary, since that's what everyone had. Young Dr. Frail arrived, clutching sheaves of curled parchment and crumpled charts, his perpetually unkempt hair even more dishevelled than when Hank met him. His suit hung on his slender frame, and he appeared to be at death's door, colourless, all bones and skin. Spotting Hank, he whispered, Fight monsters! with an exaggerated wink before erupting into braying laughter. His assistant Clara discreetly led him to a seat, a patient smile gracing her face. Next, Hank met Lieutenant Ram Singh, their local guide, the lean British Indian officer he'd seen arguing with the policeman outside. The man wore a well-maintained uniform without the hint of a wrinkle or stray Irish pendant, sporting a single ribbon. He was the first native Indian Hank had encountered up close. If the rest shared this one's noble bearing, they were truly a dignified people. Thought they weren't letting you in the hotel earlier, Hank remarked. Ram smiled tightly. They insisted I use the servant entrance round back. How irritating. Is the security always so stringent? Hank asked. Ram's jaw tightened. There's been some unrest of late. More officers on patrol. Tighter security measures, that sort of thing. Primcourt interrupted by clapping a hand on Ram's shoulder, making him wince. His father is one of the last Maratha warrior princes, he told Hank proudly, as if Ram were a prize racehorse. Savage warlords, the lot of them. The finest of native breeding stock, eh, Lieutenant? Quite, Ram said tightly. Maratha, Hank asked with interest. You'll have to educate me on that history during our travels. 
Of course, Mr. Bravo. I'll welcome the chance to educate you on the Maratha, though I'm half Rajput as well. His voice was congenial, a tone of diplomatic warmth colouring each word. However, his eyes remained inscrutable, revealing nothing. He uncorked his own map and spread it across the table. If we can complete this mission just through cartography, I believe we'll finish in no time, Hank said, waving at all the maps. Ram gave a grin. I, for one, am glad we have so many. India is a rich and mysterious land, good Mr. Bravo. One map would not do it justice. Also, chances are most of these are wrong in certain ways and right in others. Hopefully, between them, we'll be able to navigate without difficulty. It's all just blasted jungle, right, Ram? Primcourt asked, tapping at the land at the southwestern point where Bombay sat. There were islands, though close enough to shore to be connected by bridges. Ram considered Primcourt's assessment of Indian terrain. There is a lot of jungle, Mr. Primcourt, but India is a large country, with a diverse geographical profile. We have mountains, sprawling desert, swamp and grasslands. A diverse geographical profile, what a phrase. I see we have not wasted our money on your education, Ram, Primcourt said. Yes, sir, and I'm most grateful, Ram replied. Primcourt beamed. No, no, don't mention it. The least I could do. And my work in securing your commission? Think nothing of it. Hank thought Primcourt's tone said that the lieutenant should definitely think something of it. Apparently, Ram was indebted to Primcourt in one form or another. Ram took it all in stride, focusing again on the map. Hank also studied the parchment again. It was a beautiful piece of cartography, with fanciful illustrations and wording that looked like little half-circles and lines, marks and slashes. Ram gestured with his hand. Tell me where our journey will take us, and I'll show you the route. Primcourt grew serious. Yes, well, about that I would... There was a commotion at the door, and a giant of a man stepped inside. He seemed to hold someone back, and Hank glimpsed Colonel Werthel out there. The giant restraining the colonel had to be Nimrod O'Toole. He was a head taller than anyone else in the room, and had a flat face that looked as if it had been roughly carved from stone, then pounded by hammers a time or two. His shoulders and bull neck could fit an ox yoke, and his legs were like stone pillars. Let me pass, you buffoon! Werthel was shouting now. Nimrod's flat eyes fell on Primcourt, who said, Please allow him to enter, Mr. O'Toole. Nimrod nodded. Then his gaze took in Bella, and a cold flicker of recognition touched them. Hank felt as if he should step in front of her for protection. If that big ox charged them, Hank was going to have a hell of a time stopping him, unless he let the wolf out. Thank you, Mr. O'Toole, Primcourt said, and the big man turned and stepped out the door with one last glance at Bella. Werthel marched into the room, straightening his uniform and glancing back at the door that Nimrod had just exited. That was most uncalled for. I should have you arrested, you oaf. Imagine denying entry to a colonel of Her Majesty's army. I'll have my men horsewhip you. Primcourt gave a tight smile. How can I help you, colonel? The man puffed air out his walrus-like moustache. Help me? I'm here to help you. I thought... I mean, I believed you wanted me here to discuss the expedition. Primcourt shook his head. I'm not certain how you could be under such an illusion. Well, I... I'm an expert on India, don't you know? I assumed you'd want to take advantage of my wealth of knowledge on local peoples and the land. He gazed off into the distance, as if he was some majestic leopard looking over his domain. We're using your man here, Lieutenant Singh, as our guide. We won't need any other help. Still, I might... Colonel, might we talk in private? Primcourt asked. He pulled the blustery Colonel aside, who tried to peer over his shoulder at the maps. Hank hoped this Werthel would not be joining the expedition. He seemed like a barrel of trouble. Primcourt and Werthel might have thought their conversation private, but with Hank's keen hearing, he could make out every word. Primcourt was whispering, No, thank you, Colonel. The matters we're about to discuss are highly confidential. I can show you the letter granting me wide latitude in how I execute the orders of the Queen, if you'd like. She has a lovely seal. The Colonel was obviously offended, his face nearing the red of his uniform. That won't be necessary. I simply wish to offer my assistance. I mean, you can't count on a sepoy, you know. Lieutenant Singh is a good officer for a native, but still, you need a man with some reasoning and rational thought along with you. 
someone with some iron in his blood, not some damned lays about native. There's a rebellion brewing, don't you know? The last came out louder than the colonel probably realized, and everyone in the room heard it. Hank was glad to see irritation on all their faces. Prim Court waved his hands, as if he could cool the army blowhard's temper by fanning him. No, colonel, we have all the help we need. Well, I wish you the best of luck. You'll need it without my assistance, the colonel said, with the same tone as a four-year-old throwing a tantrum. He tucked his hat under his arm, about-faced as if on parade, and marched from the room. Nimrod O'Toole stepped in after the colonel left, scratching at his rough neck. Primcourt waved him in. You might just step in here for a time, please, Mr. O'Toole. If there are any more interruptions, we'll deal with them. The big ox grunted and squeezed himself through the doorway. Primcourt turned away from Nimrod, waved at the turbaned hotel attendant, ordered tea, and then sat in one of the comfortable chairs. Now, Lieutenant Singh, tell me what you know about vampires. The Indian soldier's eyes widened. Chapter 13. The Chaya Talwar. Ram reacted to Primcourt's words as if struck. Vampires, whatever do you mean? Lieutenant Singh, did you think I was unaware of your past? I've known about your interactions with the so-called supernatural for years, Primcourt said. Ram moistened his lips and took a breath. His pretense of shock dropped away. So? That is why you helped me? He asked Primcourt. No, Lieutenant, not only that, anyway, you're a bright young man. I saw that in you right away, and see it in you still. The muscles in the lieutenant's face tightened, and the map he was holding crinkled in one fist. What do you know about my past? I know dark creatures attacked you when you were a child. They drained the blood of your mother, sister, and brother. You only escaped by leaping into a river and letting it carry you deep into the jungle, where you survived on your own for days before you managed to get to a village. I know your mother changed into a vampire and came for you, and you killed her. Everyone was staring at Ram now, faces filled with sympathy. How awful, Hank thought. The lieutenant had the bewildered look of one caught in an ambush. He clenched and unclenched his jaw, eyes like flint. Primcourt continued, I know as a soldier you led a patrol to burn out a group of man-bats in a cave. Ram's face was a mask of stone. What is this inquest into my past? This was supposed to be a simple expedition. A tour, I was led to believe. By whom, Colonel Werthel? He was told nothing about our mission, Primcourt retorted with a superior grin. The lieutenant's posture relaxed a notch, as if he was a man accustomed to accepting unusual or less than palatable circumstances. What is the nature of the task? I cannot tell you that unless you agree to participate in the venture. It obviously has to do with the occult, or I wouldn't have broached the subject of your past. I'm very sorry. Primcourt's tone said he was not sorry at all. But both the Queen and the American President have agreed this is most urgent, and Her Majesty is aware of your involvement, Lieutenant. He said this last as if it would sway the man, and apparently it had the necessary effect. Ram settled back in his chair and declared, Very well, I will follow orders. Primcourt tapped the tips of his fingers together. Excellent. I knew you were a Queen's man. The Indian lieutenant winced at those words, but Primcourt did not care to notice. The British government official unrolled his map. Now tell me what you know of Narakund. Ram definitely flinched at that word. Narakund? His brow pinched into a tight crease. It's a, supposedly, a mythical volcano. Legends say a temple located there houses a shadow demon, a guardian deity. But... He trailed off and his eyes went to Primcourt. But that could only mean you think you found the Chaya Talwar. Frail stood up and brought out a thickly bound book. Yes, why we've found literal proof it exists. Primcourt cut him off. Thank you, Dr. Frail. We can lay out specifics later. Frail's excitement dropped away and he sat again, letting out a tiny wheeze as he settled into his chair. Ram eyed the doctor speculatively. Yes, I'm quite keen to hear those details for sure, because if you're truly going after the Shadow Sword, you might have better fortune looking for the Fountain of Youth like Ponce de Leon or the Pot of Gold at the end of a rainbow. But you're Indian. You don't believe the legend is true? Frail's eyebrows seemed unable to decide whether to narrow in thought 
or rise in surprise. Ram studied the doctor with a raised eyebrow. What does being Indian have to do with it? Do you believe in all the ghost stories in Britain, Dr. Frail? Frail shook his head. Certainly not. Ram snapped his fingers. Just so with me. I'm a practical man, foremost. There are a million stories of the supernatural in India, most of them nothing more than superstitious drivel. The doctor studied the top of the table sheepishly. I do apologize. I didn't mean to offend. Ram inclined his head, then offered, That being said, my mother's Rajput people are heavily intertwined with the tale of the Chaya Talwa. The Talwa was created at the beginning of the world to defend India from demons and evil creatures. At that time it was known as the Sunblade. Frail jumped in. One of seven guardian swords created and placed in the hands of benevolent rulers around the world, actually. Ram tapped his chin. I was unaware of this, but what I know of the Sunblade is that after generations of use it was bestowed upon a young prince named Ruksha, who secretly consorted with demons and dark magic. Frail nodded enthusiastically. You've heard the tale. Ram continued, spots of colour high on his cheeks as if he were ashamed to admit he knew so much of something he said he didn't countenance. Sometime during his reign the sword itself changed, no longer the sun blade, but now a bloody blade that was the opposite of what it had once been. It gathered and could control shadows. Was it just Hank's imagination or had the room grown a little dimmer, as if the darkness in the corners stretched towards them? He shook himself. He caught Bella's eye, and she was also looking around. She smiled thinly in his direction, then turned back to the maps. Myself, I'm not so convinced about the origins of the blade, but I am convinced it's real, Primcourt said, apparently playing the role of skeptic for the group. Ram shrugged at the interruption and continued his story. The gods warned Ruksha that he should restore the sword to its former glory, that he must repent of his ways, as you Christians say. Hank glanced at each person in the room. Most were taking in the story with unreadable faces. Nimrod, however, who'd seated himself at the edge of the table, had a dark look in his eyes, his mouth working. And now, as Ram paused, he broke into the discussion. What is this hogwash? This can't be why you've dragged me halfway across the world, he said to Primcourt. Primcourt waved a hand. As I said, Mr. O'Toole, I have my own doubts. Regardless, your pardon will take effect if you participate in the expedition. Waste of time, the big man growled. Perhaps, but then why should that bother you? You go on tour, as our lieutenant intimated earlier. You see India get paid well and receive a free ride home. Your sins washed clean, if I can also borrow a phrase from Christianity. And if I say no, then you'll be stuck here and of course your pardon will no longer happen. I expect many would come looking for you. People like our good friend Hank Bravo here, or Bella. Nimrod looked as if he'd swallowed a lemon. You think I'm scared of them? He stood slowly, and Hank followed suit. Bella and Ram rose right after. Chapter 14, Nimrod. Hank could easily fit in Nimrod's shirt twice over, and he was no small man himself. The giant's arms looked to be as stout as Hank's legs. Each bit of skin visibly held knots of corded muscle. His head was squarish, like an anvil, and looked to be about as hard. His eyes flat and unfriendly like a bull. Hank's stomach thumped. No, he didn't want to become the wolf, didn't wish to lose control. Bella rested her hands on her pistols, cocking them, the metallic clicks loud in the silence. Outside the storm was intensifying, the doors creaking. Primcourt said, Of course, Mr. O'Toole, if we are right and we recover this shadow sword, you'll be a hero, both in the United States and in the territories of Great Britain. You'll be invited to join the new team I'm founding and to receive a commission as an officer in the military. Nimrod studied each person in the room. Hank thought he might be one of those people that seldom backed down. He might throw away any chance at a new life just to show he wasn't a white-speckled chicken. Hank considered giving out a squawk just to goad the man. He didn't do that, but he did mutter, Why don't you sit down and shut up? Nimrod's flat dark eyes swiveled balefully to Hank. His ham-sized fists came up as if ready to throw a punch. Hank couldn't believe he had spoken. Who was willing to be reckless? To throw away a chance at redemption? But there was something about this Nimrod he just didn't like. A readiness to do violence, a feeling that the man had lived by his muscles and gumption his whole life. 
Perhaps Hank felt a kinship due to the similarity with this man. They both made their way on the strength of action. Hank's dislike for the man raised doubts about his view of himself. Stay or go, but shut up about it either way, Hank added. The big man's lips quirked into a slight smile. You looking for a thrashing little man? Why, you know someone tough enough to do it, Hank replied. I could whoop you with one hand tied behind my back, bravo, Nimrod growled. Hank chuckled. Well, quit gabbing about it and give it your best shot. Nimrod's flat eyes fell on each member of the party. What he thought was completely unreadable. His smile grew even larger, and Hank was certain he was about to get in a scuffle. Then the big man twisted his neck and it cracked. His shoulders relaxed, and he settled in his chair, waved a hand at the group. Right you are, Primcourt. I might as well go on this tour. Bella uncocked her pistols. Hank's gut was pulsing like it had a heartbeat all its own. He wanted to unleash the wolf, and it was disappointed at the missed chance. Primcourt's hand waving had taken on an imperious tone now. Please, sit down, Mr. Bravo, Lieutenant Bella. We have much to discuss. Hank regarded Primcourt. He wondered if the man had known this kind of tension would exist in the group. He glanced again at Nimrod and saw the man studying Primcourt with one eye twitching. Perhaps he was thinking the same thing. They all took their seats. It doesn't matter if it's a fable or a fact. Narakund is unreachable. It does not exist. And if it does exist, it is not on Earth, Ram announced, breaking the silence. We have someone who can find it, Frail said with a tinge of excitement in his voice. Really? And where exactly is it located? Ram's voice held a note of sarcasm. Frail studied Ram's fancifully illustrated map on the table. Everyone stood to see what he was looking at. The sickly doctor pointed at a patch of jungle. His finger fell on a volcanic crater rising from the trees. The portal is located here. Naraka's crater, Ram said. An approximate in English would be Hell's crater. A most inhospitable place, far from any cities, railways or navigable rivers. If that is our destination, it will be quite a journey. Perfect, Nimrod said with a sarcastic tilt to his voice. Ram seemed skeptical. I've been there before. There is no method of conveyance to another land. It's just a barren chunk of odd rock and soil in a long, dormant volcano. Primcourt clicked his teeth. You let Dr. Frail and I concern ourselves with the portal. Your charge is to get us to the crater. Ram performed some calculations as he studied the map. Even that will be a trick. No small feat just getting there, especially for ones unaccustomed to such travel. He ran his finger an inch across the map, starting from Bombay. We will use the rail as far as possible, but then our path will diverge. He slid his finger east towards that volcanic crater, though he stopped far short of it. We can take pole boats up the river Kripayal to the village of Medinipur. That would be the easiest route. Though it takes us in a roundabout way, it will save us time. He tapped a narrow dashed line running through the jungle. There is one track through the western ghats into Anantavan that allows elephant usage. My uncle can arrange that for us. Ananta, Anat, Clara echoed, attempting the word. Ram encouraged her attempts with an approving nod. Anantavan, it means endless forest. It is not a friendly place. There are hostile creatures, insects, and the volcanic activity spoils the water. Volcanic activity? Clara's eyes were wide. Ram replied, smoke pots, hot pools. Beautiful but dangerous. We'll need to be cautious, but we can easily avoid them. She smiled at his reassurance, and Hank noted that Dr. Frail reacted to this with a jealous twist to his lips. Apparently, there was more to Frail and Clara's relationship than just a business one. Primcourt wrapped up the discussion by telling them there would be more time to discuss the plans later. For now, however, we must begin preparations. Time is of the essence, he turned to Ram. Lieutenant, please see to the arrangements. I'll give you banking notes before you leave and gold if you need it. Nimrod, please accompany the lieutenant. I'll give you a letter from the governor to make sure you have no issues with procurement. He turned to Bella. Bella, I'd like you, Frail, and Mr. Bravo to accompany me to a nearby estate. It's where we'll find our method to reach the portal. Ram said, Mr. Primcourt, you should take an escort of soldiers with you if you're leaving the city. 
I can find you a detail of trusted men. Why's that? Primcourt asked, his mouth twisted as if he disliked having anyone altering his plans. There is unrest in the city right now, but the countryside is worse. A garrison of Sepoy killed their officers a few days past near Delhi. Closer, one of the company plantations outside the city was attacked, the officer and his family murdered. It's all the news right now. Damned savages, Primcourt hissed. Ram's face coloured at the remark, and he made an intense study of the ground. Primcourt seemed to notice the effect of his words and said, I don't mean you, of course. You've been educated. I'm referring to your baser cousins. Hank shook his head. Primcourt, you're an idiot. Primcourt's eyes turned to regard him, first with surprise, then with anger. I say there, Hank, what is the meaning of calling me an idiot? If you don't know, you're a bigger one than I'd first supposed, Hank told him. Bella broke in before things could escalate. Let's get to our chores, everyone. There is much to do. Ram waited for the room to clear, then approached Primcourt, who beamed at him and shook his hand warmly. I apologize profusely, my good man, for bringing up your history. It bears directly on our current quest, you understand, or I'd never have done it. Ram wasn't sure he believed his benefactor. The Count of Primcourt had always been kind to him, providing for his education in England and giving him a home away from home in cold, misty England. The Count even petitioned the governing board of the East India Trading Company to approve Ram's commission, but they'd refused. It took a special meeting with the Queen for it to be approved. Yet in the end she'd put her seal to Primcourt's request, and there'd been little anyone could do to stop it. And so here he was, Lieutenant Ram Singh of Her Majesty's Army, though he was provisionally assigned to the East India Trading Company Army and likely would never leave it. But always he wondered why the Count did so much for him. There were strings attached to each gift, each arrangement, each benefit. The Count never explicitly said it, but Ram always knew and now understood why. It made him wonder how long the Count had been planning this expedition. Had it been ten years? That was as long as Ram had known him. Ram was honest yet diplomatic in his response. I wish you hadn't spoken of my past, Count. They're not topics I wish to relive. Of course not, yet most of the principals of this expedition have also experienced some occult incident. Yet you did not speak of the incidents of the others. Only of mine, Ram reminded him. You are correct. It seemed the most practical way to assure them of your loyalty. Loyalty was an interesting word. Ram noticed it applied to people differently. According to some, loyal meant that others could treat Ram in any manner they chose, and if he objected, he was disloyal. He could not expect the same loyalty in return. For example, he'd received a terse note from his father forbidding him to join the expedition. It had been an order instructing Ram to return to Shamburaj Niwas, their hillside palace, that he might be ready should his father decide to join the fighting. These were all shoulds and mayhaps, of course, since there'd been no fighting yet besides a few raids on John Company estates and that business with the soldier killing a couple of his superiors. And his father had given no indication which side he would join should the unrest start. Ram was sure the cunning old fox would wait to see how things played out before he decided. His father was demanding his loyalty. Colonel Werthel also made the same forcible requests. Now he was hearing more of it from Primcourt. Britain wanted his loyalty, India as well. He felt as if he were holding onto the reins of horses galloping in different directions. Soon, he would need to choose one and let go of the other, or he'd be ripped apart. Hank took a few drops of his daily dose of elixir right after the meeting, but it did almost nothing. He had noticed a sharp decline in its potency the last week or so, once awakening in the night, sweating and staring out the porthole of the ship at the moon, with the wolf blood stirring, he took a few more drops and felt the primitive urges finally fade away. Perhaps there would be time to find another chemist here in India. He'd need to do something or risk losing control again. Chapter 15. Unrest. While Hank and the others spent the morning planning their expedition, outside the city, a young woman named Jane Avon awoke worrying about the minor concerns of everyday life. She had plans to visit friends in the city that day and was excited about the idea. 
and they were all to attend a ball that night welcoming the new governor. In short, she began her morning completely and innocently absorbed in the trivial concerns of youth. By mid-afternoon, however, as flames engulfed her family estate's great house and fields, those cares seemed a lifetime ago. Now she huddled under a wagon hiding from rampaging workers. Her brother Harry was dead, his pale corpse stripped and tossed in a ditch so that his bare, pink legs hung over the rim. The workers periodically came back to stab and kick him, each blow eliciting fresh sobs from mother, who lay near Jane. The young lady shushed her mother, patting her hand. We must keep quiet, she whispered. She considered slipping away along the drainage ditch. It was dry and deep enough they could use it, but mother was too old and frail for such a journey. Her loyal nanny, Mira, lying on mother's other side was not much better, and Jane would die before abandoning either of them. Three men emerged from the barn. Their faces were filled with wild, childlike glee, and they looked around with restlessness. Searching for something else to destroy, Jane supposed. Deepak was with them. An older gentleman, he'd always been so kind to her family. She'd called him uncle, yet now he was joining with the others, a hooked field scythe in his hand. They're coming this way, Mother whimpered. Shh, Jane admonished. She held a pistol in one hand and a kitchen knife in the other, but she wasn't sure who to use them on. She had doubts about her capability to kill three men and knew the grim fate of the women if they were found alive. She was almost sure they'd be raped, tortured and murdered. According to rumours, it happened on a nearby estate just the day before. The workers had spared no one. Should she shoot mother and kill Mira and herself with the blade? Could she do such a thing? What a horrific thought. Harry was too hard on them. I always told him not to be so cruel, mother said. She was close to sobbing again. Did he call for the soldiers? Mira asked, with at least the sense to whisper. Jane shook her head. No, he said we didn't need help, that the overseers would handle any problems. The fool. One of the men trotting in their direction hesitated for a moment. He looked their way. He gave out a low shriek and pointed at them. It was Deepak. To think she'd called him uncle. Damn, Jane whispered. She didn't have any extra ball or powder. Her best bet was to save the shot as long as she could and to figure out who to use it on. Bombay was a half-built city if Hank was being generous. If it really had 200,000 residents, they must be counting all the close villages which spread along the hills and took in four or five islands, all connected with dirt causeways the John Company had built. Inside the city proper, there were two or three dozen paved streets, and the rest were flat-scraped hardpan, worn with wagon ruts. Among the newer western buildings were many native temples and palaces. The beauty of the curving native architecture once again caught Hank by surprise. He loved the bright colours of those buildings so unique from what he knew. There were prosperous Indians here as well, and they passed several, some in palanquins carried by brawny porters and one riding atop an elephant. They drove around open-sided warehouses packed high with goods preparing for shipment, and always there were more native workers bearing large sacks or toiling on the land, overseers watching them with hard words for any they thought slacking. The sun was an angry orb directly overhead, and Hank was glad he'd worn his wide-brim hat. He could not decide if it was better to be in an open-air carriage where the breeze could cool them or to be in a closed one that blocked the sun. Where are we going? Bella asked, face shadowed beneath her own hat. Primcourt was tight-lipped, but her stare was unrelenting. A trickle of sweat rolled down his face. The Avon estate. They can help find the sword. How can they help? Do they have a map? Primcourt answered with an almost bashful tone. They are descendants of Merlin. Merlin, she asked incredulously. What do you mean? Hank speculated Primcourt had an aversion to being thought of as a fool and thought his guess correct when the Count doubled down on his assertion with heightened confidence. Yes, the wizard. This is the last of his family. Hank shared a look with Bella. He was thinking maybe the giant criminal Nimrod, who was off with Ram buying goods, had been right about his doubts regarding this venture. Descended from Merlin himself? As in the counsellor of King Arthur, she scoffed, one sculpted brow arched sceptically. That's quite a claim. What evidence do we have of this supposed lineage, and why should it matter? Primcourt's expression soured at her tone. 
I'll remind you the Queen and your own President have entrusted me to lead this expedition. There is a documented case of a member of their family line finding another enchanted sword in London a generation ago. Dr. Frail is quite sure of this. And so am I. He did not look sure at all. Bella held up a conciliatory hand, though her eyes gleamed with wry amusement. Magic swords, Merlin's family. In India, no less. You'll excuse me for having some questions about the veracity of the claim. Hank exchanged another subtle glance with Bella. He was a werewolf, after all, and they'd both seen lots of things that most people didn't believe in. But magic swords, Merlin the wizard, it was hard to swallow. They passed a column of sepoy infantry marching in their turbans, red uniform jackets and pantaloons. Hank also noted far more Anglo redcoat soldiers stationed on corners than their previous pass through the city from the harbour. Primcourt waved a dismissive hand at all the security. It's nothing to fear. The native soldiers are loyal as hounds. There's been some localised native unrest in recent days, but it's nothing to concern yourself with. The city is quite safe. Bella and Hank exchanged an uneasy glance, both struck by Primcourt's blasé attitude. If tensions here boiled over, would any of them truly be safe? Primcourt, however, had moved on to other topics, smiling at the prospect of their destination. Wait until we get to the Avon estate. Harry will tell you I'm right. He's our man, an old school chum of mine, don't you know? Harry's a good egg if ever there was one. Chapter 16. The Burning Estate. Jane heard galloping horses clomping far off down the road, though she couldn't see them from where she lay under the wagon. Soldiers? She hoped she was right, and that they were friendly. The three rebels had a less than enthusiastic reaction to the approach of riders. They stopped and looked toward the road that entered the estate in terror. She wasn't sure what they saw, but one of them turned and raced off, throwing down his scythe, while a second ran towards the sounds of horses, a machete raised high in his hand. Out by the gate a musket fired, men shouted, but she had a more pressing problem. The third man of the trio was Deepak. He advanced on the wagon, murder in his eyes. She took aim with the pistol, just as father had shown her, putting the tiny aiming bead right in the centre of the man stalking towards them. His eyes were red-rimmed and hard with anger, lips curled into a snarl. He would kill them, she was sure. She fired, and a blast of acrid smoke issued from the pistol while the ball took him high in the shoulder, her shot off the mark from where she'd intended the round to strike. Still, it spun him around and he fell to the dirt, crying out in shock. Mother screeched and covered her ears. Jane handed the pistol to Mira, the woman's eyes going wide as she clutched it close. Then Jane crawled out from under the wagon, brandishing the kitchen knife. She had to see what was happening and kill Deepak if he had any more ill intent. As the carriage rumbled down the dusty road, the first sign of something amiss was a column of black smoke rising over farm fields with its accompanying odour on the breeze. Hank sniffed the air. There was blood in it. Trouble, he said. Moments later, the stately Avon estate came into view. Flames were visible, licking up the sides of the grand, white-plastered plantation house and its columned veranda. Even from a distance, Hank could make out bodies strewn on the dirt drive that looped past orderly fields of crops and meticulously cultivated flower gardens. Cries of panic and anger carried to them on the wind, along with the smoke. "'It's an absolute madhouse,' Primcourt muttered in dismay, the fields were an endless sea of white cotton and golden wheat, now obscured by the smoke of their burning. Raging fires engulfed a dozen smaller buildings, including barns and worker quarters. As the carriage drew up the drive, the full violent chaos of the scene became clear. Rebel workers had killed a handful of overseers and others, both Anglo and Indians. There was a score of rebels milling about the estate now, wielding blades and farm implements, unorganized and unsure what to do next. It was a scene of hellish pandemonium and senseless brutality. Hank tensed, ready to intervene, his stomach churning at the wanton destruction of life and property. Thump! The wolf inside him smelled a fight. It's imperative we save Harry, Primcourt ordered in a harsh tone. Hank jumped off the side of the moving carriage and said, 
I'll probably just save any of the innocents. He leapt into the fray. The sepoys looked at him and he waved them to the house. Drive off the rebels and save anyone you can. It didn't occur to him until later that these same soldiers might have turned on him and the others. Down the road, a half-dozen sepoys on horseback rode towards the house. They carried long rifles and one stopped to aim at a fleeing rioter, firing a shot that felled a man after striking him in the back. There was also an open-air carriage and a group of people she didn't know were engaged in battle with the rebellious workers. A man on foot, this one handsome and lean, had a sabre in his hand, and as she watched, he quickly cut an attacker down, then struck another atop his head with the hilt of his sword, dropping his target in a heap. He then raced towards the house at an unnatural speed. He loped with animal grace and had unruly thick black hair on top of his head. She had the sudden impression of a wolf as he approached, though she thought it awfully unkind of her to ascribe an animal aura to a man who looked to be trying to save her life. Behind him, a woman with a wide-brimmed hat and breeches held a brace of fine silver pistols which she fired, killing the thug with each shot before expertly reloading them both in just seconds. Jane found herself intensely jealous of that skill, a woman in battle wearing trousers. The handsome, wolfish man racing toward the house saw Jane and veered in her direction. Meanwhile, Jane had her own trouble. Deepak struggled to his knees, blood rolling down his shirt and breeches. He tried to strike her with his scythe. She stepped aside so his swing caught only air. He was clumsy with his injury, and she stabbed him with the kitchen knife. But he didn't stop coming towards her, so she pulled it out, the handle slick, and she stabbed him again. Her hand slipped, and the blade cut her palm. He cried out and slashed at her. Thankfully, the blade of the scythe turned, so he caught her with the flat of it, though the blade still ran across her shoulder, and she felt warm liquid dripping from the cut a fiery trail of pain accompanying it. She stumbled and fell to her knees. His face was a rictus of rage as he grabbed her hair and yanked her head back. Spittle flew from his mouth. He raised the blade back and... The sprinting rescuer reached them impossibly and used an appendage that was more claw than hand to slash at the back of Deepak's neck and across his raised arm. Deepak stuttered and coughed. The scythe dropped to the ground and he soon followed it his eyes open in death, his back a gouged wreck. Her rescuer snarled the sound like a beast, then hunched, turned away from Jane, his arms half-cocked unnaturally. He twitched, still faced away from her, half-bent. He growled and coughed. She thought he might have been injured somehow. "'Are you hurt, sir?' She took a step toward him. He must have been clutching a dagger when he struck Deepak. His hand certainly had not been a claw. That was impossible.' He turned his head, and a golden yellow eye studied her, filled with fury. Yes, an eye the colour of the full moon, and just as bright. His teeth, fangs. He possessed fangs. She stumbled backwards, falling again to her rump. G get back, he told her, waving her off with a hand. He stumbled a step or two, then she saw him take a deep breath. Then he straightened, shaking his head and putting a hand through his hair. When he faced her again, his eyes were normal. His teeth were also normal, and pleasantly white and straight. What had she seen? Had she imagined it? His breathing ragged, he asked, Are you well, miss? His accent was American. She swallowed, her throat dry and resistant to any passage, and nodded. Then he noticed mother and Mira. He glanced round, and seeing no close threat, reached down and pulled them both from under the wagon gently, but with incredible strength. There was an animal rawness to the man, she thought once more. His neck and beard were scruffy, and his clothes were more in the state of a man at his Sunday afternoon leisure than normal gentlemanly apparel. Yet he was gentle with the women, and she felt so much safer with him near. Perhaps she had merely seen his rough beard and hair, and her mind had played a terrible trick on her because of his grizzled appearance and her fraught nerves. He wasn't some kind of beast at all. The sepoys on horseback arrived along with the carriage. The woman she'd been jealous of made her even more envious as she stepped to the ground. She was breathtakingly lovely, but wearing pants like a man, and that wide-brimmed hat. She had holstered her pistols, and they clanked as she walked, looking ready to draw them at a moment's notice and dispatch any who dared trouble her. Behind her came an older man of perhaps forty, who studied Jane with a sober face, 
and a younger man with unruly hair who leapt down with a medical bag and trotted to her side to examine her shoulder. That man looked fresh from the sickbed himself. Are you Jane Avon? the older man asked. He was an Englishman. I am. She almost curtsied but felt that would be too strange. Where is your brother, Harold? the man asked. She pointed a shaking hand at the ditch. The older man blanched. Harry's dead. This is a disaster. That night, when Hank retired to his room at the Regency, he shook the bottle with his elixir in it and drank a swallow, not bothering to measure it. He'd nearly lost himself today at the Avon estate. He might have killed one of the ladies. It had been a near thing their pumping hearts had called to him. He'd longed to taste the scent of their fear. The desire to howl faded as the heavier dose of the elixir worked on him. But he also felt the pangs of sickness coming on, and he grew feverish. He threw himself on the bed, shivering. Chapter 17 The Phantom The Phantom walked the grounds of the burned-out estate. He had to wait until dark to emerge. The problem with being tied to both shadows and possessing a vampiric nature was that he must work at night to avoid the pain the sun caused. High in the air, Chiropter, the Phantom's giant bat minion flew in lazy circles, looking for any sign of life. By the Phantom's side, both snake cultists and his own shade wraiths sifted through the ashes and rubble, though what the Phantom really wanted, a living member of the Avon bloodline, was nowhere to be found. The leader of the snake cult walked with him. The man called himself Viparita Nagesh. Despite his age and stooped posture, he had sharp, apprising eyes and at this moment he was watching the phantom closely. This was foolishness, the phantom said. Yes, Lord, our agents misunderstood my instructions. They were overzealous. A line of men knelt in the dust. His minions had rounded them up once night fell. They were those who'd attacked the house and burned the field, and then fled when the rescuers arrived. Rats. They were all vermin. The phantom reached down and grabbed one man, lifting him up with one hand to look in his eyes, then bit him and sorted through his memories, experiencing the attack for himself. The man had been mostly in the fields. He hadn't been part of the fighting at the house. He knew nothing useful. The phantom violently tossed down the man and grabbed another. The others were weeping, and a few tried to get up and run, but the phantom's shade wraiths rounded them back up and viciously forced them back to their knees. This second man had been one of the leaders, He'd been there in the servant quarters when a snake cultist arrived. The cultist had scared all of them as he emerged from a dark corner, his eyes burning with fervor and completely wearing all black. The phantom listened to this memory, then threw the worker into the dirt. He whirled on Viparita Nagesh. Your man told them to kill everyone. Why is that? The old man's face went pale and he stumbled back a step. I do not know. I swear to you, O oh mighty night shadow. The phantom waved a hand and Chiropter swooped in and grabbed one of his snake cultists. It was the same one who'd come here to deliver the orders. The bat's powerful wings beat hard and it climbed as the cultist screamed. When the bat was high enough it dropped the man, who plummeted to smash onto the hard tack drive. Both of his legs broke as he hit and he shrieked. The phantom tried again. Why did your man tell the workers to kill everyone? Viparita's eyes focused on his injured cultist. I don't know. I swear to you. The injured man called out between sobs. It was me, O oh merciful master. Your sisters came to me and ordered me to have everyone here killed. He tried to push himself up but called out in agony and rolled onto his back. After a few moments, he sat up enough to say through clenched teeth, they said it must appear as if it was part of the unrest. Just as the phantom had thought, his sisters were jealous and vindictive and didn't want their lord to have a new sorceress. But what to do about it? Should he tell his lord what had happened? Would he be believed? He faced Viparita, stepped closer to him, and smelled the man. One gift of being one of the Demon King's favoured hunters was that he could sense so much. Usually he could tell if someone was lying. On Viparita, he sensed old sweat, bowels loosened, and out-of-control heartbeat. But he could not sense if the man was lying or not. He stared for several seconds. The old man collapsed to his knees. I will put my oath on anything holy you wish. I knew nothing of this. The phantom raised a single finger. 
and his shade wraiths launched forward as fast as lightning strikes. It was over quickly. Every kneeling worker and all the snake cultists Viparita had brought with him lay dead. The phantom grabbed Viparita himself and held him by the back of his neck a few feet off the ground. Urin dribbled down his boot. He whimpered. I believe you, Viparita, but you will not fail me again or my shade wraiths will destroy your snake cult. He left Viparita kneeling, encircled about by his dead men. Chapter 18. Merlin's Heir. Jane sat in a pleasant breezeway lounge at the Regency Inn. She held a glass of wine, untouched. Mother and Mira were in a rented suite, sleeping, she hoped. They'd wept uncontrollably and been in quite a state by the time the carriage arrived at the inn, and she'd put them straight to bed. Now Jane was hearing the most incredible story, one which she didn't believe in the slightest. And so you see, your family is magically attuned. The young doctor, who apparently was an occultist, was explaining to her. An odd mixture of numbness and hyper-awareness had settled over Jane after the unfortunate events at her estate. Her brother was dead, her home was burned, the life she knew was over. But, and this felt entirely callous, she was alive. Mother and Mira were alive. That had been an impossible outcome only a few short hours ago, yet she still felt like a young fawn being stalked by a tiger, ready to bolt if necessary. How should I feel? she asked, and the young doctor stopped speaking, biting his lips in confusion as he'd been pontificating about a topic which had nothing to do with feelings. He sat near her, along with the swordsman who'd raced over to help her, and the older man who seemed in charge. Premcourt was that man's name. He'd apparently been a schoolmate of Harry's in England. The swordsman answered her, It's hard to know how to feel when terrible events such as this happen. It's common that you feel elation at being alive, fear for your own safety and for those who you love, guilt for being alive and sadness for your lost loved ones, all at the same time. She gave the man a brief, thankful smile, then turned to the doctor. He'd been speaking about the most unbelievable notions. Merlin, you said, she asked him. She knew her brain was jumping around, but felt unable to stop it. He nodded, more careful with her now. Apparently this young doctor was better with ideas than with feelings. It said a lot that the rough-looking warrior had been the one to answer her question, and not the doctor or the expedition leader. Frail was the doctor's name, she remembered suddenly. He was speaking again. She caught something about a sword, her family, and more lunacy about sorcery. She attempted a diplomatic reaction. I've heard some stories of our family line, but always thought them nonsense. We don't have any magic wands or charms or anything like that, even if such fanciful items existed. After she spoke, she tried on a smile that felt shaky and brittle. We hope they aren't nonsense, Primcourt said to her. We need to find the sword. It is of the utmost importance to the crown. You're with Americans. Do the authorities know about this? She inquired, feeling sudden fierce patriotism and a desire to defend the great British Empire against these invaders. Primcourt put on what he surely thought was a trustworthy expression and even pressed a hand to his heart. I represent the Queen in this matter, Miss Avon. I assure you, I have her full trust. I see he continued, and we've made a deal, the United States and Britain. The sword is to go with Miss Blackthorn to America for safekeeping, at least until Her Majesty asks for it back. Why would we give up such a treasure if it's so valuable? she asked. The man sighed. I'm afraid there's a lot of bothersome politics involved in that discussion, Jane, things you wouldn't fathom. But essentially, India is the reason Britain won't keep the sword. A creep of heat rose in her neck and cheeks, she didn't like this prim court. He reminded her of Harry, a pushy, condescending bastard. She winced at that thought. Her brother was dead, and she should not think ill of the dead. She considered Primcourt's words, then spoke slowly while thinking it through. So, with the unrest here, and the movements for independence in India, for which there is growing support in London, the powers that be have determined that having this sword remain in country could cause issues if the Indians found out about it. They might use it as a rallying cry since it is a legendary sword. It might work as a beacon in a storm, bringing many disparate Indian groups together, am I correct? 
The swordsman, Hank Bravo was his name, laughed. Looks like she can fathom quite a bit, Primcourt. Primcourt's face grew dark, but he tried to smooth it away to play nice with Jane. You are quite correct, Miss Avon. Also, if some sympathetic elements back home heard of this sword, they may give it to the Indians as a sop for the famines, not realising the chaos it might bring. Best it not be in British hands at all, yet remain safe with our trusted allies. She laughed, but it was a strained thing, her throat dry and scratchy. Hundreds of thousands dead, and London wants to give the Indians a sword? I bet they'd trade it for bags of grain. Jane studied those seated around her, thinking they might react to her comments. They had to know about the villages dying off by the score. They must know until recently there'd been little food for months for the native populations of many regions. The world had heard about all the famine deaths in India, had they not? On the other hand, she supposed the world was such a big place that perhaps these people didn't know about it at all. There was no food to feed their families, and no help from the British either. The Lord Governor had told Harry that he didn't want to feed the Indians, as they'd come to depend on it and become lazy. Harry had been furious at that, had nearly come to blows with the man. Harry had provided aid for his workers and their families, while in other areas she knew people starved. In the end, though, it hadn't mattered. The workers he fed had turned on him anyway, and food was only one reason the natives were unhappy. There was a score of others. Take, for example, the whole business with the Principality of Oud. The John Company's policy of annexing a state whenever there was a question about succession was causing panic and distress there. This was a complex issue with Oud, since many of the Sepoys came from there and they enjoyed certain privileges because of their status with the company, as soon as the annexation occurred, those privileges would disappear and they'd all be turned out of the service. Countless jobless soldiers would be unable to support themselves. It had the makings of a disaster. Primcourt clasped his hands together, almost as if praying, the movement catching her eye. The truth is, we needn't concern ourselves with why our masters want this sword or where we will take it once we find it. Our job is to retrieve the sword. She had to admit that was sensible, orders and all that. And with Harry dead, you're not sure what you're going to do. Primcourt and Frail shared a look. Primcourt huffed. We'll find a way. Soldier on, as they say. Jane thought about that woman with the pistols and the wide-brimmed hat. Despite her absence, Jane believed the woman would join the expedition. Apparently, there was another woman going as well, an assistant for this Dr. Frail. It was the 1850s, after all. Women could do whatever they wished, as long as it wasn't voting or deciding what they wanted to do with their lives, she thought with humour. She kept carefully away from her features. She had this moment. Right now she had an opportunity to determine her future. There were no more men in her family. She was the Avon heir, and mother was the holder of father's estates. There were no more cousins or distant blood. She spoke. Afterwards she wasn't even sure she'd decided but apparently she had. The words just fell out of her. What about me? I have the blood. This expedition will be quite dangerous, Mr. Bravo told Jane. Primcourt and Frail, however, were looking at her like men at the track speculating on an unexpected entry to a horse race. The doctor spoke first. It is true, she has the blood. Mr. Bravo's correct. This will be months of travel in inhospitable surroundings, Primcourt said though she could see his resistance was only a token, an expected offering at the altar of her sacrifice. I guess you'll find another way, she chided him. She liked word jousting as she thought of it. It was a sport that men never assumed she would excel at, yet she did, leaving many of them bleeding and vanquished. Do you think you could endure such a journey? There will be little opportunity for rest or refreshment, Frail told her, as if she were a fool. She put on an air of complete innocence, Oh, there are no suitable restaurants in the jungle, no inns as splendid as this one. The doctor's sober face watched her eyes. No, Miss Avon, there won't be. Hank Bravo jumped in. She's pulling your leg, Frail. She's already decided she wants to go and we need her, so why don't we quit with all the pussy-footing around? Primcourt's eye twitched at Mr. Bravo, and she suspected there was not much love lost between them. Still, the British official made her an offer. If you're up to the venture, the Empire would be in your debt, Miss Avon. 
Always good to have one's empire owing a woman favours, she replied, but I want more than that. Primcourt looked as if he'd swallowed a lemon. He cleared his throat. What else do you want? I want to be paid the same as the men, she declared. Hank let out a laugh, but she noted he seemed more to be laughing with her than at her, as they say. Primcourt said, the men are being compensated in non-monetary ways, all except for Dr. Frail. Fine, I'll take whatever he's being paid. Primcourt blustered and puffed at his moustache, his face rising to a florid shade. I'm not sure I can do that, he pronounced. Up to you, of course. I'm sure you can find another way, she said. She stood and made to leave. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm most appreciative of you saving my life. Primcourt cleared his throat. He grumbled, very well, the same pay as Dr. Frail. She sat back down. I accept. Before the men could all finish congratulating her, and generally making asses of themselves over her great courage, an Indian officer arrived. Curiously, he wore the uniform of a regular British officer. She'd never seen such a thing. The British did not commission Indians into the Queen's army that she'd ever heard. He was quite tall, broad-shouldered, built like one of those Greek statues her papa had kept in the study, though not overly brawny. His face was smooth and unmarred and carried a countenance of stern determination, as if he'd confronted trials and emerged the victor. His eyes swept over her, measured her, and she felt a sudden flush of warmth and straightened her dress. His gaze held a keen intelligence, but also the same hard stare that Mr. Bravo wore, a kind of lack of emotion in the eyes and a grim set to the jaw. The colour of his eyes reminded her of bits of polished coal. His attention fell away from her just as quickly as it had come, analysing the others in the room with the same dispassion. A British officer, an Indian. She knew who this was. Ram Singh, son to one of the last warrior princes of the Maratha. The company had given him a regular commission with pressure from London. It had been a gesture of goodwill to the Indians for their famine dead, but also as a concession to the leadership in London, who, whose global reputation was marred following the mismanagement of the famines. She regarded the man again and smiled dryly. She was sure the Indians would trade his commission for bags of grain. The lieutenant marched over and reported to Primcourt something about supplies and passage secured, he spoke of maps, guides, boats and elephants. The usual topics of men going inland. So tedious. But wait, not just men. She was not a mere observer, but a participant on this expedition. Suddenly the details mattered. She turned an attentive ear to the discussion. They say much of the countryside is in revolt as of last night. The porters are asking for three times the normal wages. Ammunition is scarce and grain is nearly impossible to find, the lieutenant reported. Primcourt took this all in, then replied, Thank you, Ram. I'm sure you'll obtain the proper supplies. The floor rattled. Jane turned to the door at the sound of footsteps. A man of Herculean proportions trudged into the doorway, so tall he had to bend to enter. To him, all other men were children. His skull was shorn of hair, his face white as bone, and thick-featured as if a terribly untalented carver had cut him from stone. He didn't even look around, but simply sat in a chair, which groaned under his bulk. Jane realised with some guilt that the doctor was speaking to her again. Perhaps he had been for some time. She felt foolish, but she had caught none of what he said. She interrupted him. And you, doctor? What is your role in this expedition? He stuttered, then stopped his discourse. I'm an expert on ancient law, a historian of sorts, a medical doctor and an inventor of devices. I'll get us into the temple and through any obstacles we encounter. She inclined her head to the man and said with only a minor note of mocking, a very useful sort to have on a mystical expedition. She turned to Hank Bravo. And you, Mr. Bravo, what is your occupation? The swordsman who had aided her at her estate studied the wall as if this were a troublesome question to answer. He cleared his throat. I'm here to protect people. Frail chuckled at this and said, a better answer than the one you gave me. This made Jane curious. What did he tell you? Frail's voice held a glimmer of amusement. He told me he fights monsters. The three of them shared a laugh. She quipped, Well then, Mr. Bravo, I hope we have no need of you at all on this expedition. The two men laughed even harder at that. 
she gestured at the newly arrived giant of a man who had picked up the Delhi Times and was perusing it. And what of him? Is he a member of this expedition? The near giant dropped one hand to look at her but said nothing. His eyes were the flattest, most predatory ones she'd ever seen, and a chill ran through her. Yes, Frail answered her, this is Mr. Nimrod O'Toole. She swallowed hard. Words were difficult, but she asked, And what do you do, Mr. O'Toole? The big man's lips twisted into a vicious smile. I am a monster, little missy. Chapter 19. Marriage I am going on this expedition, Jane announced, seated in the parlour of her mother's suite. Mother glanced down, then collapsed into a chair, swooning gracefully right onto the cushion. Behind her, a pair of natives fanned with giant punker fans on long rods, and Mira waved smelling salts under her nose. After recovering from her false bout of fainting, Mother said, Why ever would you do this to me, child? What with all that has happened with Harry? How could you? Mira clicked at Jane to support her mother. The Count has requested that I go, Jane replied. She knew this would carry some weight with her mother. But mother was ready for this verbal salvo. It must be a matter of some great importance. But Count Primcourt must see to his concerns, and we to ours. And though it breaks every custom, you must marry, and soon. There have been two offers already, and three more men wish to see you on the morrow. That is grotesque, mother. Harry died less than a day ago. I should be in mourning for half a year at least. A quick marriage is practical, my love. The Honourable East India Trading Company, in its wisdom, is not patient with its contract holders. We produce or we lose our estate. We must all carry our share of the load. How could we possibly manage it without a man? Mm-hmm, Mira added, as if this sound made it all as clear as crystal. You remember Archibald Morton? He has proposed, Mother said. Jane did recall Archie. The Morton family held the nearest estate to the Avon lands. They'd played together as children somewhat. Archie had this way of bobbing his head and twitching it about like a bird. Worse still, he was frightfully boring. Jane mimicked the bird head twitching now, and Mother must have known what she was doing because she frowned. Jane Gwendolyn Avon. He is a fine young man. He is a terribly dull young man. I've fallen asleep listening to his Nazali droning on more than one visit. He's obsessed with the goings-on in London and Paris. She stifled a yawn. If I'd known I was raising such a cruel snob, I'd have put a stop to your biting comments long ago. You marry him, mother. You're the heir. Mother waved at the two punker bearers, encouraging them to speed up their endeavours. She needed more air, apparently. The flat, wide strips of bamboo made whipping sounds as they increased their speed. The other proposal is from my cousin's child, Wesley. He's a vice commissioner in Hyderabad, you know. Wesley, a child? He's fifty if he's a day. All the hair that should be on the top of his head has migrated to his ears and nostrils. Oh, why must you be so headstrong, Jane? I'm trying to secure your future. I have a quite secure future planned. We'll find a quiet cottage where the cool mountain breezes blow, and when I'm there we'll spend our days picking wild fruits and flowers. Then, when I've had my fill of the travels I wish to undertake, I'll bag a respectable man who I love and give you a litter of grandchildren. A litter? Don't be crude. Mira shook her head, clicking three times. She patted her mother's hand, who squeezed it tight. Jane tried a different tactic. Mother, didn't you ever wish to do something more? Didn't you ever want to have an adventure? To not let the men have all the fun? Traipsing about the jungle will not be fun. There will be leopards, tigers, and snakes. Jane's smile faded. She could see in her mother's eyes the long generations of propriety, of tradition, and the stubborn call of, it's the way it's done, don't you know, that governed so much of her life. A kind of assured arrogance that the British way was the only proper way, and that all others were the work of the devil, or worse yet, would lead to embarrassment. She knew why. Her mother was afraid. She realised it for what it was. Here they were in India, a place where few British women lived to a ripe old age, and Mother had outlived all her Memsaib peers. But she'd always had a man in her life to provide for her and protect her. First, it had been Father. He'd been so confident in every action he took. 
With father's death, Harry took on the role of the self-assured protector. Now, there was no man in her life and it must terrify her. There was no one to turn to for all the important decisions. Jane wanted to marry someday, but she wouldn't do it to keep the John Company estate, and she wouldn't do it to make her mother feel more secure. And she had a mind for important decisions, and quite enjoyed making them. I'll allow you to take part in this journey if you agree to marry when you return, Mother said. And there it was, the offer. I won't do it. Then I forbid you to go. You can't. I've agreed that I will, and I'm of age. Mother waved an arm at that which Mira mimicked. Psh, 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 the old nanny whispered. Will you stop that, Mira? Jane scolded. Don't snap at her. You'd best learn to be pleasant if you're to wed. Men have such delicate egos, dear. You mustn't deflate their sense of pride with sharp words. Jane recalled quite a few times when her mother had given her father a severe tongue lashing. Had that been her being pleasant? But perhaps mother was right. Perhaps she should marry. It was how life was done, apparently. If she rejected all her suitors, she would certainly cause a scandal. Her desires lay in a different direction, however. She recalled looking at the globe her father had kept in his study. It was a marvel to her when she was young. It had an angled spindle that held it in place, allowing her to turn it and see the entire world. The blue of the oceans and the shaded green and brown of faraway lands. It was how she'd learned to read, sounding out those words, then diving into her father's books to learn about exotic places like Africa, Mongolia and New York City. She wished to see them all. She considered the lives of the workers in the fields. How many had the privilege of choosing to choose their actions, destinations or partners? Perhaps they had some freedom regarding that last choice, but otherwise most of those who'd laboured for her father had followed their ancestors back generations, sometimes working on the same plantations for hundreds of years. Was she simply being a spoilt brat? So she agreed, I will marry when I've returned from the expedition. Mother and Mira burst into joyful tears. It pleased everyone except Jane that she'd soon marry. Which man will you wed? Mother asked. I'll make that determination when I've come home, she replied. She contemplated the possibility of dying on the expedition to escape marriage. Chapter 20 A Hood Frail impeded Hank on the way out the door of the lounge, where they'd completed their plans and pulled him to the side. Miss Blackthorne told me of your friend from the Carpathians. Hank was so caught up in what they must do next that it took him a moment to register what Frail was saying. Radu? he finally asked as he caught on. He felt a twinge of guilt at having bottled the zombie night up in a succession of closed spaces since they'd begun this trip. The doctor leaned in and whispered, while glancing around conspiratorially, I have a special kit that may help to obscure his true identity. A mask. With the correct subterfuge, we could pass him off with little more than a bit of curiosity from most he meets. We could say he suffered burns or experienced a terrible malady that left him scarred and his skin sensitive to the light. A mask. Later, Frail brought the mask to their room. After marvelling at the sight of Radu and asking the friendly zombie a barrage of questions, poking and prodding and measuring the night, the sickly doctor opened a black attaché case and produced a grey hood with mesh eye holes. It was double-layered with a peaked top. Hank looked the thing over with scepticism. What is the purpose of such a hood? Frail beamed. It is protective, fire-resistant. I done it when working with molten metals. You want him to wear that all the time? Frail coughed once. It had the sound of death in that rattle in his chest. Perhaps that demise was still in the distance, but he definitely had some sickness deep inside him. The doctor cleared his throat, eyes red with the strain of his rasping cough, then offered, That will be up to him, of course. I'll build him something more practical when time permits. I will use a similar material, however. I constructed this from woven bamboo and thin steel rods. It will keep him cool but it is made with strong fibres. Radu didn't seem to mind the curious head covering. I will wear it. He put it on, and after some adjustment, both Hank and Frail noticed a problem. In the blue late afternoon shadows of the curtain-shaded hotel room, the undead knight's eyes glowed right through the eye holes. Frail dug around in his bag for a time, 
then produced a pair of spectacles that had a strap that connected their ends. I use these when I'm cutting metal or wood. It protects my eyes and should do the same for you, he told Radu. Radu placed the curious things over his hood, tucking the strap inside the outer layer. You resemble a fearsome insect, my friend, Hank told the knight. Radu went to gaze at himself in a mirror hanging from the wall. I approve of this ensemble. Yes, I find it very fetching, Frail grunted. I'm glad you're pleased. Now I'll need an entire suit of armor to match it, Radu said speculatively. Frail scratched his chin. I don't have the proper equipment here to craft such a suit, but I'll do it once I'm back in my laboratory. What will we use as a suitable explanation when people ask about these rugged spectacles? Hank asked. I once heard of a woman scarred by a blistering illness. When the sickness had passed, she had a permanent sensitivity to light, Frail replied. Ah, that deception will prove easy to recall, Radu said, regarding himself in the mirror. I think I look splendid. He turned this way and that in the mirror, like a peacock on parade, though Hank was glad the colours of the disguise were muted rather than bright like that eye-catching bird. Hank had to concede that the hood and mirrored blue lenses of the spectacles did indeed give Radu a pleasing appearance, though Hank would not wish to cover himself so, especially in the wretched heat. Yet Radu did not feel sensations in the same way as a living soul did. Perhaps it wouldn't bother him at all. I'm grateful, Doctor, Radu told Frail. Jane stood on the balcony of the lounge where the group had met to plan. She couldn't sleep, though she knew there'd be tough days ahead, and wished she had. The world was brighter than it had ever been, the star-strewn sky stretching above and the hiss of lanterns in the courtyard below. Fireflies danced in the air, and an occasional fruit bat winged over the top of the hotel, snagging some winged little insect. It all felt closer, more vibrant, more alive than these mundane things had ever been before. She was off on an adventure, and she was determined that her life would never be the same after this. The expedition was only the first of many such trips she'd have. A pair of workers walked by below her, whispering, and the sounds of Hindi being spoken brought memories to her, turning her mind to other, weightier matters. She recalled the sun-baked dust of the fields of her home. Even last week she had walked out among the workers, bringing them water and sliced melons. They'd shared a lunch under the lemon and orange trees, laughing as Deepak told her a story about his nephew Arjun who'd made the mistake of marrying his betrothed sister in some unfortunate turn of events that the bride's father orchestrated. She thought of the cool courtyard breezeway and garden where she'd spent hours as a child, playing with the children of the workers. But these memories all ended with the scent of burning wood and cotton now, the sound of the crackling fires. Back in the present, she caught the sound of nearby voices. Inside, someone was at the table, Furtively, she risked a peek inside. She wasn't sure she should be in the lounge, though no one had told her specifically she could not. It was the Indian lieutenant, Ram. She spied on him for a moment. He used a compass and a notebook, taking measurements and consulting a book, and there were three other soldiers with him, all natives. She wasn't sure if she should announce herself or hide. He was Indian, and the Indians were revolting just now, who knew where this man's heart lay? She'd have thought that those children she played with all those years would not try to kill her nor kill her brother, but they had. She had considered Deepak loyal. The lieutenant and his men were whispering. What was he up to so late and making these strange notations? Perhaps he intended to give this information to the rebels or a cadre of bandits. She became instantly furious and marched into the room. What are you doing? she asked daringly. He kept making his notations for a moment more, then carefully lifted his hands from the compass and map. The other soldiers met her gaze. They were hard, lean men, and she recognized them from her rescue the day before. She felt a little foolish but pressed on. If they really were rebels, she'd likely just killed herself. She took a few deep breaths and planned to scream bloody murder if they did intend to murder her. Ram stood and inclined his head. Good evening, Miss Avon, you're up rather late. I asked what you're doing here alone, looking over the map. His cheeks tightened, but then his lips quirked. A guide must know his route. He must know approximately how long each leg of the journey will take. 
He must know the best places to camp where we can find fresh water, and he must have contingencies in place to get more provisions and for alternate routes should inclement weather or other unforeseen events occur. Heat rose into her cheeks. Of course, that all made sense. She'd heard him and Primcourt discussing the details of it. She turned to go. And I'm not alone, he said. She turned back, and all four men were grinning. He gestured at the surrounding men. These three are little better than mules, yet they are living, breathing people. The other three men reacted with hoots and jeers for Ram when he said this, one of them picking up a pencil and holding it as if he might fence with the lieutenant. Very amusing, Sahib. I hope someone doesn't accidentally shoot you in the back, said the big Pathian to the lieutenant, with a dash of gallows humour. The lieutenant grew serious. It would be excellent to see you hit something you were aiming at, Zothan, even if it was me. This set them all off again into gales of laughter, and Jane fled, feeling foolish. How could they jest about such awful things? People were dying now, and it wasn't simple to tell who was friend or foe. Tears streamed down her cheeks, as the full memories of the unfortunate incident at her family estate came crashing back down upon her. She determined she would watch this lieutenant and his men most closely. It might mean the difference between life and death. When she had gone and one of the soldiers had closed the door to ensure they were alone, Ram and the others sat down. They were all men he'd fought with for years. They'd all served his father before him. Zothan inclined his head towards the door. She's a spirited one, that filly. Shot and stabbed one of the rebel workers before the Anglo Hank cut him down. It uplifts me to see she does not care for you, Raja, said another. Yes, I grow so tired of all the women only showing interest in the Raja, said the last. No need to worry on that account, she does not care for me at all, Ram replied. What will we do, sir? Zothan asked, turning the discussion to the serious. In front of the others, the Pathian sergeant was more respectful than when it was just Ram and himself. I've given my word of protection for the expedition. I will not break it. And if the rebellion starts in earnest and your father calls for you? Zothan asked. We'll find the right path to take if that happens, Ram responded. Even to himself, the words felt weak. He had not told Zothan that his father had already sent for him, and he'd refused to go. My brother says his entire garrison is talking revolt, one other said. Yes, every message I receive is from another man speaking of plans to take up arms and kill the Ferangi, the last man replied. Ram stood. Listen to me, I'm aware that heading into the countryside amid this turmoil is a fool's errand, yet the task we're set upon is just, and I've given my word to the Count. Zothan grunted. And the Chaya Talwar? You'll let the Anglo woman who wears black take the shadow blade to her country? There was always another question that Ram couldn't answer. The sword was part of India. Another decision we'll make when it is time, but for right now, I do not intend to let any Anglo decide what happens with it. The soldiers gave out a light huzzah. It was an hour before dawn by the time his companions left Ram alone in the lounge. He rolled up the maps and carefully placed them in bamboo receptacles. They would be indispensable on the journey. A presence joined him in the room. He could not have said how he knew it was there. It might have been a feeling of disquiet, like hearing distant howls in the night. Or perhaps the darkness in the room grew stronger, as if it were alive. He whirled and drew his sword, and a shadow stepped away from the corner of the lounge. Features resolved themselves. The figure grew smaller until it was only a small boy. No, it cannot be, Ram called, and barely kept the grip on his sword. I echo your words. I was unaware you'd lived, the creature said. It was his brother, unchanged from the boy he'd been, except for his glowing crimson eyes and the shadowy cloak wrapped about him which danced and popped as if some wind from another plane touched it. His skin had a sickly pallor, like he'd been underground for far too long. We never found your body, Ram muttered, realizing it as he whispered the words. They'd just assumed the vampires had taken the boy for feeding. His legs felt weak, and he brushed back against the table, though he hadn't been aware he was backing up. His brother's voice was raspy. I have little time, brother. I came to warn you not to join this expedition. It will go against you if you cross my master. Your master? The great and mighty demon king. 
Ram felt as if he'd taken another blow. All those years ago, he'd assumed the vampiric attack on his family had just been random, just a pack of the creatures on the prowl. The Demon King attacked us, turned you? He is the one who liberated me, yes. A cold, hard rage came over Ram. I'll see him dead. His vampiric brother shook his head. No, Ram, I warn you to stay away. My master has placed me in charge of stopping this venture, and I will see it done. I'll see every member captured or killed. Nothing can stop me. Stand aside and live, challenge me and die. His brother took a step backwards into the shadows and vanished. Help! came a cry of alarm from outside. Gunshots rang out in the courtyard. Chapter 21. An Inauspicious Start In the hour before sunrise, most of the expedition team gathered in the well-lit courtyard, eager to embark on the first leg of their perilous quest. Dew clung to the vegetation. Anyone who walked over grass or brushed the plants hanging about the hotel was sure to come away wet. Servants circulated with drinks, chopped fruit and flatbread. Primcourt had ordered them to eat while preparing. There wasn't time to sit and break their fast properly. Dr. Frail produced a crate with five experimental cartridge firing rifles and Hank examined one of them with an expert eye. The instructions to operate it were simple. One folded the breech downwards and loaded a self-contained bullet into the barrel until a rim at the rear of the piece of ammo stopped it from going further. We have 200 of these cartridges, Frail told him. Hank held up one slender piece of ammunition. The bullet itself was conical and jammed right into a brass tube, the connection crimped to hold them together. That's where the powder is, Frail said, tapping the brass. When the hammer falls, it will strike the primer here, causing a small spark inside, which will trigger an explosion of a sufficient magnitude to generate enough velocity to propel the bullet from the end of the weapon and leave the remaining shell in the breech, which can then be discarded. Hank loaded the cartridge, then snapped the breech shut. He flipped it back open, then withdrew the cartridge and handed it back to Frail. The rifles are of a French design originally, though I've made my own modifications, of course, Frail was saying. It will fire accurately at 300 feet and likely could fire 10 rounds a minute if the shooter were a fast enough loader. Clara stood nearby organizing the doctor's clothing. Meanwhile, Primcourt scrutinized a clipboard clutched in his hands, looking over a pile of crates. Jane Avon had said her goodbyes to her mother and Mira and was wearing breeches and a khaki shirt they'd procured for her, walking about in them and spreading them to experience the fit. She passed by Hank and Frail doing some deep knee-bend exercises. Never worn trousers before, Hank asked. Never, she replied. She wiggled and pulled at them, as if they bunched in the most uncomfortable of places, yet she smiled at Hank and told him, I'll grow accustomed to this rather speedily, I wager. She leaned in close to him and whispered, though I'm not certain whether I would wish my acquaintances to see me in this liberating ensemble or if it would embarrass me, not that pants are completely unheard of in India. Muslim women sometimes wear them. Perhaps I should find a face covering as they wear and pass myself off as one. Hank smiled at her, then turned away and noted Nimrod standing with his back against a wall, eyes sweeping the courtyard for enemies. Hank wondered who made it on that list for the big man. He met Nimrod's gaze, and the man's nostrils flared. They'd not spoken since their confrontation the day before, though whenever one was in the room the other knew it. They were like two top dogs in one alley. At some point, one was going to have to concede the alpha position to the other. Hank didn't like the man, Though honestly, Nimrod had done nothing wrong during their brief time together other than be wary of Primcourt's plan, which Hank thought might not be a knock against Nimrod, but a point in his favor. Before he could contemplate this further, he heard elevated heartbeats and sensed motion. Dr. Frail was inspecting a newly opened bandolier of the cartridges for the rifle. Hank snatched one, shoved it in the breech, and snapped it shut. Gently, Mr. Bravo, they're delicate devices, Movement behind him. He whirled. A dart whistled through the air, aimed at Dr. Frail. Hank's sharpened reflexes took over. In one smooth motion, he yanked the crate the doctor was holding into the path of the projectile inches from its target. At the same moment, Nimrod reacted, racing across the space and grabbing one of the serving trays from a startled servant and using it 
to block another volley of darts, hurtling from the balcony above. Dark-clad assassins rained down, wielding blades and blowpipes. Snake emblems marked their garb, cloth wraps concealed their faces, and turbans covered their hair. With serpentine speed, the intruders wove between stone columns intent on murder. But Hank, Radu, and Nimrod were ready, survival instincts igniting into action. Hank stared amazed as a steady stream of black liquid trickled from a shadow, then formed into a man-shape, becoming one of the attackers. Hank snapped the experimental rifle to his shoulder and fired it at the mystical enemy. The experimental round sped true and the assassin fell onto his side, where he did not move. Hank handed the rifle to a bewildered frail, then brought out his sabre and leapt into the middle of the fray. With an almost casual grace, he disarmed one attacker and redirected the villain's blow into his partner's gut. The two crumpled to the ground in a tangled heap of flailing limbs. Radu, who'd been unobtrusive in the shadows, launched into the fight with his usual poise, the blows of his ancient sword Pommeldrake augmented by a dead man's tireless strength. Though outnumbered, he was untroubled by notions of pain or exhaustion. A dagger thrust that cut his flesh caused him little distress, and he crushed the assassin's wrist with a hard chop of his sword, reducing bones to pulp. Nimrod was a whirlwind of raw brutality, tossing enemies aside like ragdolls, a vicious grin splitting his craggy face. Even Primcourt steadied his nerves enough to draw a pistol and down one villain just before his knife arced toward Frail's heart. The gunshot reverberated through the courtyard, followed by the clatter of the assassin's dagger against the marble floor. In moments the intruders retreated, stepping backwards into the shadows and literally vanishing. Catching his breath, Frail let out a shuddering gasp, knees wobbling as delayed panic set in. Good heavens! That was entirely too close for comfort, he exclaimed, mopping his brow with a handkerchief. Hank snatched back his new rifle from the bewildered doctor, then flicked the spent shell into the dirt with a clank of brass and reloaded it, still scanning their surroundings for any lingering threats. Nearby, the corpse of a hotel attendant lay splayed on the ground, skin blackened and desiccated. One of the envenomed darts had found its mark. Thank you for saving me, gentlemen, Frail said, trying to stifle a choking cough before it appeared. Nimrod snorted dismissively at Frail's praise. If it wasn't for these quick reflexes of mine, you'd be buzzard food by now, bookworm. He gestured at the withered remnants of the crate and suitcase that had shielded Frail, both smoking from contact with the acidic poison. Ignoring Nimrod's bragging, Hank's thoughts turned to the source of the unexpected attack. No sooner had Nimrod spoken than hurried footsteps announced Bella, Ram, and their squad of sepoy guards. Bella's hair was disheveled, her cheeks flushed from rushing from the other side of the inn. Seeing the aftermath of the battle, she exhaled, It seems you've had some adventure before the adventure. She turned to Hank with one brow raised. Any idea who these devious killers were? Hank shook his head. I've no idea, though they attacked with a kind of mad fury. I swear to you they were able to become one with the shadows. I observed that as well, Frail agreed. Yep, it happened. Nimrod's voice was soft, his eyes wide. They just vanished and appeared where they wished. Jane rubbed the goosebumps on her arms, stepping up closer to the others, while glancing round at the dark corners of the courtyard. If an enemy can do such a thing, how can we possibly defend against them? No one had an answer for that. Hank had another thought. Our quest has drawn unwanted attention already. Snake cultists... Ram said grimly from where he knelt near one of the attacker's bodies. They're in league with the Demon King. How could you know that? Primcourt asked. The Indian replied, It is known they follow him. They use his powers to ride the shadows. I predict we will have powerful enemies on this journey. Powerful enemies? Jane Avon's face was pale. You can be sure we have them if news of our expedition has spread, Primcourt informed her. As the others conversed, Nimrod silently approached Hank. How'd you know the assassins were there, Bravo? You moved before they even announced themselves. If you hadn't, that fool of a doctor would be dead. I heard something, Hank replied. Nimrod was skeptical. Heard something? You must have very good ears. Next, he turned to Radu. And who is this? He pushed back the zombie knight's outer hood. 
Most of the people assembled, which included several members of the hotel staff who'd gathered after the commotion, reacted with shock on seeing the spectacles and inner mask. Hank cleared his throat. This is Sir Radu Tanase, Knight of Transylvania. He wears that hood and eyeglasses to protect himself from light, which causes him irritation and to hide his scars, which came from a horrible burn. It was an easy lie to tell, though Hank despised deception of any kind. He wished to protect his friend, however, and this seemed the best method. Some curiosity greeted this announcement, but little more. Jane walked with halting steps to Primcourt, still clutching at her knife, though her hands were shaking. I did not know we'd be in such peril, she murmured, voice quaking. Before Primcourt could speak to her, she took a step backwards, then turned and ran off. Well, we've lost one little mouse before we've even started, Nimrod said with a chuckle. Hank wasn't sure. He thought the woman would be back. She'd stood up to those rioters at her home. She'd stood up to Primcourt and negotiated a good salary for the expedition. Miss Jane had iron in her. He turned and found Nimrod standing very close. The man leaned in so their noses were almost touching, then sniffed a couple of times at the air. Something don't smell right about you, Bravo. His eyes were dead, as always, and his lip curled in a sneer. My cologne, perhaps, Hank answered. The giant next turned to Radu. Something's not right about this fellow either. Both of you stay out of my way. I'll do my best, Hank retorted. Ah, yes, I always do my best to stay out of people's way. It's only polite, Radu told him. Nimrod didn't seem sure how to take these responses, and in the end he stepped away and asked the doctor if he could have one of those cartridge rifles. Hank kept his as well, grabbing three bandoliers of ammo. We'd best be going post-haste, Bella told them all, looking at the curious bystanders who were getting thicker by the moment. A fine idea, let's... Primcourt trailed off as Jane Avon sheepishly tucked herself back into the group. He smiled at her. Let's load up and get to the train. We've a long day ahead of us, and I've no wish to be here when the constabulary arrives. I don't want an investigation delaying our departure. Hank looked around. That made sense. He saw a darting movement. Corporal Shuck, Werthel's shifty little spy. The man was wide-eyed, taking in the scene of death and destruction. Before Hank could react, the man slipped off. Within minutes, they were aboard carriages, clattering over Bombay's mix of cobblestone and hardpan streets, heading towards the wilderness beyond the city. Jane sat next to Bella, who produced an extra pistol and showed the young woman a few tricks with it. Jane was intent on the instruction. Chapter 22 the greater evil beyond. I'm aware that your sisters are scheming against you, my phantom, the Demon King informed him. Today he dressed like a man from head to toe in very fine robes, and he exercised impressive control over the shadowy mist, which usually clung to his eyes, pushing it away. The phantom was confused. Then why do you not stop them, master? They stood together in the inner sanctum of the Demon King's temple, with the phantom's sisters thankfully nowhere to be seen. He'd reported the bungled action at the Avon estate, with the rioters killing one of the last heirs of Merlin. I cannot always protect you, boy. You must learn to guard yourself against treachery. But they are also betraying you, my lord. True, and I will punish them. Almighty one, all you'd need to do is stretch forth your finger and you could lay them low. Why do you allow them to do as they wish? Do not rage at them, young one. The power of the sword has corrupted your sisters, it happens to all who are within its presence too long, just as it is happening to me. Some days I have only a desire to work evil. You are not evil, my lord. Am I not? Some days I am uncertain of that. His master straightened his robes. And they are not the only ones I was teaching. I have many lessons to impart, young one, both to them and to you. To me? You saw your brother. Is he in good health? I... Yes, I saw him. The phantom searched the ground at his master's feet, thinking of what to say. He'd been a fool to believe his master would not learn of his attempt to save his brother. The demon king inquired, why are you apprehensive? I hope you're not wroth with me. I needed to warn him to protect him, but I also believed my warning might make the task easier. It might drive away some of our enemies. 
clever, my phantom, and perfectly normal to wish to protect your family. Thank you, my lord. As for the matter of your new family, your sisters are also your enemies. But you said not to be angry at them. Yes, I am not angry at the serpent who strikes at me, but that doesn't mean I embrace it. The phantom nodded his understanding, and his master continued, You must be on guard, and always ready to defend yourself from them. Yes, my lord, but why do you keep them so close if they are our enemies? For the time being they are your enemies, not mine. If there ever comes a day when they are more dangerous to me than useful, I will destroy them. The demon king swept back his gold-lined robes and walked casually to one of his mirrors. It showed a street in the human world. In Bombay, the phantom thought, an ugly squat inn in the fashion of the Anglos. The mirror looked down on it from across the street. Do not dismay at going to speak with your human family. There was always going to come a time when you were going to be torn between the life you had and this one, his master said. I'm not torn, my lord. I know my place. Really? I always have been, the demon king said. There are times I miss being plain Prince Ruksha, as I was before I assumed the burden of guarding the sword and preventing it from being removed from its place in the portal, times I wish I'd died with the other protectors. The demon king's shoulders sagged as he watched the mirror. I could almost hope they'd come here and take the sword, that they'd kill me. Do not say such things, master. We must keep the taint of the sword from the world, and to continue to stop the greater evil beyond the portal. The demon king turned back to his minion. I do not believe any of the humans remember why I was given this charge, my son, why the vampiric curse was placed upon me, so that I might live forever, as watchman to the cursed portal. The phantom agreed. He knew what the humans thought. They do not, my lord. They believe you caused the curse, that you are the real evil. Save me from fools, his lord said, a grim smile on his lips, but I cannot begrudge them their error. I've become a monster in order to protect the world from the blade. The allies I keep are the basest, worst sorts of creatures both here and in the human world. The alliances I've made with the other lords of the underworld are seen as reaching for power, and I cannot deny that appearance. He waved for the phantom to approach him. I allowed your sisters to attempt to kill Merlin's heir, so that I might teach you a valuable lesson. I needed to show you to be strong, so that one day you might be my successor. You must be aware there are very few you can trust. The phantom set his jaw in a firm line. Soon you will have your own children with your new bride. There will be many of us you can trust. The demon king regarded him intently as if he could not believe the boy was real. You are not in the least envious of these true-born children-to-be, are you? You have not a whit of jealousy in your bones, do you? Jealousy? that I might replace you. The boy fell to a knee. I serve at your command, my lord. If it is in a different capacity, I will do as you say. I look forward to one day serving your children as well. The demon king lifted him back to his feet. This is why I will exalt you above all others, my phantom. You, of all of them, can I trust. The phantom had another topic he wished to speak of, but he was unsure how to approach it. His master, however, was wise and sensed already what his minion would wish. I know your mind, my son, but speak your thoughts that I might hear it from your lips. We might make an accord with those who approach, my lord. We might show them the truth of things, the phantom said with an earnest tone. His master shook his head. If I thought they'd listen, I'd send you as an ambassador today. We would not delay. I will go if you command. It cannot be. They will not listen. The demon king sat on his throne, but he did not lounge. One hand gripped the armrest tight, the fingers digging into the skull there. You remember I had another wife long ago. Of course, my lord. We thought then as you do now, and after she begged me as you do now, I sent her to entreat with the rulers of the land, that they might remember who we were and why we labored in this dark, cold domain. The phantom tried to imagine it, a shadowy, vampiric woman, wishing to speak to the Maharaja. He sensed already that the ending of this tale would not be a happy one. The guardians of the Maharaja murdered her before she could even speak with them. His master's words grew soft at the end, but his eyes glowed, burning with red fire. No, 
We cannot trust the humans. They will not listen. The boy knelt near his master's feet. But I... You will do as I command you, my phantom. Yes, my lord. You will kill these seekers of the sword, and any others who come for it, as long as you are able. I will do as you command, my lord. His master patted his shoulder. It was an uncommon gesture of affection, and the phantom nearly fell over in surprise. Still, he never ran out of questions, and he asked one more. Something troubles me. Why did you invite them here, master? The Anglos? I need Merlin's heir to arrest the growing power of the blade. The seals weaken. Her ancestors once came of their own accord to help me control it. And your bride, will you marry the heir of Merlin? No, that is forbidden. No children could come of such a union. The bride must be another. The phantom inclined his head. I will bring them both here, my lord. That is well. My bride is the one named Bella Blackthorn. Chapter 23. The Train Station. The din of Bombay's rail yard engulfed the expedition team as they wove through hordes of travellers teeming across the open-air platforms. Black-skinned porters in tattered shirts shouted destinations in musical dialects as they darted through the crowds, bare feet slapping the grime-encrusted stone floors. Fragrant aromas wafted from sizzling food carts tucked into shadowy alcoves as vendors hawked flatbreads, potato and onion fritters, and what looked like meat pies to waiting passengers. Hank soon saw that the expedition was a creature with a very long tail, as a string of servants joined them, carrying bags and wearing turbans and the ever-present dotis or pyjamas, as he'd heard someone call them. When Hank inquired about all the additional members of the group, Primcourt and Ram both glanced back and looked the servants over. Ram gave a slight nod. They'll cook keep our essentials clean and help maintain camp. It is how they do these things in India, Primcourt said with a dismissive thrust of his chin. He continued off through the crowd, bellowing for someone to bring him a drink. Hank had always cooked, cleaned and carried his things himself. It must have been obvious from the way he scratched the hair on his head while holding his hat. He wasn't sure what to make of the idea of it. As the servants streamed by, Ram leaned in close. They need the work, Sahib. Their families are poor. They will starve if they don't work. Hank understood that people needed to eat. What is this word, Sahib, you keep calling me? Why do people keep saying it? Ram replied, It is a polite term like saying Mr. in English or perhaps calling someone Sir. And for a woman we say Mem Sahib. Ah, well, thank you for answering my queries, Sahib, Hank replied, trying out the term. He had to step aside then as an unaware Dr. Frail and Clara almost bowled him over, striding by and gazing around with unconcealed fascination. Doctor, Hank said with a friendly nod, isn't this an amazing place, Mr. Bravo? The man said as he pressed on, his eyes wide behind round wire spectacles as he took in the scenes of controlled chaos unfolding around them. Clara was in his wake, red-faced and apologizing to everyone he absent-mindedly jostled as she struggled to keep pace avoiding the crush of bodies threatening to sweep her away. Sorry, Mr. Bravo, Dr. Frail has forgotten his manners today. Hank grinned. It's quite all right, Miss Clara. Jane almost walked into Hank as well. She seemed to float along entranced, gazing around with the wide-eyed wonder of a child. She saw loincloth-wearing children darting through the forest of legs, their shrill laughter rising above the cacophony. A family of singers sat cross-legged atop woven mats, calloused fingers plucking the strings of sitars and tablas as they warbled out haunting ragas to waiting passengers. "'Have you never ridden the train, Miss Avon?' he asked. She was more aware of herself than frail and gave Hank an apologetic half-grin. "'Once, when I was a child, but I don't recall it, sir. It is quite a lot to take in, yet I must admit I find it exhilarating.' "'It is a sight.' he agreed, but before she could reply, the crowd swept her away, a smile on her face. Bella came next, whispering, Nimrod and I spoke. He told me he holds no grudge against me for his brother. Excellent news, Hank responded. Can I help you with those bags? No, I carry my own things, always have, always will. That's my girl, he almost said, but then clamped his mouth shut. It did not surprise him they thought similarly about it, but Bella wouldn't appreciate him pointing it out. 
We should still keep an eye on O'Toole, Hank said, just as Bella quipped, I still don't trust him. To speak of the devil, Nimrod O'Toole was like Moses parting the Red Sea as he ambled through the crowds, his head and shoulders higher than everyone else. He was a spectacle unto himself, and many of the natives jeered and pointed. Some heckled him. He didn't take it well, his face growing redder by the moment. By the time he reached Hank, he was muttering under his breath, and Hank had the impression of a kettle about to boil over. Mr. O'Toole. Nimrod fiddled with his collar, face pinched. Get me out of this place before someone gets a mouthful of broken teeth. He rolled on like a ship crushing breakers, dividing the crowd both fore and aft. Stay close together, Lieutenant Singh called as he led the group with deft movements, waving his arms like a musical conductor, his scarlet uniform standing out starkly amidst the swirling riot of vibrant saris and white kurta pyjamas. Railroad porters hefted the expedition's lacquered trunks and weathered gear onto the waiting cargo cars behind the iron steam locomotive, jostling good-naturedly to claim the meager handfuls of coins offered for their back-breaking work. The expedition team arrived at the front of the train, gazing up at the gleaming steam locomotive awaiting them on the tracks. The train's polished brass fittings and embellishments reflected the flickering amber light of torches and lanterns, giving the engine an almost animate glow, as if it were a living entity. Billowing steam hissed from its tall smokestack, filling the air with a damp mineral scent. Pistons churned with regular chugs as the engine idled, drips of condensation pattering onto the platform from its undercarriage. Iron wheels taller than a man stood poised for their long journey. Hank's gaze drifted back along a string of elegantly arched windows lining the passenger carriages behind the engine. Embossed metal signs indicated the divisions between the first, second and third class compartments. Uniformed guards and porters waited to help passengers aboard and tend to their needs once underway, and Hank was glad to see there was a platoon of sepoys in one of the carriages to protect the train and the cargo. Hank and Nimrod waited outside with their dozen sepoys until the cars were loaded. There didn't seem to be any trouble. They all clambered aboard as the train whistle blew and the engine puffed out gouts of steam, preparing to move. Although dwarfed by the powerful locomotive, Hank couldn't help but admire the intricate artistry of the train's construction. Gleaming teak woodwork and lacquered panels coupled the carriages together in a serpentine line. Jane excitedly stood up to get a better look out the window, just as the train jolted abruptly into motion, nearly toppling her backwards. But a sturdy hand reached out and gripped her arm, steadying her. She glanced up into the eyes of Lieutenant Singh. His eyes were dark, but held a sparkle of light and a gleam of intelligence. Mind yourself, Miss Avon, he said. Wouldn't want you starting our grand adventure with a twisted ankle now, would we? Cheeks flushed crimson. Jane flinched, yanking her hands away. Don't touch me, she murmured, knowing right away it was a foolish thing to say after he'd prevented her from injuring herself. He yanked his hands back, surprised at her vehemence, then told her gently, This is not our car. He guided her into their private carriage. Lamps flickered to life inside, revealing plush velvet seats and ornately carved teak walls that enclosed them in luxury. He helped her get situated and then moved to the other side of the carriage. She knew she'd been foolish again to snap at the lieutenant, but Harry's death was still strong in her mind, and stronger whenever she looked at one of the natives with them. The memories of those she'd trusted, burning her home, cutting down any who tried to stop them, stung like a fresh wound. Still, she had no cause to be cruel to him or any of the others. In fact, Primcourt had told her that the sepoys joining them were Ram's men, the same Indian soldiers who'd helped to fight off the viciously errant workers on her estate. It would take some time, but she hoped she would reacquire her trust of natives. The train was picking up speed now, and she let the motion of it calm her. Perched on the comfortable benches, the rest of their expedition team did likewise, while the train glided forth toward the unknown, cushioned from the hard landscape breezing past outside. Chapter 24 the Mapmaker's Secret The bustling native bazaar of Bombay assaulted Colonel Werthel's senses as his carriage rattled down the crowded street, followed by a squad of British hussars on horseback. 
nostril-searing spices, animal dung, and the reek of the unwashed masses washed over him. He wrinkled his nose in distaste and placed his golden monocle in his pocket. There was nothing here he wished to see. Bloody heathens and their vulgar market, he grumbled, mopping his glistening brow. At his side, Corporal Shuck gave a derisive snort. Right you are, sir, not a patch on a proper English town. Werthel's other guard, Ernst Meyer, merely glowered at those they passed, his hawkish face set in a permanent scowl. Werthel despised India's summers when sweat soaked his uniform, no matter how he avoided the brutal sun. The only time he enjoyed this place at all was after sundown, when some of the heat relented and he had a stiff drink in his hand. This interminable tropical posting was surely not what Werthel's long years of diligent service should have earned him. Ambitious subordinates with half his tenure had already secured plum assignments, either returned home to prestigious political appointments or choice headquarters positions, their upward paths assured. Yet here Werthel languished, forgotten in this backwater colony, half a world away from the halls of power. A man of his formidable pedigree ought to have secured a prime London post long ago, instead of enduring both the insolence of upstart native sepoys and the daily scorn of the civilian bureaucrats sent to administer these conquered territories. And then there was that damned Singh with his arrogance. A Raja might be a prince in India, but he shouldn't even be a sergeant in the British army. Werthel hated the man's efficiency. Singh didn't understand that these posts were meant to be endured as comfortably as possible. No, no, he kept striving and trying to climb higher, the jumped-up Blackamoor. Werthel wasn't sure what the man was trying to prove. He'd never make captain. So where was his incentive? And what had the general's command been about going right around Werthel to abscond Singh and send him on that task? Damned irregular, with not even a word about the mission to Werthel other than to tell him to butt out of it and not ask questions. And then there was Count Primcourt and his arrogant instructions to call him Mr. Primcourt. Up to no good, Werthel could sense that. But what he needed to know was how could he profit from it. Werthel tapped his nose. Something smells most unpleasant here, men, and I don't mean this reeking piss-pot of a city. As the good book says, there are flies in the ointment. Yes, there are. I can smell them. When the mapmaker's humble shop appeared, Werthel banged his cane impatiently, and the carriage ground to a halt. You're absolutely certain Singh came here, he asked. Shuck gave a yellow-toothed grin. Aye, he did, Lord. Sorry, I mean, sir. Werthel suppressed a smile. Lord, that had a pleasant sound to it. Good show, old Shuck. Let's find out some more about this secret jaunt into the jungle, shall we? Ordering the driver and the cavalryman to stay put, Werthel stepped gingerly from the stuffy carriage interior into the packed dirt street. Almost immediately he recoiled, assaulted by the overpowering stench of dung and urine fermenting in the gutters, trod densely into the sun-baked earth by generations. He fished a scented handkerchief from his breast pocket and pressed it to his nostrils in a futile attempt to blot out the malodorous filth. How perfectly typical that his only lead should reside here in this fetid warren. Nothing worthwhile ever seemed to originate from the native quarters. He supposed it made sense that turncoat Ram Singh would frequent such vulgar enclaves rather than observing proper standards as an officer ought. Shuck and Ernstmeyer led the way across the street and into the open-fronted shop, their bulk a comfort in the throng of sweating bodies. Once inside the dingy stall, Werthel cleared his throat, and the proprietor glanced up from his ledger, sudden worry creasing his brow at these unfamiliar Englishmen befouling his modest storefront. Werthel noted the man wore a sweat-stained kurta and vest, rather than proper attire. Behind the counter, his wife froze in the act of cleaning some heathen brassware figurines, coal-lined eyes wide at the interruption. You recently had a customer, Werthel began angling his walrus-like moustache toward the shopkeeper, an Indian officer, an unusually tall man, a Maratha. The man's face closed like a slammed iron gate. Many customers come, Sahib. Who can say? His lilting accent grated on Werthel's ears. Werthel subtly jerked his chin. At the unspoken signal, Shuck pulled his glinty little street knife from his belt. It was an ugly thing, crude, and tapered to a needle-like point. He twisted it so that flashes of lantern light danced along the blade. He toyed with it, 
then twisted the knife round his fingers, making it dance and spin. The proprietor eyed the blade warily. Ernstmeyer leaned against a teetering shelf, causing brass cups to jitter warningly as he loudly cracked his knuckles. The shopkeeper's throat bobbed while cold beads of sweat gathered on his brow. Werthel leaned forward intently, his own monocle nearly touching the other man's nose. Let me ask again, politely, might you recall the particular man I seek? The proprietor licked his lips anxiously, but kept his lips clamped. Then his wife, her protective instincts overcoming fear, touched his arm and murmured, General Saib, the man you ask about came seeking a map. Werthel almost corrected her title she described to him, but decided he enjoyed being called a general. A map to where, he inquired. Narakund. Narakund, what the devil? He slowly arched one brow. He'd heard talk of such a place. It was the Indian equivalent of the fantastical Avalon, believed to be a place of treasure and supernatural power. Supposedly, a long-dead people had hoarded riches there beyond imagining. Yet. Don't lie to me, woman. Narakund is a child's fairy tale. The man answered, stepping in front of his wife. True, Sahib. A mythical place. Yet there are maps that lead to the location where legend places it. Whatever could they be about, that worm prim court and that upstart sing, maps to mythical places. Then he realized perhaps it was not so mythical after all, or perhaps it was a nom de code, a sort of cover name, as they say, for a treasure hoard. I'll have the same maps you gave him, he told the man. The old man held out empty hands, but Sahib, it was a one of a kind, specially drawn. It will take weeks to reproduce. Werthel sighed. How he hated the difficulty it took to do anything in this horrible place. He tisked at the man. Do you know I have two choices here to convince you to aid me, my good man? I can call on Mr. Ernstmeyer. He's the big lad there behind me, the one who has to bend to get in the door. A pugilist, you know. He killed a man during a bare-knuckled bout in Birmingham. Eh, Ernstmeyer? Porchester, sir. Porchester, yes, killed him with one punch. Three, sir the big man corrected him, holding his hands out in front of him to stretch his arms and crack his neck. Even from here, his fists were almost the same size as the shopkeeper's pin-like head. Ah, yes, three punches, Werthel corrected himself. He pointed at Shuck. Or I can call on Corporal Shuck to get the information from you. See that knife? He's killed a dozen men with it. Shuck nodded his head. A touch more than that, I'd say, the corporal offered. The man cried out, Please, Sahib, I have told you what I know. Have you killed anyone in India with that blade yet, Shuck? Werthel asked. Shuck looked uncomfortable. He gave a non-committal shrug. Werthel was chipper as he said, No answer from Shuck. I think that tells us what we need to know. He whispered to the shopkeeper and his wife. Now, these two men are not the sort of low accounts I'd have in my service back in London. They're the worst kind of criminals. No morals, you see. They'll kill anyone for the right amount of money. A bead of sweat rolled down the shopkeeper's face. They're just downright scum, no offence, gentlemen, he told his two killers. They both nodded. No, you're quite correct, sir, Shuck said. But when a man's dealing with people such as you who lie every time they open their mouth, he reached out and gripped the shopkeeper's face and held his chin in a firm grip. The man's wife whimpered. Then Mr. Ernstmeyer and Corporal Shuck are exactly the right people to have in one's employ, we can make you a map and have it ready by tomorrow. It will show the route, the wife said, her eyes pleading. <laughs> Werthel released the man and wiped his hand on the pyjamas the man wore. Now, you see, a smart woman you have there. She knows how to get things done. Saved your life, she did. The man half collapsed and his wife ran to him. Werthel turned to go. One of my men will pick up the map tomorrow. The shopkeeper nervously nodded. You have my thanks, Werthel said, lips curling with satisfaction. Outside, Corporal Shuck turned excitedly to Werthel as their boots crunched through the rubbish-strewn street. What's a Jarukan? Narakund, Werthel corrected him. Whatever you say, sir, what's there? I've heard tales, but I don't think anyone's certain. Supposed to be a fable. Might be a lie, then, Ernstmeyer asked. Werthel waved dismissively, wiping his face with the handkerchief. The scent of jasmine oil provided only temporary relief from the inescapable stench pervading the mean native quarter. Oh, I think not, Ernstmeyer. These people lack the imagination for elaborate deceit. 
There is something of immense value at this Narakund. I am certain of it. He issued swift orders to his men as they walked. Shuck was to discreetly assemble a platoon of trusted soldiers, hardened to long expeditions, the kind of men who could keep a secret and do what needed done. Ernst Meyer was charged with gathering ample supplies and weaponry for a lengthy sojourn across untamed wilderness. Secrecy is paramount, gentlemen. If we're smart about this and not let tongues waggle, it'll make all our fortunes. I, sir, will keep it quiet as the grave, Shuck replied. Glancing at his pocket watch, Werthel picked up his pace. We leave at first light. He really had to hurry. Commissioner Bartle would be expecting him to arrive at his soiree within the hour, and he despised tardiness. Back in the carriage, Werthel settled onto the velvet upholstery, mopping his neck and face once more with the jasmine-scented handkerchief. Hidden riches here in this hellhole, how deliciously unexpected. Might make his time languishing in this bestial place worthwhile after all. A finer destiny awaited Rutherford Werthel, and the true fruits of this lost temple would be his. No one had more right to claim whatever treasure lay there than he did. As the carriage rolled on towards the future, wheels scattering filth, Schuck and Ernstmeyer exchanged a meaning-laden glance. Their own hazy prospects had sharpened the instant they witnessed their superior's keen interest. These hints at treasures made them hungry for loot. Their faces broke into twin grins of anticipation, Grins that did not reach their cold, appraising eyes. Chapter 25. Aboard the Train The train's rocking and rhythmic clacking had a soothing hypnotic effect, yet the tremor of metal wheels striking joints in the rails would occasionally jolt those lulled into napping. Outside the curtained windows, verdant rice fields lined with palms and small villages, soon replaced the bustling edges of the city. Occasionally they saw wildlife, with Dr. Frail usually the first to spy them. They saw herds of spotted deer, antelope and bright jungle fowl scattered across the lush landscapes, then went through a patch of wetlands and saw several muddy paddocks filled with massive water buffalo. Hank remained poised in the rear, ready to react to the slightest sign of intrusion. Those shadow-spawned assassins had rattled him, and he placed himself near the door of the compartment. On the other side of the door, a pair of sepoys guarding the entrance to the car as well, though their enemies did not seem to need doors or windows to come at them, only shadows. Hank had taken a heavy dose of the elixir, not wanting to turn while on the train, and it had completely dulled his wolf senses. He found this numbed existence with only limited human senses most unsatisfying. What did that mean, though? Would he prefer to retain this wolf persona? Or was the cure still his main objective? But that was a question for another time. He did know he'd come to depend on the enhanced hearing and the acute ability to interpret sense that informed him of the world. Now when the elixir worked, he lost them. He wasn't certain what he'd do about that predicament. He realized suddenly that he would have the choice every day to take the elixir and move about in this dulled state as oblivious as every other human, or to not take it and risk losing control. For today, anyway, it was a straightforward choice. As long as he was on the train, he would not risk changing into a werewolf. He settled back, aware that Radu was alert and would keep watch for the next few hours. Next to him, Jane stretched out on the plush bench, watching palm fronds dance across the purpling skies until her eyes grew heavy. Lulled by the train's rhythmic clacking along the tracks, she soon slipped into peaceful slumber, her dreams brimming with the wonders awaiting them in this exotic realm. They stopped many times, frequently at almost empty platforms to disgorge passengers or take some on. There was also baggage and cargo loaded at other stops. They crawled along the tracks, and the stops ate up a good deal of the day. Finally the sun sank below the horizon, steeping their carriage in shadow, Ram announced, after conversing with the conductor, that they would reach the remote village of Nagpur just before dawn, the day after tomorrow, if all went smoothly. Later some ate while others continued to doze, caught in that restful laziness of a long journey. While delicately eating a piece of chicken, Jane said, So far, this is an onerous safari. I'm not sure I'll survive. She received amused chuckles from the group at this quip. Ram, however, 
uncapped a bamboo case and spread the map inside out over an empty seat. He traced their route for her, the trains to the boat, to the elephants, and from there, on foot. That looks like quite a journey. How long will it take, as she asked him. He did some quick calculations. A month if the rains stay away, much longer if they don't. She knew of the great rains, of course, monsoon season, when every day was a torrential downpour from dawn to dusk, every night more and more of it. Father had built their estate on a rise to avoid the waters. Would be early for the monsoon, she said. He nodded. I agree. Jane again studied this dark, quiet stranger. Something about his steady confidence irritated her. Why aren't you fighting with your people? I assume many of the Marathas have joined the rebellion? I'm an officer in Her Majesty's army. I gave an oath to serve and obey. This is India. People break oaths every day. Not my people, he said with an arrogant tilt to his chin. That stung her and brought up her defences. After all, he was insinuating only the English broke their word. She said with bite, Oh, yes, and how about the men who swore to serve my family, the same ones who murdered my brother? What of them? Did they keep their oaths? Ram's eyes widened ever so slightly, then returned to their normal hard-as-coal gaze. Jane turned away from him and stretched out on some cushions. She wasn't sure why what he'd said hurt so much or why she'd reacted with such quick anger. What is all the unrest about, anyway? Nimrod asked, either oblivious to the tense words shared from Jane to Ram, or uncaring. Ram tried to explain, there is a new rifle, the Enfield Pattern 1853. They grease the cartridges in pig and cow fat. It is taboo for many in India to touch the cartridges, let alone bite the end off one to get to the powder and ball. Jane knew the issue with the greases cartridges was only one of many. Explaining it all was impossible. There were a thousand reasons for the growing unrest. Ram agreed, apparently, because his next words were, there is not just one problem. The discontent with the natives has been building for a long time. Jane tried to block the voices out and focus on the regular click-clack of the train wheels. She didn't want to think about rebellion or about Ram Singh. Hours into night's embrace, their train ground to a halt with a shrill squeal of brakes at a ramshackle depot. Dim lantern light filtered through the windows as labourers scurried to refuel the ravenous steam engine, shoveling loads of coal into its bowels. Jane wiped the sleep from her eyes and glanced around. The masked and hooded Radu was awake, watching out the window. Don't worry, Miss Avon. They are just unloading some cargo and adding some big boxes of black rock. He'd never turned to look at her, and she found it a bit unsettling. Coal, she told him. It's coal they are loading. It's how the train moves forward. He turned now, and with the lamps low, his hood gave him a fearsome aspect, but his voice was almost childlike and filled with a sense of innocent wonder. We must be about at the end of the creations of men like Dr. Frail, who use science to build machines such as this. There can't be anything else to invent, can there? he asked. She smiled. I suppose you might be right. At the front of the carriage, Dr. Frail hunched beneath a wavering lamp, fidgeting with a stubborn firing mechanism for one of his gadgets, a multi-barreled repeating gun. He hoped they'd have no need of such devices, but he'd studied the news reports with great focus, and he concluded that there was going to be trouble en route, either from brigands, rebels, or those shadowy snake cultist people. He doubted the expedition could avoid it. His decision to ship an arsenal of weaponry here from England had proven the correct one. But would his inventions be enough? He could only pray his creations and his academic knowledge would prove sufficient for the dangerous trials surely awaiting them. He refused to fail. Clara, sitting near, reached out and patted his hand with affection, without looking up from her book, a primer on native languages. That settled him, and he turned in to get some rest. As the darkened landscape raced past, their band of adventurers slumbered on beneath the waning crescent moon, drawing ever closer to their first stop. Chapter 26. The Bandit Camp The Phantom watched the bandit camp from a nearby hill. They'd cleared out several more acres of land since the last time he'd been here, and there were clumps of disorderly tents, mismatched and thrown up without any pattern, filling the entire space. The bandit group's numbers were swelling, the unrest in the countryside bringing many to the cause. 
Soon, a platoon of armed men disgorged from the camp, a motley crew for certain, and climbed the hill toward him. At their lead was Thako Thapa, an energetic aging man with a potbelly, lavish robes and ruby earrings. He halted his procession on a flat spur of land below them and climbed the rest of the way himself. It would not do for his followers to see him conversing with one such as the Night Shadow. They were rough men, the bandits, but few of them would have consorted with demons or monsters. Taking one last look to make sure his men did not follow him, Thapa entered the clearing and whispered, I am here. The phantom could have appeared wherever he chose, behind the man if he wished. Instead, he simply faded into one of the bush-shrouded shadows as if he'd been hiding there all along. Thapa swallowed hard at the sight of him. The phantom gestured and two other men crawled out from their hiding spots. Thapa reacted with a hiss. Thuggies and snake cultists. He was right. One of the hidden men was a priest of Kali, whose skin was the ebony of fire coals. He wore untreated animal skins about his waist and left his chest, which was ritually scarred in bizarre, unsettling patterns bare. The other man was the leader of the snake cultists, who the phantom had last seen at the Avon estate Viparita Nagesh. Why do you bring my enemies so close? Thapa asked. The snake cult leader laughed mirthlessly. You're the one with the army at your back, fool. Thapa glanced at his guards waiting below while biting his lip. Of course, he didn't dare call his followers, not with the phantom here. You three will help me with a task, the phantom told them. But tomorrow I go north, master, the bandit leader pronounced. No, tomorrow you will find a certain party of Anglos and bring them to me. Thapa's lip quivered. But I have orders from the rebel leaders themselves. I'm to join the others in a march to Delhi. There, we will break the armies of the Anglos. The phantom said no more. He simply watched the bandit leader. Thapa was at first determined, but after a few haggard breaths, he quailed. But I must go. The Raja of Nagpur himself has recognized me, legitimized me, he pleaded. The thuggy let out a guffaw that was half laugh and half snarl. Let me find these Anglos. The followers of Kali will perform this task. The snake cult leader reacted with his own derisive snort. Neither of you will find them. It will be my serpents. I have already found them twice. The phantom put up his hand for silence. I can't help you. I must go to Delhi, Thapa said. Do as you will, but first give me the name of your second in command, the phantom ordered. At this, Thapa's face turned a pale shade. I... I will go after these Anglos. The phantom looked at each of them until each man had cringed backwards. It was very difficult to gaze into the shadowy black hood and to stare at those crimson eyes for long without a prick of fear touching every part of the skin. It was one of the gifts the Demon King gave him. The phantom spoke in a whisper and let the shadow voices echo his words. I would remind all of you of certain promises you've made. I would bring to your mind certain pacts, sworn over the spilled blood of innocence. You are bound to our master with cords that are strong as iron, and much less malleable. Of course I know that, Thapa snapped. Sweat stood out on his brow. The other two nodded, though the thuggy licked his dry lips. Do you? Very well. Then let me tell you of the ones you seek. The phantom did so, while the men listened intently. Thapa took notes in a small leather book. The man was odious but competent, or at least competent enough to act as the phantom's eyes and ears for now. Being in the human world was painful, and he could only be here for short periods of time. Already the longing to be back in the realm of his lord was causing an ache in his bones. What reward for the one who brings you the head of the doctor and the living women? Thapa asked. He was always looking for profit. The phantom gestured and a pot of gold and gems of all sorts shimmered in the air. Of the three men, two of them looked on the treasure with greedy eyes. The thuggy spoke with derision for the others and for the loot. I care little for such things. What do you desire? the phantom asked. If I complete this task, I want to be restored to my rightful place as a follower of the Demon King. I want the altars of Kali to rise again. The snake cultist reached for the poisoned dagger at his side. The thuggy, noticing this, stepped back and went for his own curved blade. The phantom groaned loud enough both men jumped, and Thapa let out a whimper. You will cease your bickering. Once you've found my quarry, I care little for what you do, but until then you will aid each other. 
The two men put up their weapons between one nervous heartbeat and the next, still scowling at one another. The phantom suppressed a smile. It suited him to have those who served him vying for better positions under the Demon King. It made them hungry, and the hungry tiger was the most dangerous one. Yes, the Demon King will grant his highest favor on whichever of you brings the women and the heads of the others to me, the snake cultist protested. But wise Night Shadow, my loyal serpents hold that position. And your snake warriors have failed me twice. This will be your last opportunity to prove your worth. The phantom waved his arm once more, this time opening a magic channel, the ball crackling and black and suspended, hidden behind him. The energy from it was strong enough that he could easily reach out and find the three he wanted. Images appeared, shimmering. One was a wife, another a son, a third a favoured acolyte. They all hung in the air, so lifelike that they might have been present in this hidden glade, except for the eyes, which were dead and blue. Each man in his turn reacted differently. Thuppa grasped his robes tightly about him and peered with wide eyes at his son. The snake cultist saw his wife, who he'd thought he'd hidden well, and gasped, slapping one hand to his cheek and gritting his teeth. The thuggy saw his favoured acolyte, the one who'd replace him and who he'd spent decades grooming and preparing, and he grew furious. What is this? he asked the phantom. A threat? Yes, the phantom replied. I will know if you do not work diligently to accomplish this task. Let this be an understanding between us. The one who succeeds will keep his beloved. The other two will lose theirs. The three men were united in their shocked reactions. Thapa cried, It isn't just! Then slapped his hand over his mouth and glanced down the hill, hoping none of his men had heard him. The phantom's voice rasped the way a blade sounds when dragged across stone. Best you each work, as if your beloved's life depends on how well you accomplish this task, because it does. Thapa left first, rejoining his guards below. The procession returned to the main camp at a run, where they rejoined the rest of the bandits and their bellowing leaders. The snake cultist left by the shadows, as was his gift for being favoured of the demon king. This would allow him to speed quickly back to his secret chambers and command his followers. The thuggy was at a disadvantage, as his mountain hideout was not close. As a kindness, the phantom gestured and one of the shadows in the trees bent and shifted. What had been a vaguely triangular-shaped patch of darkness disgorged one of the phantom's sly shade wraiths. The creature was humanoid, though only possessed of the vaguest features, as if his mouth and nose had been smoothed away, his body semi-transparent, like a pool of black-shaded water. The blood shadow wrapped the folds of its cloak round the thuggy who, despite his grim look, gritted his teeth in fear before the blood shadow sucked them both up into the shadows. It would take the leader to his hideout. With the three gone, the night shadow, the phantom, enjoyed the air. It was true he could not be here long, but he recalled he liked the heat in it. It was always so frigid in the domain of the demon king. He missed the sun-kissed wind and the golden rays of light. He touched the air. The wind was warm. There was death in it, a premonition of things to come, he was sure. That scent was almost enough to overpower everything else, but the phantom caught another sensation, a familiar scent, one that was almost like his own. Ram, his brother. What was he to do about that? Could he kill him? Would it mean no more to him than killing the others? Chapter 27 The Magical Tome Jane slept, trapped in a nightmarish repeat of the attack on her estate. The three men, Deepak and his pair of hangers-on, were coming for her, for mother, for Mira, but this time the pistol wouldn't fire. She yanked on the trigger over and over, to no effect, and Mr. Bravo wasn't there to save her in this version of events. She kept waiting, but he never arrived. Neither did the sepoys or the carriage. Around her, people she trusted burned everything with torches. Dead people she knew, such as her brother and her father, burned the house. But it was not only the dead. When she ran to her horse to get away, her mother was waiting there to set the poor mare alight with a torch. Jane fled to the gate, but it was a wall of flame, so hot on her face she had to turn back. The fields were on fire, great clots of black smoke rolling across her path and Deepak was racing towards her. 
his feet clomping, his gait stilted and bizarre as a rag doll dragged along the ground by a child's hand, his scythe raised, his eyes as they were in death. Then the people transformed into shadow versions of themselves, chasing her with arms that lengthened along the ground, reaching, grasping for her. Heir of Merlin, called a voice as dry as the husk of a sun-withered roach. When she awoke, she sat up and rubbed her eyes. The train rocked gently from side to side. Though it was muggy in the car, someone had opened the windows and a fresh breeze poured in. She yawned, anxious because of the dream but glad to be out of it. She'd been unable to stop Deepak both in the nightmare and in real life. If all three men had stayed to attack, she'd be dead, as would Mother and Mira. She hardly noticed Dr. Frail arrive hovering near her. My apologies for the intrusion, he whispered. There is a delicate matter I'd like to discuss, if you are willing. Jane, still caught in the throes of an abrupt awakening, nodded mechanically for him to sit, and he took the bench forward of her. He met her gaze, the dimmed lanterns playing across the mop of errant hair on top of his head, making him look something like a bush that wore spectacles. I want to talk to you about sorcery, he said, without a hint of hesitation. This was a man who was very sure of his conclusions. Jane sat very still. She'd been told about this hullabaloo before they left Bombay. Very well, she replied, her tone on the crisp side. If you really must, she said, her tone dismissive as she resisted the urge to roll her eyes. Her mother would have been shocked at such rude behaviour, but Jane had difficulty accepting these incredible claims. Magic and wizards belonged in fairy tales, yet she'd agreed to join this motley crew on their journey into the hinterlands based only on these ramblings, which may hint at her own bit of madness. And she'd seen a man appear right out of a shadowy alcove back at the Regency. He'd not been there one second, then a patch of darkness had twisted, a stream of it falling like liquid to the ground, where it formed into a figure that blinked and stuttered a few times. And just like that, one of those assassins had been standing there, real and deadly. How had that happened? What did it mean? Since seeing that apparition become flesh, she'd done a good deal of soul-searching, and she'd concluded that she would be cautiously open to these ideas the seemingly serious people around her were throwing about. If this so-called doctor was ready now to provide proof of these claims, she should take the time to listen to him argue his case. Frail retrieved a weathered leather book from his pack and presented it to her reverently, like a sacred artifact in a chapel. This tome came into my possession while researching arcane texts at the British Museum. It contains profound secrets, rituals capable of unleashing primordial powers. Primordial powers, yes, of course. How splendid she replied dryly. Jane looked askance at the strange symbols etched into the cover, warily taking the book's weight in her hands. The cracked binding creaked as she opened it, the uneven pages covered in spidery text and nonsensical sketches. Where did this book come from? I mean, before the British Museum, of course, she asked. Can you read the contents? Its origins are obscure. A long-vanished sect of monks wrote it, though few historians know much about them he admitted. The archaic language has proven difficult to fully decipher, but passages discuss focusing one's will to control forces of mystic power. She flipped through several pages, filled with blathering foolishness. At first, she was convinced her initial judgment of the book was correct. It appeared to be the scrawling of a series of madmen. The words were dense, written in many languages in handwriting that differed, jumping from tidy and controlled to childlike scratches at random. She came to one page that she took for some exotic script, but then realized the letters were the normal Roman alphabet, squeezed into a circular scroll, the calligraphy obtuse. She tried to read a sentence, turning the book as she sounded out the letters, gibberish for certain, but then the page of the book under her finger turned cold. She recalled how once at a party, her neighbors, the Alistairs, had served ice for the drinks. It was the only time in her life she'd touched something so frigid it stuck to her fingers. Cold, she whispered. Sorry? Frail asked, leaning in closer. She tapped the page that had gone frigid. Touch this paper, doctor. He did so. It's cold. His eyes widened. Freezing! She frowned. Was this some kind of trick? If it was, it was cleverly done. She yawned. She'd become ever so tired all at once. 
By gosh, you've done it, Jane. As I said, magic. Frail stood up, clapping his hands. But any elation Jane might have experienced at this odd happening never had a chance to surface because a deep, powerful weariness settled on her. She tried to keep her eyes open but could not. She fell. Miss Avon, Frail yelled out. Strong hands picked her up. Whatever have you done, Doctor? Lieutenant Singh's voice. I... we... we were just looking at a book, Frail replied. She's fainted, Mr. Bravo's words. No. Hmm. Fine, she tried to say. Her words slurred. Want rest now, she told them. Make some room, give her room to breathe. Sir Radu's voice came from far away. Someone bring some water, perhaps she has a thirst, the lieutenant said. Not thirsty, tired, she told them. She's the first heat casualty, but she won't be the last, Primcourt told them all. And that was funny, because she wasn't warm at all. The book had been cold, not hot, and the train had a pleasant breeze. These foreigners didn't know hot yet, though they'd soon see, she thought. Hans tried to lift her head. Drink this. No, I'm tired. Let me sleep, she told them, opening her leaden-weighted eyes. She found the others gathered round her with concern etched into their faces. Are you all right, Miss Avon? Mr. Bravo asked. Of course, I'm embarrassed at the attention, is all, she replied. Clara took over her care, rolling up her sleeves and shooing everyone else away. As Frail left, Jane got a good look at that book. It truly was a magic tome. It must be. She slept for a time, no doubt a long time since she missed the heat of the next day, and when she awoke, most of the others were once again sleeping. Chapter 28 Guru Dev The train eased to a halt with a piercing whistle, rousing the expedition team from fitful slumber. Outside their windows, they could discern only an impenetrable wall of mist and a black wall of vegetation. They stepped out into ink-like darkness, the air heavy and moist against their skin. Vines curled across weathered signs and overgrown tracks, nature slowly reclaiming this rarely used station. The jungle's muted symphony accosted their senses, chirping crickets, the shuddering roar of some great cat, and a pack of anguished jackals howling at the moon, their mournful calls raising the hairs on the back of Jane's neck. What was that growling bark? Clara asked, watching the bush round them with keen eyes. A leopard, both Jane and Ram said at the same time. They exchanged a quick grin before Jane looked away from him with a grimace. Then Ram struck a match and lit a lantern which cast flickering amber light across the team's uneasy faces. As the train porters unloaded their goods, they waited in the tired silence of those unaccustomed to being awakened in the dead of night. We go on foot from here to visit my uncle, and then tomorrow we will resume our journey by train, Ram said. Nimrod, Radu, you and the sepoys will stay here and guard our luggage, Primcourt ordered. Jane thought perhaps the big man or the knight would bristle at Primcourt's tone, but Radu plopped himself down on a bench after he checked with Hank and received a nod, and Nimrod simply gave a lazy salute and settled on one of the trunks. They moved in tense silence down a serpentine path, nearly swallowed by lush vegetation. As they strode into the darkness, Jane pressed close to the others, eyes straining to penetrate the hovering gloom. Each quivering leaf and skittering creature conjured imagined threats. But not all was a trick of the mind and her anxieties. She clapped a hand to her mouth when a massive python slithered across their trail, scales glinting in the quavering lantern light as it disappeared into the brush. Oh my, Frail whispered. He drew his bony arms and legs tight to his side, as if that might protect him from the slithering creature. Ram said with confidence, Pythons are dangerous, but they rarely attack humans. There are some lethal snakes here, however, so please watch your step. Some of them even spit venom a good distance if provoked. If you find a serpent, please tell me or one of my men and we'll take care of it for you. They trekked deeper into the raven-black night, the jungle awoke as they passed, chattering monkeys, chittering birds erupting in song, the rhythmic pulsing of insects. Those signs of human habitation lay all around them as well. For most of them, these were their first moments in the more natural parts of India, and the proximity of the wildness of it touched a primal chord that enlivened some of their party, while frightening others. 
In the moonlight they came out onto a raised irrigation canal path and could just make out below them orderly rows of farms, fields filled with lush green crops. After twenty minutes of hiking along this berm, Ram veered off once again into the trees, leading them through a winding ravine and along the outskirts of a sparsely populated native village before stopping abruptly before an ancient grove of trees. Following his gaze, they beheld a thatched hut nestled between two towering banyans. Wind chimes fashioned from hollow gourds and seashells hung from its eaves, producing a haunting melody as they swayed gently. Jane noticed the others staring in awe at the incredible banyans. She'd seen so many of them she'd forgotten how amazing the massive trees were. Now, she took a moment to really look. The trees on either side of the hut were like natural cathedrals, their expansive canopies of leaves creating a sheltered space beneath. Emerging from the gnarled and knotted trunks were tangled masses of aerial roots dropping from the branches above before snaking into the earth below. Over centuries, these rope-like roots had fused together to create sturdy pillar-like structures. The hut sat nestled between two such pillars, and at once every member of their expedition experienced a sense of ease settle upon them, a calm as if they'd entered a sanctuary. Throughout India, Jane said, banyan trees often serve as gathering sites and places of rest because of the ample shade their canopies provide. She ran her hand along one of the twisted aerial roots, imagining all the travellers who had sat beneath this very tree seeking respite over the ages. She caught Ram studying her. He nodded once in approval of her summary, then turned his attentions to the hut. The small structure radiated a profound stillness, as if sound itself hesitated to intrude upon its tranquillity. The abode of Guru Dev and Moss the Mystic, Ram whispered reverently to their questioning looks. He called out a soft greeting, his voice seeming to scatter the veil of silence blanketing this place. They held a collective breath, staring at the beaded curtain obscuring the hut's doorway. The curtain rustled, and an elderly man with a long, wispy beard peered out, blinking owlishly. His saffron robes were faded from long use. Leaning on a gnarled staff, he stepped cautiously out of his abode. Who comes to my home in the middle of the night? He studied the strangers before him until his eyes fell on one he knew. Ram? Disbelief and joy suffused his gravelly voice. You've come home? Ram bowed respectfully. For a short time, Guru, I've returned with travellers seeking your wisdom. The Guru's gaze turned curious as it passed over the rest of the group, and his eyes widened as he took in each one. Come, he muttered after a moment of hesitation, we will take tea. They crowded into the Spartan hut, making themselves comfortable on woven mats. Soon servants passed around steaming mugs of chai, the aroma mingling cardamom and ginger with the earthy scent of the clay walls. Tell me what brings you here, child, Guru Dev said, eyes twinkling with joy as he clasped Ram's hand fondly. Ram told him of their train journey from Bombay and of their ultimate destination. At the mention of where they travelled, the old man's expression darkened, his mirth fading. Narakund, you say. The mountain temple. Ram nodded. May the heavens protect you, the guru said in halting English. Ram explained their mission but kept it simple, to find an artifact rumoured to be hidden within. He told of ancient texts pointing to the temple ruins. The only item worthy of such risk would be the Chaya Talwar, Gurudev said. Ram shared a look with Primcourt. Frail, however, showed the wise man a sketch of an ancient inscription. Can you tell us more about this dark guardian, the so-named Demon King? The Guru sighed heavily, taking a long draught of tea before responding. It is a sad tale, that of Ruksha of the Golden Palace, a millennium ago a wise prince, who they say was a man of uncommon integrity, inherited the guardianship of an enchanted sword called the Sunblade. But Ruksha was not as he seemed. He had fallen from grace, becoming a slave to his greed and ambition. He was so twisted that his evil pacts and rites turned him into a Bhuta, a vampire in your tongue, not the bite of another already cursed. I was unaware a person could be inflicted with the condition in such a fashion, Frail observed. The old man nodded, shaking a bony finger at his guests. He delved deep into the pits of black magic, to a place where no light may reach. And in time, the Sunblade became the Chaya Talwar, a thing of shadow and evil that mirrored that of its master. 
And then what became of him? Bella asked. Many centuries ago, a gathering of wise sages, their ways unknown in these crude and ignorant times, saw his evil growing. They captured the demon king and banished him to a land of darkness, where the very air is poison. For ages he has lain trapped there, his sword deprived of its power, impotent and enraged at his imprisonment. It is said, though, that his bindings weaken and that the shadow blade grows powerful once again. Yes, I have determined the same outcome, Frail said, pushing his spectacles up onto the bridge of his nose. He also has followers here, those who work in darkness seeking power, the guru explained, sitting back against a cushion and waving his hand for more tea, which a servant brought on a tray with honey. These followers, Bella interjected, we've encountered them already. Who are they exactly? You are fortunate to have survived, Guru Dev murmured. They possess weapons laced with poisons to rot flesh and the power to transport themselves through shadows. Guru Dev turned to Jane, noticing her pale skin and traveling clothes while he stirred honey into his steaming glass. You are the Jaduga on this journey? he asked. Though she was proficient in Hindustani languages, the word meant nothing to her. He wants to know if you are our wizard, Ram explained. Surprised, Jane blurted out, Wizard, heavens no! The guru waved his hand and sighed, rising with the aid of his staff. Apologies, daughter. I thought I sensed the gift in you. All is cloudy as of late, and my eyes are not as clear as they once were. Suddenly an old woman bustled into the room. She strode towards Ram and embraced him, then tugged at his cheek and poked at his stomach. You're skinny as a marsh reed, boy. When will you eat? Ram fended her off. I eat like a tiger, and before you ask your next question, no, I'm not betrothed. Of course not. You'd bring such a woman here so I might inspect her before you would dare marry. Of course you are right, Moss, Ram said, taking her hand. But you shouldn't have risen from bed. You need your rest. The woman tutted away his concerns, taking in all those in the hut. Her eyes rested on the women with them. You three will come with me to the women's home. But we must go, Moss, the lieutenant protested. She pointed at the cushions and tray of tea. Your train won't be here for an entire day. Sit, rest, eat. Guru Dev will care for you. Ram turned pleadingly to Guru Dev, who was wise enough to put his hands up in surrender. Even Primcourt seemed overwhelmed by this woman's powerful mannerisms. We have time, he simply said. Chapter 29 Wise Woman Moss The women's house, constructed of powder-blue painted stone, was a better furnished accommodation than the primitive hut where Guru Dev lived. In the courtyard, a small fountain of clear, cold water ran. The woman, who told them to call her Moss, ordered them to wash their necks, face, hands and feet in the stone basin before they moved into the house itself. Jane, refreshed and renewed by the cleaning, entered the comfortably furnished dwelling in a buoyed mood. Cushions lay about the floor along with reed mats, while sweet-smelling incense and fresh flowers and plants brought a delicate, relaxing fragrance to the room. Moss set the women in a circle, and looked at each one long enough they grew uncomfortable. Each visitor found the silence unsettling in her own way. Bella was ready to confront the old woman, Clara to make some excuse and leave, and Jane to make one of her sly remarks about not being able to discern thoughts if the woman was trying to communicate in that method. Finally, Moss quipped, Why have you let the men come on this journey? This broke the tension and they shared a laugh. I keep asking myself the same question. Bella replied with a smile. The older woman turned first to Clara. You are worried, dear one, about the doctor, are you not? Clara looked away, her cheeks colouring. Jane thought it the curse of the fair, that blush. She had the same issue herself. Moss said, Watch over him. He is like a child and will need a firm guiding hand. Clara nodded her head. You are also worried about your heart, but you should not. To this Clara reacted with a twinge. I... I'm not worried. Then that is good, Moss replied. The woman turned to Bella next, studying her with such rapt attention as if reading a book that Jane felt quite nervous. She didn't want to turn under the penetrating gaze of those strong brown eyes. Don't share my secrets, Bella said, putting her hands up. The woman cleared her throat. You will have choices on this journey between light and dark, between love and comfort. 
I will ask the Divine to guide you. Relieved that the mystic said nothing more concerning her, Bella breathed out. You two may go out onto the veranda, where you will find refreshment and a place to rest, the old woman ordered Clara and Bella, her gaze then coming to rest on Jane. The other two women stood, but Bella lingered a moment, looking a question at Jane. Jane smiled, the gesture flimsy. It was time to be brave. I'll be fine, she told the pistol-toting woman. Bella nodded and left with Clara. Alone, Jane's nerves were tight as stretched rope. Moss took her hands and clasped them. Why are you on this journey? Jane had been expecting the woman to reveal some secrets about her, had been ready to hear them, but she wasn't ready for this question. She thought about it. I'm not certain. That is a fine and proper answer. You are young. You don't always have to know why you're doing something yet. When you get as old as I am, it will matter more, as it takes one so much longer to turn back around if they go in the wrong direction, she said with a smile. Jane laughed. Tears welled up in her eyes. She couldn't have said why. I'm so very sorry for what happened to you, the woman told her, and patted her hand. Jane talked about the attack. It lasted a while, and at the end the woman was holding her, comforting her as a mother might a child, cooing. Jane realized suddenly what a silly nit she must seem and sat up. Forgive my sobbing like a babe. Moss was kind. You needed that, dear one. Do not ask for forgiveness for feeling the way you should. But I barely know you. I shouldn't be just blabbering on weeping. I should show some backbone. The woman tisked. Save your strength for the road ahead, for now you needed to release some of your sorrow. Jane felt much better. Such an uplifting thing a good cry could be, apparently. Now let us speak about your magic. I'm not sure. I mean to say magic. Moss put her hand out, palm up, and a small glowing ball of light formed. Goosebumps rose on Jane's arms. The ball spun slowly, glistening like a soap bubble, but with tiny crackles of lightning inside. Moss whispered, There are few of us who have the gift, and someday you'll be able to recognize those who do, just like I recognize the gift in you. That is so, so unbelievable, Jane cried. So amazing. She wanted to deny it, but there it was, right in front of her. How could she say it wasn't there? This ball is a channel, we like to say, such as a channel in a river that a boat might choose to enter. Soon you will open channels yourself as you require. We can work magic without one of these channels, but having one is an aid to casting spells. Jane reached out to touch the light, but the woman shook her head. Be careful touching someone else's channel. It will give them power over you. Jane snatched her hand back. Now let us say that there is a river with three branches, each leading to a different location. If a boat takes one of these, it can only go to that destination. The boat cannot be on two channels at one time. I'm not sure I understand, Jane admitted, which is quite understandable, dear one. You must remember because our time is short and these things will be very important to you in the coming months and for the rest of your life. I'm most grateful, Moss. Please continue. There is a boat on a channel. Yes, and this boat is your magic. One of these channels contains all the magic it needs to accomplish a magical act. You don't need to expend any more energy to work your spells once you create one of these. Jane nodded, though without really understanding. Moss continued. Once your magic starts down a single channel, it stays there. Think of that as a spell. You can use your single channel to cast a single spell. And if I want to cast a different spell? Yes, a fine question, the older woman nodded in approval. Another way to contemplate this power is to think of it like a thread. With that thread, you can do one thing, release magical energy to accomplish a single task, to weave a single garment, for instance. And then it can be used to do something different, Jane asked. Correct, but only once you complete that first task. I see. What if I want to do two things at once? Moss smiled, then clenched her jaw and a second ball of light formed. This one popped and shimmered and seemed less stable than the first. However, the first ball also began to shake and take on the same state of insecurity as the second one. A very proficient user of heavenly power can do such a thing, but it is incredibly difficult. She released her breath, and the second ball snapped out of existence, whilst the first regained its luster and calm rotation. Might I try? 
Certainly, but I do not believe you will yet be able to conjure your own channel. You must first learn to control your mind. I assure you, I'm quite in control of my faculties. Jane smoothed her shirt with her hands and didn't look the woman in the eyes. Meditation, Moss said. It is how one strengthens the mind, how one achieves clarity. Jane knew of this mystical practice. She had seen the Brahmins and the spiritualist Hindus chant and perform various rites and sit for long spells with their legs folded or crossed, yet she understood it in only the most perfunctory way. The older woman crossed her legs and sat up straight. Meditation is the art of inner focus, thought control. It is a method to convene with the divine. Meditation, Jane repeated. Moss took a few deep breaths. Yes. Your own Western monks have a similar practice, though I believe here in India we've perfected it. Jane wanted to say something about a lack of humility, but she wisely kept her mouth shut. The old woman seemed to know Jane's mind, however, because she declared, It is a good thing for you we Indians are the best at such matters. That way you can become the best as well. Without being told, Jane mirrored the actions of the other woman as she settled into a relaxed posture. Breath is life, Moss said. Again a snide quip came to her lips about how she'd be dead without it, but she did not speak. Moss's voice grew so soft Jane had to strain to hear it. All systems of this world work in cycles, slowly turning wheels, driven by and creating energy. We all take part in these cycles. We benefit from them as well as contribute. Jane sensed a profound honesty in these words, visualizing the things of the earth existing together in an eternal round. It is our duty to contribute more than we consume, to give more than receive, to do more than exist, to steal the air, suck up the water, and digest the bounty of the earth. A recollection of her life played before her eyes. How often had she given more than she'd taken? Every action results in a reaction, Moss said, seeming to read her mind. The natural things of this earth are worth protecting. Spending the energy of the slowly turning, inexorable wheels to preserve life is a valuable investment. Moss gently tapped Jane's hands, startling the young woman, who was so engrossed in the words she'd lost some sense of the world around her. This is why we work magic, dear. This is the purpose of all things good in this world, to protect and preserve life, from the berry that gives sustenance to the tiger who culls the herd. Potent emotions she could not trace back to a source surged through her breast and into her mind. Her eyes brimmed with tears again. I'm so emotionally overcome. I apologize, she told Moss. The older woman tutted at her. You are beginning your journey of understanding. You have taken your first step on the road to enlightenment. Why would you apologize for realizing your sense of duty for the world around you? You're right. That is what I sense, Jane admitted, wonder filling her. The plants in pots all around them took on new meaning. The birds squawking outside. Each was precious. There is a natural order to the world, Prithvi, the living earth as we call it. You will come to know its rightness, and when events or objects stand outside this balance, you will realize it, and it will cause you pain. Outside the balance? Jane did not understand. There are things that are not of the natural order, evil creatures, monsters. Jane opened her mouth to dispute this bizarre claim but then she recalled Mr. Bravo claiming to be a monster hunter. She remembered the cultist assassin pouring out of the shadows like a stream of black tar. She'd promised herself she would try to consider the things outside of her understanding, and in that vein she decided there might be such a thing as monsters, and that if there truly were, they must be contrary to the natural order as well. Moss tapped Jane's wrist with each word, Butas, which your people call vampires, the Pret and the Amr, Yukshas, who are men that are part wolf or transform into other creatures, dark Rakshusas and other workers of evil. Jane had to puzzle out all the terms. She knew the terms Pret and Amr were akin to ghosts, or maybe ghouls, and Yukshas were shapeshifters. In many local stories, those who transformed into beasts did so to steal, trick or harm people. Rakshusas, she supposed, might refer to evil sorcery or witchcraft. The old woman continued, There are many evil things which should not be on this earth. 
It is our duty to destroy these demons. Jane had a tough time not sighing with derision at these words. Yet she kept to her promise, listen. Attempt to accept there are things beyond her belief that might be real. Even though Moss was talking about things come out of fairy tales, next she might even mention fairies, goblins and the troll living under the bridge. Are there no exceptions, no creatures of this type who are beneficial, for example? Jane inquired, mostly to be polite, still not believing a word of it. Moss shook her head and cut the air with her hand emphatically. None. And if I learn of such a creature, what do I do? You destroy it. Chapter 30. Vision of a Massacre. A sparkling red comet with a tail like a tapered sword blade crossed the sky, leaving drifting particles in its wake. Hank, who'd come outside to watch the night turn into day and to take in some air, held a neglected cup of fiery arrack, completely absorbed by the rare heavenly vision above him. Hank was restless, thinking about the road ahead and ready to get on with it, and apparently he was not the only one. Somewhere off in the trees, drums beat, and a reedy wind-driven horn called. He'd taken his daily draught, but the beat of the drums was inside his skin, pounding in sync with the blood flowing from his heart. He could almost touch the wolf blood, and he wasn't sure what that meant. Was the elixir weakening, or did this place have some greater pull to it? He thought it might be the latter because he had a strong urge to run off into the trees, to join whoever was playing the drums, to experience the vibrations of them up close in the balls of his feet, to pass the night as a resident of the jungle. Ram came out as well, and it showed how distracted Hank was that he didn't notice until the Indian stepped up near him and gestured with his own cup. An auspicious sight. It's an ominous one. Blood red like a blade cutting open the night sky, Hank replied. It had grown cool in the night, and he rubbed his hands on his trousers to warm them. Ram's teeth were very white in the darkness. Not in the east, my friend. Red is the color of joy and celebration. It is a fortuitous sign for our expedition. I suppose it is just a comet, not something that will impact my life in any direct way. It is probably best to just believe in my sword hand and the steel I wield in it. Hank told him. Well said, and I agree. As I told you, I'm a practical man, and yet, all across India tonight, the people will see this sign and will interpret it in many ways. What ways? Hank asked. Ram shrugged and took a sip, then said, Who is to know the mind of others, Sahib? I do not even know my own mind much of the time. I can only speculate. Go on and speculate then, Sahib, Hank replied. Ram watched the comet for a time, silently, his smile fading. When he spoke, his voice was a little above a whisper. Despite what I said, some will see it as you do, as a trail of blood, a thing to fear. Others will see it as the sword of vengeance, meaning it is time to fight back against the British. Some will see it as vindication for the path they are on, while still others, who had not decided what to do, will see it as proof they should decide. Hank eyed the Indian warily. He wondered where the man stood with this rebellion happening. He tried to imagine what he'd have done if he lived during the colonial days in the United States and was in a similar situation. Would he have stood by and done nothing or joined the cause? Ram was their guide. If he joined the rebels, would he just go quietly or would he attack the expedition team? Ram glanced at Hank and their eyes locked. A white figure emerged from a nearby stone home. Slender, quiet, moving rigidly, the figure stopped, facing them, arms held out low and still some good distance away. Who are you? Ram asked the person. Others followed the figure. Bella was one of the following shapes. Hank could tell by the way she moved. Damn, he hated not having the improved night vision of the wolf blood. With it, he could have seen for sure who the others were, but the elixir dampened that ability. Jane? Bella called to the figure in white who stood so rigidly. That snapped Hank and Ram from their inaction, and they crossed the distance quickly to see if they could help. Another of those near Jane waved an arm. It was the old Indian woman who'd taken the women away to speak with them. She whispered, Do not disturb her. I hear their screams, Jane uttered. Despite himself, 
Hank put a hand on his sword hilt. He strained to listen, but could hear nothing besides the incessant drums and that whistling horn, whatever it was. The commotion brought the other men from the hut. The wise man Guru Dev called out to the woman in some language Hank didn't know. She is having a vision, the woman answered in English. No one should disturb her. They whispered as they gathered around Jane, keeping some distance at the insistence of the Indian woman. The young lady thrust a rigid hand up at the blood-red comet and yelled, her voice high-pitched, her lips trembling, Idam der Steva, Nirmulana Dandasya Pratiderstam. Ram took a step towards her, but then stopped at the old woman's insistence. Miss Avon is speaking Sanskrit, he told them, archaically. What did she say? Clara asked. Behold, I see the executioner's blade, Ram replied. Jane's hand dropped to her side. She called out, Angawe Rai, Marwaleth the Erail. That's old Welsh, Clara said. Frail agreed. By Jove, Clara, you've hit upon it. Clara folded her hands in front of her as if reciting, never taking her eyes from Jane. She said, It brings doom for some and freedom for others. Jane turned, her face visible. Look at her eyes, they glow blue, Ram said. He's right, Primcourt exclaimed. Her eyes had turned a powerful ocean blue. But unlike Sir Radu's eyes, they were not dim and pale, Hank noted. Energy swirled in them like a stormy sea. Hank saw tears streaming down the woman's face. She called out, Galaf Glaud plant in Creo. Frail swallowed and his ears and eyebrows twitched. More old Welsh. I understood her words. He swallowed again, as if he'd rather do that than say what the words had meant. Well, Doctor, what did she say? Primcourt barked. Her words were, I can hear the children screaming, Frail said, his voice very quiet. Bloody hell, Primcourt called. I don't hear any children screaming. She is not seeing a thing that is happening in this place at this time, the old woman said. Well, when will it happen and where? Hank asked. The old woman replied with a kind but firm tone, I do not know. Be quiet now, all of you. Let her speak. Jane cried out in pain and they all jumped. Then more words streamed out in a whimpering chant. Omnes moriuntur, mulieris liberi. Clara translated, that's Latin now. She said, they're all dying, the women, the children. Jane slumped. She looked quite unsteady as she whispered, Opida ardent. She says the towns are burning, Frail added. The young woman wavered, stumbling. Then Ram leapt to her side and caught her just as she fainted. Jane's experience was a quite different one from her companions. She'd had a waking vision where she'd watched women and children dragged from their homes, had seen blades flashing. She sat now, awake, in the comfortable women's quarters on a pile of cushions. She was gently kneading one pillow with her hands. All her companions watched her as she recited what she'd seen. And that's it, really. I saw three towns on a plateau, with jungle on all sides, as if I was spying it from some great distance, and they were all burning. Just a nightmare is all, Ernest Primcourt replied. I wasn't asleep, Mr. Primcourt. Well, what does it mean, then? he asked. Moss spoke patiently with them. We were practicing some spells, the movements and speech which can bring forth her magic, when suddenly she rose and went outside, speaking of a comet, though how she'd known it was there I cannot say. Jane went on. I saw... I saw towns burning all over India there at the end. It wasn't only Indians killing whites, they were killing one another. And at the end of the vision, if I might call it that, the whites were seeking their revenge, no matter if the people they killed had committed any crime. Blood soaked the streets. When will this happen? Ram asked. She turned to gaze at him. Soon, if it has not already. Might this just have been some heat dream or a hallucination? Primcourt asked. No, the girl has the second sight, Moss replied. Jane gritted her teeth at Primcourt's questions. How could something happen to a person and others not believe her? She stayed patient, however, speaking slowly. I saw this plane as if I was there, though the vision transported me in an instant to different vantages, and I was sometimes above it all like a bird, and at other moments among the villains, or the victims. Frail went for his pocket notebook and scribbled notes furiously. One thing I'm sure of, Jane told them, if ten thousand Anglos die, many of them women and butchers, a million Indians will follow them. The British revenge will be swift and merciless. What is this word butchers? Hank asked. 
It is the Hindustani word for children, Lieutenant Singh replied, his eyes far away. He then asked Moss, Do these visions always come true? The old woman tapped her hands together. They can be changed, or what would be the value in them? Jane was suddenly exhausted. I must sleep, she told them. The old woman and Clara ushered the others out. Will she be all right? Clara asked in a whisper when Jane was resting. She has utilized a muscle, let us say, that she has never used. She must take care while strengthening this new muscle, lest she put strain on it and damage it, perhaps beyond repair, the old woman told her. Jane, though resting, heard this exchange. What does that mean, Moss? she asked, her voice weary and high-pitched. It means, my dear one, that you must be very careful to strengthen yourself before you exercise your magic too much. If you do not, you might burn the gift out of yourself completely. A raw edge of fear caught on to Jane then, but it was one of just many things buffeting against her, soon forgotten as she sank into the slumber of true exhaustion. Chapter 31 A Divine Mission Guru Dev found Ram standing in a distant field, listening to the tom-tom drums and the conch horns, while watching the comet fall away to the horizon. Why are they playing? Ram asked, gesturing off into the distance where the sounds originated from. You do not need me to tell you why. They see this as a sign that it is time to shake off the English Firangi. Ram sighed. Yes, I wager you're right. They listened to the discordant music for a time. It was coming from several points of the compass, some near and some far. You're troubled, my son, Gurudev told the young man. Ram kept his eyes on the comet. I saw my brother Anand. Gurudev put a hand over his eyes to ward off evil. Somehow he knew that this news held darkness. He whispered, Tell me what you saw. Ram did explaining that the demon king had turned his brother into a vampiric minion of some sort, finishing with the words, He rode the shadows. Have you told your father? Ram winced as if struck by an invisible blow. No, uncle. I don't know what to tell him. What will you do when you meet Anand again? We are Maratha, uncle. I will do my duty, as will he, I'm sure. They stood in silence for a time, and energy lay on the air. I smell turmoil and a great anxiousness in the wind, Guru Dev whispered, his throat dry. Ram nodded. Yes, there is fear as well. Even I can smell it, and I have no gift for reading the wind. What will you do, Guru Dev asked. Ram hissed. I will be happy when a day passes without someone asking me that question. The old man chuckled. Independence, you've always strived for it. Ram grunted, then explained. Yes, but not like this. I won't allow women and children to be killed. We will not gain our victory while we bathe in the blood of the innocent. Guru Dev watched the young man with his keen eyes while he asked, How will you prevent it? Ram waved a finger in the air as if he knew just what to do and proclaimed, I cannot stop it everywhere, but I will send Zothan to my father with the words of the Anglo-Jane Avon's prophecy. The old man replied with a twist to his lips, I could have told you the same without a vision, in the West they do not see the killing of women and children as we do here. Their anger will be like a volcano. They will gain their revenge one hundredfold. Yes, perhaps I've assimilated their ways because I find killing the innocent most grievous myself, Ram said. A noble notion. When it comes time to bear blades, will you fight against your countrymen? The old man asked. Ram grimaced at his teacher. And who are they, eh, uncle? My countrymen? The Marathas, the Rajputs, the Hindi? Are the Mohammedans and Parsis included? What of the Gurkhas, with their strange language and angled eyes? Are the Pathians part of India, or is Zothan not my brother, though he's shared more danger with me than any other? The old man did not reply, so Ram continued, Perhaps there will be such a thing as a unified India some day, and the British will in part have made it happen, in their desire to make it an easier place to control. Or maybe it will fall into pieces, like a broken jug on the stones, Guru Dev added. Ram grunted at this, but will that happen if I aid the rebels, or will it occur if I fight them, or only if I stand aside and do nothing? Guru Dev wiped a rough hand across his brow. I have no second sight. 
and I am in doubt that anyone can provide the answers to those questions. Yes, though it is the reason I came here truly, that I might receive your guidance. The old man drew himself up and gazed off into the distance with a haughty air. Ah, you've come to the well of wisdom once more. Will you listen this time? Ram smiled at his mentor's words. Well of wisdom indeed. Do not poke at me, old crow. Guru Dev smiled and Ram saw his teeth were failing. His eyes were not as clear as they'd once been. Was the old man stooped? He'd always been such a powerful presence in Ram's life. The thought of him aging was hard to bear. The old man lifted a cloth-wrapped bundle and handed it to Ram. Ram unwrapped it, revealing the talwar known as the Tiger Claw. No, uncle, I cannot take this. It is mine to give, boy. I can no longer honour it with my own hand. But will the princes honour your wish to pass it to me? Surely one of your sons should have it? It is yours, Ram Singh. I've known it for years and had planned on giving it to you, even before Moss ordered me to. Ram smiled. Very few could defy an order from Moss. Ram took the sword which was encased in its black sheath. Its hilt was night-grey serpentium, the pommel a tiger head with two tiny orange gems. The crossguard was a tiger's brandished claw. That in itself was rare beyond belief, but the blade was also a burnished golden iron witchwood. The steel forged with ripples across it like a tiger's stripes. It was a priceless treasure that could be neither sold nor purchased. This sword will be the difference between life and death in the coming days, Guru Dev told him. Can a single blade do so much? Ram asked. The old man scowled. You do not believe in it? I hope the legends are true, that it can kill. The undead can kill monsters, that the mere touch of it causes pain and injury to evil things, Ram replied. You sound unsure, Guru Dev told him. Ram's brow drew into a tight V. I said I hope it does. Can a blade really have magical power such that it can destroy evil? It does, my son. Ram bowed to his mentor. I will try to believe. The old man clucked a few times. It was not a gesture of irritation, but one of understanding, and he laid a wizened hand on Ram's shoulder. Ram unsheathed the blade a few inches and studied the burnished orange uneven stripes. Can this sword kill the Demon King? That I do not know. Tell me whether it worked when I see you next, the old man said with a twinkle in his eye. And what if I do not survive to tell you? Then we will have our answer, Guru Dev said with a sly look to his eye. A pack of jackals howled at one another in the distant trees, competing with the man-made sounds of the drums. My boy... You have taught me a secret of which you yourself are unaware. And what is that? Ram asked. That you are a prince. The fates of others swirl in your wake. You must decide what is best and forge it into reality. You can turn tides, dam rivers, start and stop wars, as long as your will is strong enough. Is it strong enough? Only you can know that, young one. Ram kicked at a bit of gnarled grass. I'm uncertain if it is. The comet finally faded from the sky, and Ram noted that the dawn was coming on, the air around the trees, the slate of a grey sea. What of the Demon King? Guru Dev asked. Now the tall young man's confidence was back, and he said with swagger, I will destroy him. You who have no magic? We will destroy him then, the Anglos and I. And the Tiger Claw? The old man tapped the hilt at Ram's side. Yes, uncle, along with this sword. And what of the Blade of Light, the Captured Sword? It is no longer known by such a moniker. It is now the Shadow Sword. Guru Dev waved his hand at Ram's words as if they were not important. You will let the other Anglos, the Americans in their new land, have it? How do you know of this? He studied his mentor with a scowl. I guess how you know is not important. I do not know what I will do, Ram replied. He gave that answer often as of late. The wise old man smiled, his eyes bright and aware, as if he knew of Ram's doubts and hesitation. There is much turmoil in the air, child. Give me your hands now and I will bestow a blessing. Yes, sir. You are a servant of the light. You stand in the breach of darkness. Ram's mentor began his blessing. Jane awoke again and the room was hot, so she thought it was afternoon. She was also aware that she could close her eyes and instantly fall back into a deep slumber. 
but there was so little time. She must gain all the knowledge she could. She sat up and found Moss sitting across from her. No one else was in the room. You must depart soon. Your train will come through the station early in the night, the older woman said. Jane's breath caught in her throat. She didn't wish to go. She wanted to stay and to learn more, though she became suddenly aware there was more to it. Moss was like the trunk of the banyan tree outside, solid and with her roots deep in the earth. Even should the tree be harmed, the roots would remain. Jane felt more like a seedling barely poking out from the earth, only in the light for a short time each day. Peace, child, calm yourself, Moss whispered and patted her hand. Jane replied, I'm fearful. I don't know how that vision came upon me. I don't know how to control what happened. I can show you magic is very simple in some ways, though it is never easy. Jane frowned. I don't understand. The elderly Indian woman explained, No magical effect can happen unless you induce it, dear. You must read or say the words, and it is strongest if you also work the gestures that accompany it. And when you open a channel, that reserve of magic can continue the spell without you needing to exert more effort. Are you saying I caused that to happen, Moss? Of course, my dear. Moss recited an incantation, waving her arms in a specific weave, and Jane recalled the words. She gasped. I remember saying that spell before the vision came upon me. Moss winked. That is the one that brought the vision upon you. The second sight is not like other spells, however. Imagine it like your train platform. Sometimes there is a train there, though most times there will not be. Jane frowned in puzzlement and Moss continued. You can invoke the spell, but many times it will show you nothing. However, and I have no gift for this myself, I'm told you will feel a prompting when there is a train at the station, if you will allow me to continue my analogy. Jane nodded. I recall a queasiness of the stomach when I recited that spell. Just so, the old mystic replied. Might I stay here a few more days, learn more? Jane inquired. Moss shook her head. No, Jane Avon. I fear it might already be too late. You must secure the Chaya Talwar quickly, before the Demon King uses it for his own nefarious ends. I believe he wishes to spread his poison to this realm and use the sword to accomplish that end. I don't wish to go, Jane told her. The old woman answered this with a kind smile, but the harsh question, who of us gets to do what we wish? They spoke of other topics, and Moss gave her detailed instructions on how to practice her gifts, but soon enough, the old woman was dragging her out of the home, and Jane felt like a goat being offered for sacrifice. Moss gathered up the other women on the way, and took them back to the men, who were drinking Arak and quite mellow. Jane was exhausted, even after her sleep, and seeing her fellow travellers made her even more tired. None of them could help her. Though she was among others, she was very alone. She did her best to still her thoughts. Moss had been adamant about that. She must learn to control her mind. Meditation would help her conquer her fears, strengthen her magic, and learn to control her thoughts the woman had told her many times. The old sorceress had also given her several other spells, as Moss called them, which Jane thought of like dance movements, but utilizing her hands only, precisely orchestrated with words that she must repeat, so that she could direct her magical energy. She had done poorly at it to her way of thinking, though Moss had seemed pleased. She'd also failed to open a channel, just as Moss had predicted, though the old woman had not allowed her to try again after telling her she should wait until she was ready. Are you well, Miss Avon? Ram asked. Jane nodded wearily. When Ram looked at Moss, the old woman clucked at him. She also rattled off instructions in an imperious tone while shaking her finger. Ram nodded several times. She turned to Jane. Ram will aid you. He's a very good boy, despite thinking with those broad shoulders and the point of his sword much of the time. Be wary of his smile, however. A man should not have such a pretty smile. He uses it to get himself out of trouble, or into it. Ram jolted backwards and then opened his mouth to protest, but Moss grabbed his cheeks, standing on her tiptoes to reach them, and pulled him down so she could kiss his forehead. You will watch over her, she ordered, and he nodded. He kissed her hands, bid Guru Dev farewell by touching his feet, and then the party entered the muted jungle, the calls of strange birds and monkeys filling the heavy air. Guru Dev watched until they disappeared from view, 
waving as the lush vegetation swallowed them. Trudging beneath the dense canopy, Jane walked over to Lieutenant Singh and asked him, What did she tell you? That you must meditate every night and that I am to show you how. That we must work hard to survive. Chapter 32 Abandoned Village The train hissed to a halt at the lonely jungle station, its brakes and cloud of steam a welcome signal to Hank and the others. We've arrived at Alokavihin Gati, Ram pronounced while looking out the window, though I don't see any people waiting for us. Aloko Kin, Hank heard Clara attempting to pronounce the strange-sounding words. The place was definitely a mouthful, but he didn't care what it was called. After three days of train passage, they were all eager to disembark. They grabbed their gear, with the servants streaming up from other cars, to help Frail with his many trunks and bags. As they stepped down from the train, the eerie silence that engulfed them surprised Hank. The platform was abandoned except for a lizard threading through neglected benches with exaggerated slowness. Hank loosened his sword in its scabbard and loaded a cartridge into his special rifle. He sniffed at the air but caught nothing but steam, iron, leather and wood, the train masking all else. Ram was also suspicious. Stay vigilant, I don't like this. There should be carts waiting here for us. The train porters helped to unload the trunk so that it might continue on its way, and soon there was a mountain of luggage stacked on the lonely platform. This village is usually busy, Ram told them as the train gathered a head of steam and the wheels turned to carry it away. Nimrod stepped up close to a hut, his own rifle held ready. Well, it ain't now. He pushed open the door with his foot and glanced inside. Empty. Looks like the folks here ski-daddled some time ago. The village around the train platform was abandoned. They explored further, finding only overgrown fields, tools discarded as if dropped in mid-task, and more darkened huts. This place has been deserted for some time, Ram murmured. He had expected bustling activity, villagers loading their provisions onto carts for transport to boats which would take them down river. But those plans now lay in ruins, like all else here. What do you suppose could have driven them away? Bella asked. Ram examined a small piece of orange gold fabric one of his men brought him. Wait here a moment, please, he said, and with a few of his sepoys, he climbed a dirt track and stood on a flat bit of cleared ground, looking off into the distance. From down below, the others could not see what interested him so much, as a wall of thick vegetation obscured it. Soon Ram turned back to them, and one of his sepoys trotted down the embankment. Sahibs and Mem Sahibs, the Raja asks that you come to see, he told them. With wariness, Hank and the others trudged upward until they arrived at a narrow, flat plain that stretched off into rounded, grassy foothills along the horizon. Between here and there, three large pillars of smoke rose angling off into the clouds. Oh no, this is what I saw in my vision, Jane called out, her eyes haunted. Ram handed Primcourt the orange cloth. A crouching tiger, the Brit asked, looking at the insignia upon it. Yes, it is the standard of a bandit lord by the name of Thakur Amarjit Thapa. A bandit lord? Clara asked. Yes, he has never been much of a threat, always kept to the hills. Twice he's gotten too fat-headed for his collar, and we've put him down. But the rascal always escapes, Ram told them. His brow furrowed as he looked at the pillars of smoke. He's never had much of a following. If he's the one doing the plundering and burning, he must have acquired more fighters. Rebellions bring human vultures as well as the other kind, Primcourt said. Should we do something? Frail asked. They could see the nearest town on the plain burning from here, a bright, wavering orange belching out a black, slanted pillar of greasy smoke. Much further away, Hank saw a column of men outside one of the distant towns. It was at least a battalion-sized unit. I see the same standards among that big clump of men, Jane said. Hank tried hard to see the standards, but it was just too far. All he could make out was a clump of soldiers. You must have the eyes of a hawk, girl, Nimrod said, one hand shielding his eyes as he squinted to see what she saw. No different from anyone else as far as I know, she said, but I can clearly see there are five standards on poles with that same banner. What do you suppose they are doing in those towns? Clara asked, plundering them, 
murdering whites, Christians, and anyone else they have an issue with, Jane answered. This brought about a shocked murmur from the others. If Tharpa leads them, Miss Avon's conclusion is sound. They are likely murdering many people, but first among them will be any Anglos, Ram agreed. Primcourt turned and attempted to usher them all back down the hill. Then we must go, and quickly. I can't just let this banded army murder innocents, Hank said. The last words came out as a growl, and he clamped his mouth shut, realizing that was the beast trying to claw out, even under the influence of the daily elixir. Radu stepped up near him and rested a hand on his friend's shoulder and spoke to the group. Nor I. Ram also stepped up by Hank's side. I cannot stand aside either. Jane thrust up a hand to them. Know this. If we stop to aid these doomed towns, we will never accomplish our quest. We will lose our chance to gain the Sword of Shadows. Is this one of your visions? Hank asked her, doing his best to control himself. The thought of children being murdered was too much to bear. Jane nodded. Her own eyes were red-rimmed with deep purple lines under them. They glowed the deep ocean blue they had when she'd given her first prophecy. It is grievous to bear, and I wish we did not have this choice before us, but I've seen it. Any who go into those towns will not join us to fight the demon king. What if we went only to the first town, Ram asked. Yes, the closest one. What if we ventured into that one and no further, Radu asked. She shook her head. Then she was only a very young woman, and the vision seemed to have overwhelmed her because she collapsed to her knees. Bella and Clara went to her side and lifted her up and assisted her down the hill, back to where the train had left them. I'm not certain I can leave a slaughter such as that behind me. I don't have it in me to let those bastards murder little butchers while I run away, Ram said. Hank clapped a hand on the man's shoulder. His head throbbed, and despite him taking the daily elixir... When? It had been the day before. Despite taking it recently, he was filled with a kind of pulsing rage that was quite near what the wolf brought out in him. If he let loose just a little, the wolf would take hold. We must complete the quest, Radu uttered, resolute. Ram came to some conclusion then, because he took strides to follow the others back to the train platform. We are choosing to save more people by retrieving the Chaya Talwar from the Demon King, he called over his shoulder. Hank growled, then followed. Back in the deserted village and with no carts in sight, they faced the harsh reality. They would need to haul all their provisions by hand through the suffocating jungle, and with the nearby bandits or rebels or whatever they were, they'd best get to it. It's a long journey to the river. Without carts, we won't be able to take all of this, Ram told them. Frail's eyes darted frantically over the heavy trunks and crates containing his painstakingly crafted gadgets and delicate instruments. Surely we can devise some method, perhaps if we make multiple trips, he implored Ram. The lieutenant thought for a moment. There is another village en route to the river, he pointed off down a jungle trek. It will take us a week to reach it without carts and burdened as we will be. If they possess carts or beasts that can help us, we can double back for the heaviest gear. That's assuming the bandits have not already been there and don't come here in our absence and discover this hoard of equipment. Hank said. He was surly from his inability to help the towns being ravaged by the bandits. Ram shook his head. It is possible, but the village I speak of is far enough off the track and poor enough that I doubt it. Those towns on the ridge are much plumper prizes, and the Farangi Road passes right through them, offering an easy escape if John Company soldiers should show. Frail's concern for his precious crates was like a father for his children. He leaned down over them protectively. I can't just leave these here, in this remote place. Primcourt disagreed. I'm afraid you'll have to, Doctor. The Lieutenant is correct. We don't have a way to transport them. If we find help en route, we'll come back and retrieve them. He glanced back towards those burning towns, assuming it is safe. Clara rubbed the Doctor's arm as he launched into a coughing fit that ended in him half falling onto one of the trunks. From a raspy throat, he finally said, My work. All my work. Think of it as ensuring we travel swiftly and survive to continue your work, Clara urged softly. Perhaps it'll all be here when we return. Frail frowned but nodded. Ram issued firm instructions about the minimal clothing, weapons, food and tools they could reasonably carry. Clara helped the distraught doctor sift through his notebooks and inventions, 
making difficult decisions about what must be left behind. The doctor broke open a crate that held a dozen curious silver pistols. He said with a pinched face, These are brand new Colt Model 1 rimfire revolvers. They fire seven rounds, and like the rifles I gave out earlier, the cartridges themselves are self-contained. Hank was the first to grab one, taking two grey boxes of cartridges as well. Bella secured two. Soon all the men had taken one. A little of Frail's colouring and zest came back as everyone thanked him and surveyed the strange-looking weapon. It had a curved wooden handle and fitting that encircled the cylinder. The cylinder and the barrel were cold blue steel. Overall, it was the ugliest gun Hank had ever seen, but he didn't care a whit if it shot well. Might I have one? Jane asked. Without a word, Frail handed one over, along with a box of bullets. She quickly retrieved another box, then shoved it all in her pocket with some embarrassment. They continued their sorting and stacking, and at last stood surveying a pile of satchels and trunks that would travel onward with them. All else waited to be reclaimed by the wilds. Hank, Radu and Ram moved all they left behind to one of the huts, hoping the equipment might remain hidden from the destructive forces of either man or nature. Hank was astounded to see all the weaponry in the crates. What is this? he asked about a flexible tube with a nozzle on the end that screwed into a metal canister. It throws flame, I call it a fire tosser, Frail declared, while wiggling his eyebrows, obviously proud of his invention. We should take that, Hank suggested, then spotted a curiously large musket. And this? A mini cannon fires a load of pellets. Like a giant shotgun, Bella asked. Frail beamed as everyone took in the sight of some of his gadgets. That is precisely it. Sits on these two wooden wheels. Quite portable. Why do we have so many weapons with us? Jane asked. The last group that entered Anantavan died to the last man. We thought it best to be prepared, Primcourt informed them. They all died, Jane replied. Some twenty men, Primcourt said. What is this? Hank asked, still digging through the crates they were leaving behind. I call them blast poppers. Frail told him, taking one of the sticks, which had a domed head like a mushroom. You pull this little cord, which commences a chemical reaction involving phosphorus. Keep your explanation simple, please, Doctor, Clara said. Ah, yes, thank you, Miss Clara. Simple. Well, let me see. The Doctor was clearly flummoxed at how to do that, but then said, It produces a large flash of flame and smoke and then burns for one and one half minutes. Let us take a crate of those, Hank suggested. I agree, but we can bring no more, Ram said. We're already overloaded. These are interesting devices, Doctor. I would appreciate it if I could learn more about them, Hank told him. Frail stuttered, excited to share information, then began one of his coughing fits, and Clara pulled him aside to help him calm his breathing. We really should bury the rest of this, Hank said, looking over what would remain. The last thing he wanted was to give the bandits anything that might aid them. There isn't time, Ram said. What we should do is take this weaponry up to that town and scatter those rapacious rogues, Hank whispered. No, Hank, I told you we're moving on, Primcourt ordered. The two glared at one another, then Bella stepped in between them. Please, gentlemen, we mustn't start bickering among ourselves. Hank turned away, surly, knowing that what he wanted to do was a lost cause at any rate. There were just too many of those bandits. The entire expedition would be destroyed if they tried to fight the hundreds of marauders he'd seen up there. They loaded everyone down like pack animals, ropes cutting into their shoulders beneath the implacable sun, and began their arduous hike, heart-sick but unbowed. Into the jungle's depths they pressed on, frail lingering for one last rueful glance at the lost treasures, swallowed by vines and underbrush in their wake, while Hank glanced back up the hill towards where innocents were dying. Chapter 33. Into the Jungle. The terrain was unforgiving. The vegetation grasped at them, to say it was a struggle to advance against the snarls and tangles of vines and root systems which dogged every step, was to minimize the difficulty. None of them except the servants were accustomed to such back-breaking travel under such horrible conditions. Twice they stopped in the first hour to adjust cargo and to rest. They did not travel cross-country unless necessary, of course, Mostly they used dirt roads and trails, 
but often found even these overgrown with constantly encroaching vegetation. And the heat was relentless, even in the shade of the trees. Hank began to think of himself as a turkey roasting in some great oven, and he wondered when he would be cooked through. He'd already packed his coat away, loosened his collar, and even undone his sleeves to allow air to flow onto his skin, but he still baked and fried, depending on if he was in shade or in the sun. The beast, especially, hated the heat. Inside his head, it snarled and worked at the mental bindings he'd fashioned to keep it at bay. He knew it was the innocence in those villages that really had him in a bother. How he despised himself for walking away. The daily elixir weakened as forces worked against it, and he took a second swig at lunchtime to keep the creature contained. Still, he was in a low boil all day. Once he growled audibly, and Radu, who was close to hand, told him, What would you choose, my stalwart friend? The death of the few or the death of the many? We do this that we might protect the many. I know, Radu. I know all about it in principle. It is when it is laid in front of me that I cannot bear it. That night they camped in the shade of a banyan. The servants and the sepoys were exhausted and fell into a deep sleep the moment they'd had their dinner. However, everyone else was restless, the spectre of the burning towns keeping them all on edge and preventing relaxation or sleep. Do you believe they killed everyone in those towns? Jane asked anyone and everyone. No, that would be barbaric, Primcourt said while forcing a thin smile. I think they may have, Freyl added, his voice soft, as if he could barely muster the energy to speak. Either way, it matters little to our objective. We push on in the morning, Primcourt replied stubbornly. Jane thought him quite cold and was about to say so when Dr. Freyl found her with the magical book. Miss Avon, might we pass some time learning more about your gifts? Blast, she thought. She wouldn't be getting to sleep for some time, it appeared. That night, after reading through the magical book once again, she fell into a deep sleep. The magic in the book was a chore to even read, apparently, and it wearied Jane so. And she was not just being a flighty bird. It literally put her to sleep, wore her out until she could not keep her eyes open. Just attempting to read one of the spells or to try to recall it afterward was exhausting. The next night, after another day of endless trekking, she tried to read from the book again, this time under the careful observation of Ram, Clara and Frail, but she had the same result. In both instances, she slept all night and was weary the next day. When she asked Frail to see it again the next night, Ram stepped in. No, he ordered. Frail quailed before the formidable warrior, who stood with his arms folded and a frown that would have made many tigers think twice before attacking. I'm not one of your soldiers, Lieutenant, Jane replied, and felt heat rising in her neck. Surprised, he turned to her. Miss Avon, this book is causing you pain. No, sleepiness, she corrected him. If I could speak for a moment, Frail said. No, you can't, Jane told him, and he flinched backwards. Eventually you just might not wake up at all, Ram said to her, giving her that same stern look. You are not my father, nor my brother, not my servant, nor my guard, she declared angrily. However, to her surprise, his concern evoked other feelings besides anger as well. Ram's eyes blinked then, and she saw hurt in them, a lump formed in her throat. She discovered she did not like to see pain on his face. If I might tell you something I've found, Frail tried again to interject, I'm quite aware I'm not one of your servants or your family, Miss Avon, Ram told her, talking over Frail. Explain to me why you feel it's your place to speak for me, then, she demanded, one eyebrow raised. He swallowed. I'm responsible for the welfare of everyone on this expedition. If someone is making dangerous choices, it is my duty to speak up. Your duty? she asked. Yes, my duty. Just as it is my duty to teach you to meditate. I promised my aunt I would, he said. Then why haven't you? Taught me to meditate, that is, Lieutenant. He didn't seem to know what to say at first, but then told her, You've been tired, but it is time we begin. I don't care how tired I am. If you can meditate, so can I, Jane declared, her eyes flashing a challenge at the lieutenant. That's an excellent idea, Frail said, and recoiled when they both turned furious looks on him. I think you need to prepare your mental faculties to work magic, Frail said in a rush. 
Jane was about to read to him from her own personal book of revelations when she realized what he'd said. Ram also paused whatever he'd been about to say. Given a moment longer to speak, Frail pressed on, tapping the leather-bound tome in his hand. I found a passage in the book that talks about the student of magic needing to strengthen their fortitude, to build up their so-called mental prowess and learn how to focus. Moss told me something similar, Jane admitted. Best we get started then, Ram said. Mr. Bravo wandered over. What is this mediation? Meditation, Ram corrected him. It is the process of bringing oneself into alignment with the energies of the universe, of convening with the divine. Religion? Hank inquired. Ram replied, glancing at his ever-widening group of interested parties. To some, perhaps. It certainly is a complementary discipline. I prefer to think of it more as a form of self-control, bringing one's energies into balance. Hank blinked in surprise. Is that something you can teach, Ram? Self-control? Yes, Sahib. Join our sessions at your leisure. Thank you, Sahib, Hank replied. This made Jane smile. Mr. Bravo had taken to using the word Sahib when addressing the Indians in their party. Few Anglos she knew used it regularly. The soldier in Ram came out then. He beckoned with a pointing finger at Jane. Come and sit here and we shall begin. This became their practice every night to meditate, and then for Jane to work with Frail to try to conjure the magic as found in the book and using the forms which Moss had shown her. At first she hated both, she couldn't still her mind enough for meditation to work. It was simply an hour of boredom, which often led to an argument with Ram when he gently told her to relax. She hissed at him. I am relaxed. Obviously, Mr. Bravo quipped. She turned a dark look on him, but he just smiled. The rascal. Remember to be still, to empty your mind of thoughts, Ram said. Jane growled. Ram whispered as calm as ever. Peace. She humped at the air. Miss Avon, can you be quiet? Mr. Bravo asked her. She regarded him. His continual attendance night after night surprised her. He didn't seem the type to engage in these sorts of pursuits, but he followed Ram's lessons precisely, and often practiced long after Jane had given up. Elbows on his splayed knees, hands outstretched and eyes closed, sitting calmly. Ram's voice was quiet. I engage in a form of mental discipline for personal reflection and inner peace. Like a river I am unending, turning as needed, ever flowing, like the sands of time. Jane wanted to let out an oath that would make a sailor blush. Then she opened one eye enough to see Mr. Bravo watching her. Apparently, he expected her to make some comment. Well, she'd be damned if she'd say a word if he was expecting her to. She rarely interrupted Ram. That is to say, she seldom said anything. Hank smirked at her. Apparently, he knew what she was thinking. She bit her lips and closed her eyes, ignoring the infuriating man. Ram's voice soothed her. I am a pond of still water. Intrusions temporarily mar my serenity, yet I will always regain the joy of a peaceful rest. I am still water, she whispered, though she felt more like turbulent rapids. Chapter 34 Ice Dr. Frail's sessions progressed in a much swifter fashion than her struggles with meditation. Jane was unable to master creating a magical channel, but on the very first night of her practice, created a few icicles that hung from tree branches and promptly melted away. Icicles? She'd excitedly called everyone over to see them. Her power grew most nights after that, and her endurance also improved, mostly due to the regular practice and the meditation, Dr. Frail surmised. That was not to say she didn't have other difficulties besides the inability to create a channel. One problem was that sometimes she could not still her thoughts enough to conjure anything at all. The meditation helped with this, but some nights she reached for power and found nothing at all. Another difficulty was that she could not conjure anything except spells that worked with cold. She attempted to work with fire, to move earth, to push the air, and several other incantations in the magical tome, but none worked for her except those involving ice and cold. It became her specialty, as Dr. Frail called it, and it became commonplace for members of their expedition to come upon a tree branch with ice melting from it at any time of the day or night. For many of the sepoys and servants, this still caused a gasp of fright even after several days. 
Still, there came a time when she plateaued and made no more gains. Her progress might have stalled completely, except that one night she was washing up a bit before bed by a small stream and encountered a leopard on the trail. The creature was a massive male, crouched, watching her every movement. Its golden eyes locked on her, powerful shoulders tight, body like a coiled spring. Stunned by the sudden appearance of the beast, she wanted to cry out but found herself unable to move, mouth unresponsive. She forgot about her pistol, which could easily have dispatched or frightened off the creature. She was reminded of a time when she'd accompanied Harry on a boar hunt. They'd had little luck finding any of the creatures, but they had spotted a family of monkeys. Harry and the scouts had pointed lantern beams at the creatures, and for whatever reason, this froze the things in place until the shooting began, hypnotizing them like moths drawn to a flame. She was like one of those monkeys now, unable to do anything as the leopard gathered itself and took a few small stalking steps forward. Then she reached for the magic without thinking, and it came like a river rushing. Her senses sharpened to a keen edge, the night as bright as noonday. The sounds and sights of the jungle ready for her inspection if she focused on them. And a sheet of ice blasted out of her, covering the ground and trees around her for a span twice the height of Ram. The leopard raced off, bounding between bushes like a frightened rabbit, and Jane looked at her hands, which were tingling with cold. Surrounding her was a patch of winter, the scenery painted with a light sheen of frost and ice, which she ran her hands across in wonder. The ground was covered in an inch of snow that she kicked about for a time, reveling in this new experience. Perhaps you perform at your peak proficiency only when your blood is raised. It might be a matter of the rate of your heart, Dr. Frail told her when she later recounted the tale. Jane thought he might be correct, but on nights after, she could not recreate the same level of ability, no matter how they attempted to stimulate her heart rate. And sometimes, she couldn't grasp her powers at all. She never again felt the heightened senses as she had or brought about such an explosion of ice and snow. Dr. Frail took to trying to startle her when she went down to wash up or hang her clothing, and she nearly crowned him with her pistol more than once before Clara ordered him to cease his efforts before Jane murdered him. And always, throughout these efforts, using magic, drained her energy so completely that she would collapse into her bedroll later to awaken with the rising sun, feeling as if she hadn't slept a wink. Eventually she realized she could feel that magical muscle that Mouse had described, that limit to her strength. A few times she came upon a barrier to her power, not a hard mental wall per se, more a limit for her own safety. Every time her exertions took her close to that barrier, she'd shy away. An instinct told her she didn't want to push through that, that she might endanger her abilities if she did. Ram also sensed the strain on her and began to force her to take breaks, one night in three, though he was gentle about it, and pulled Dr. Frail aside to suggest it to him, she noticed. At first, she set herself against his interference, but as a week passed, she realized what a gift he was giving her to be able to recover. She came to understand that he was quite a kind man behind the intimidating physical presence, hard eyes, and commanding way. He drove the expedition and maintained order in the camp. He was not just kind to her, of course. He kept the things he did for others hidden, but she saw when he took part of one of the servants' loads, when the man fell sick with a fever or when he took Dr. Frail's burdens after a bout of illness, which happened almost every day. Ram was the first up in the morning and the last to bed, only resting when the others were safe in their bedrolls. He scouted out campsites and always took out a patrol while the others ate to make sure the perimeter of their camp was secure. Often he was not back to eat until the dinner was cold. He even hunted and foraged, supplementing their grain and preserved stores with fresh meat or wild fruits, a much welcomed boost to the spirits of the expedition members after the long days of travel along hard pack roads or across winding jungle paths. Jane realized she was stirred whenever the handsome young Indian was near her and was horrified to encounter these feelings. Chapter 35, Zothan Returns, in camp one night, after they'd been on the road for more than a week, Clara suggested they spend a day resting. Jane knew the prim, attentive woman was concerned about everyone, 
but mostly her request centered on the health of Dr. Frail, whom Clara showed a more than motherly affection towards, but it was not just him. The women were near exhaustion, except for Bella, Jane had to admit to herself. Prim Court wouldn't hear of it, however. We must push on, he announced. We haven't a day to lose. Jane studied the British official. He was surely going above and beyond the call on this one. Mr. Primcourt, what motivates you to conduct this quest? The stoic man thrust his chin into the air and held his stiff upper lip firm. I'm a patriot and my queen has given me an order. But Jane remained unconvinced. Come now, what difference does it make if we recover this shadow blade in two days or two weeks? It has been in the same location for centuries, has it not? Frail piped in now. The research I've found indicates the sword is growing in power. Perhaps it will even be able to free the demon king from his mystical prison, unleashing him upon this world. Yes, the sword is the thing. We mustn't wait too long, Primcourt added. But he wasn't looking at her as he said it, and Jane thought there was more to his reasoning. She said, I suspect there are deeper motives behind your dedication to this quest than the confines of occupational duty. When Mr. Primcourt did not immediately reply, she pressed on. We know so little of each other, and yet we place our lives in one another's hands. Please share what drives you. Primcourt weighed his words before answering. You're quite perceptive, Miss Jane. There are personal reasons I have dedicated my life to understanding such mysteries and to fighting the stain of evil wherever I encounter it. Taking a deep breath, he spoke evenly, no trace of emotion in the words. Years ago I had a family, a wife, Irma, and two young boys. There never has existed a happier family. Jane tried to imagine the serious, stern man as a loving, happy father and husband and was unable to manage it. Primcourt continued, One night a creature came in the darkness while I was attending to business in London. It slaughtered Irma and our youngest boy, but it took my eldest son, Godfrey, turning him into a vampire. The group reacted with murmured dismay. Clara seemed especially moved by the tale. Whatever did you do? Primcourt glanced at each face in turn. There is only one thing to be done with vampires. Isn't that right, Mr. Bravo? Hank grunted. I once thought so. Bella chimed in. No, it's true. Only one thing. Put them down. Primcourt blinked a few times, unsettled by the memory. Then he continued speaking. It was then that I knew. Mystic forces exist in our world, as real and dangerous as any army. If humanity is to survive, we must unlock their secrets and their power. I'm a man with considerable means and political connections, and I've brought all of my resources to bear to combat our hidden, dark enemies. He held Jane's gaze. My purpose is to balance the mystical scales so that mankind has a fighting chance. Those are the stakes which compel me, Miss Avon. Clara frowned in sympathy. I'm so sorry for your loss, sir. How absolutely dreadful. You make it sound as if you believe there is some united force standing against the people of the world, Mr. Primcourt, Jane said. Primcourt thought a moment before speaking. I do not believe it is united yet. But imagine if the forces of darkness came together to stand as one. I'm not sure we could stop them. We'd be doomed, Frail quipped morosely. Halt! One of the sepoys shouted from the edge of the camp, startling them all. Ram barked an order, emerging into the firelight with his pistol drawn. There came a hurried, panicked reply from the sentry. Ram's eyes widened. I sent a messenger to my father, and he's come back, though much too swiftly. Oh, that's splendid, Jane called. They all turned to regard this new arrival. Then they saw it, movement between the trunks. A silhouette, vaguely human in form, swaying and shambling erratically toward their sheltered fire. Ram didn't like the way it moved. Halt! he called out. Why, what is wrong? Jane asked him. I smell death, Hank said. The figure stopped just outside the firelight. Lieutenant Ram? it whispered. Zothan? he answered. Aye, it is the body of Zothan the Pathian. Those around the campfire drew weapons and bunched together. Do not fear me, travellers. It is the Demon King's wish that tonight you will sleep in peace. It stumbled forward until enough firelight spilled over the figure for them to glimpse its ravaged features. Ram recoiled in dismay. By the gods, no. The thing approaching was no living man, 
but a horrific perversion of one. The corpse of the sergeant that had always been close to Ram's side until he sent him with a message for his father. The shadows could not obscure his terrible wounds, nor the emptiness in his staring eyes. Muskets and spears wavered uncertainly as the cadaver lurched into their midst and halted near the fire. Up close, the stench of decay nearly overwhelmed them. The grim apparition so contrary to the noble soldier, this had once been. What is it? Freyl asked. Some trick? Nimrod's voice was hoarse and strained. The servants and the other sepoys at their own fire gathered in close and clutched at each other while they stared at the thing, murmuring in unconcealed terror. Zothan raised a bloodied hand, pointing at them, and spoke, Hear me, doomed ones, those who trespass into domains of despair. Turn away from these dark roads, or you will roam the earth as restless spirits for an eternity. You are about to enter the demon king's realm, where nameless horrors hunt. Three voices came from his lips each speaking in a unique language so all would understand him. A log collapsed in the fire, releasing a burst of sparks that caused many to call out, startled. The corpse continued intoning its warning, Turn aside from your journey and live. Continue, and you will end up enslaved for an eternity. The dire words echoed as if spoken simultaneously by many. Some warriors cringed away or shielded their eyes from the abomination, but Ram stepped forward, sadness and outrage warring within him. I am a servant of the sacred order of the Shield of the Sun. I am a herald of light in the abyss of darkness, Ram pronounced. The corpse responded with a rattling, bone-chilling laugh that made the campfire's light seem to shrink and dim. Your petty words mean nothing to the power of the Demon King. I am a vessel of light. Ram's words came from a tight throat, his voice uncertain. The shadowy corpse howled and the living cringed. It spoke again, this time with a dozen voices that echoed from every shadow clinging to the trees. Hear the words etched upon your comrades' bones. Your light will be extinguished if you trespass in the Demon King's domain. Before Ram could respond, shadows streamed from the surrounding jungle toward the horrific figure. They engulfed it like a black tide, swallowing all light and form until only darkness remained. As the obfuscating shadows receded, Ram saw with dismay that no sign of the corpse remained, not even a stain upon the earth to mark where it had stood. Only the lingering pall of death persisted to prove they had not collectively imagined the ghastly visitation. Around the camp, the assembled expedition members remained frozen in horror and disbelief. Flickering firelight threw wild, distorted shadows across their stricken faces. Finally, the silence broke as questions and arguments erupted among them. One of the servants called, The curse of the demon king is upon us. Others joined in, We must flee this evil place. Madness, we must go back, someone said with a whimper. Hank stepped forward and bellowed, Quiet! The camp fell silent. He implored them, Panic won't help. Everyone must remain in control of their wits. No one else spoke for a long time, whether in control of their wits or not. They kept their counsel to themselves. After an hour, when things had settled, they pulled the servants and sepoys, who usually slept separate, into the main camp, agreeing they needed to protect each other. Some settled into an attempt at slumber, though most could not. Ram refused to even lie down. He stood, a lone sentinel, on a rock near where Zothan had appeared. Radu joined him. Then Hank, Bella, and the rest of the expedition members came as well. Even their transplanted Brit, Jane, joined them. Ram spoke as he stared out into the forest. We are too superstitious in India. Every event portends something fortuitous or ill-omened. A man can barely take a step in one direction without someone assuming he's offended some deity. He gave a grim, self-deprecating smile. It's all terribly tiresome. Though in this case a corpse wandered into our camp, we've some reason to have concern. Yes, there is the bit about the corpse hardly just people frightened of their own shadow. I'm not Indian, but I admit I'm scared to go on. I'm afraid I won't survive, Clara said. Everyone is, Hank replied. Not me, I'm not worried, Nimrod muttered, his brows drawn in a V. What kind of being has the power to reanimate the dead? Frail asked. It is terrifying. It was a vetala, spirits that possess the dead, Jane told them. Ram grunted. I believe you're right, Miss Avon. 
I grow tired of asking this, but what will we do now? Jane asked. Bella stepped forward. I think we should turn back. Primcourt hissed. What? Bella? She rubbed her hands together. Hank had never seen her nervous, but she seemed anxious now. She said, I know this is important, but there are so many lives at stake. Is it worth it? To me it is. If I had an army, I'd sacrifice them all to stop this threat of evil. The government man's voice held an icy certainty. Bella chimed in. How very cold-hearted of you, Ernest. Primcourt seemed to reconsider his words then after looking into Bella's eyes. This is not the military, you understand. Each of you must decide for yourselves. Turn back if you must, or stay and continue on and receive your promised reward. Ram was still studying the surrounding darkness. He whispered, I will do my duty. The others were not ready to give their yeas or nays yet and moved off alone or in pairs. Chapter 36. To Proceed or to Turn Back Clara found Dr. Frail in an empty glade full of moonlight. You should sleep. You must be exhausted and we have another long day tomorrow, she told him. He did not turn to look at her as she'd hoped he would. Instead, he kept gazing at the moon. After a time, he declared, I will continue with the expedition. He set his hands on his hips the way he did when he was certain of something. I'm weary beyond anything I've ever known, but must put aside my weakness in the search for knowledge. And Clara knew then that this was his god, the quest for knowledge, and in his way he was no less a crusader than Primcourt or Ram, no less a warrior than Mr. Bravo or O'Toole. For herself she was not such a believer. She wasn't sure what the others had thought when they saw those towns burning. But she had learned then that she was a coward. She'd wanted to run and not stop until she was safely back in England. A shadow had fallen over her while viewing the far-off pillaging of those poor towns, a sense of doom, and she couldn't shake it off. And now, this evil messenger, this dead man who had walked into their camp to deliver a warning, had spoken directly to her. It had called her by name, and she'd heard awful whispers while it spoke to the others, warning her to turn back. She could still hear it, the sound like a withered hand reaching out of a crypt. Dr. Frail pivoted and looked into her eyes, and she reached up and tucked a bit of his stray hair behind his ear. He was such a goof, such a dear, clumsy fool for all his learning. Have you decided what you will do? he asked, and the question hurt her. Didn't he know that wherever he went, she would follow? No, of course he didn't. He was a genius on the level of Archimedes or Da Vinci, but he was also a fool on the magnitude of Midas or Nero, and in matters of love, he was worse than blind, worse than deaf, worse than dumb. I'm frightened, aren't you? she asked him. I am terrified, he admitted, then grinned. She inquired, frightened enough to turn back, to escape before those bandits overtake us, or to avoid this so-called demon king? He flinched backwards. Heavens, no! He looked her over. The bandits might not even travel this way, and as for the demon king, he is scared as well, or he would not have threatened us. She wasn't sure she agreed and didn't know what to say. This was perhaps his greatest moment, this expedition. It was a chance to learn more than any other opportunity which might ever present itself. She whispered, I have such an awful feeling, such anxiousness has enveloped me. Are you ill, Clara? His face was sober and she quite forgot the question, lost in the way he'd said her name. He put the back of his hand on her cheek, then on her forehead. You feel cool, but at the same time, hot. Are you quite well? I am. Fit as a fiddle. He studied her closely. Do you wish to turn back? Well, perhaps. He grew more serious. Clara, if you're worried, we can turn back. Maybe we should turn back. Obviously, he wanted to push on. One of his eyes squinted as he made that face he had that reminded her so much of a mischievous boy who wanted to do something he knew he shouldn't. No, we press on, she declared, trying hard to sound sure, like Lieutenant Singh or Mr. Primcourt did when they spoke. Those men had conviction. She wanted to emulate their devotion to this cause. The doctor's eyes lit up at her words. 
He shook one arm at the sky with excitement. Yes, we press on. Tally-ho. Taking a deep breath as if to muster the courage for a daring experiment, he leaned in and kissed her. It was a first for them both, clumsy but full of earnestness. Clara's eyes widened in surprise but then gently closed, her mind a whirl of thoughts and emotions, too complex to categorize. She reciprocated, and for a moment their lips locked in a sweet collision, both awkward and perfect in its novelty. When they finally broke the kiss they stared at each other in silent wonder, realizing they had stumbled upon a new frontier for them both. The doctor cleared his throat, suddenly self-conscious. I, uh, I'm quite sorry. I don't know what prompted me to take such an action, he stammered, blushing. Clara laughed softly, her breath escaping her so that she had to grab it back. Rational experimentation, doctor, and you've made a promising start, she said, worthy of further investigation. Both grinned, their hearts beating in a rhythm as natural and mysterious as the laws that governed the universe. Then a kind of pall came over the doctor. Clara saw it descend, leeching the happiness from his frame. I don't think we should continue this. I'm not a healthy man, and I'm afraid all I have to offer you is a widow's wreath, Frail said. Clara ran a finger over his lips, then said, Hush now, doctor. Kiss me again. Hank came upon Bella standing alone in her own secluded clearing. She was a silhouette against an ancient tree behind her, her face obscured by the darkness. Only her ivory neck was visible, touched by a silver sliver of moonlight that had found its way through the treetops. I'm having second thoughts about continuing, she admitted. Hank couldn't help but recall the palpable distance between them since they disembarked from the ship. Was she upset with him, or was it the weight of their mission, or perhaps that claptrap Primcourt's presence? The road ahead is fraught with peril, he offered diplomatically. Bella scoffed. Come now, Hank Bravo, do you really think the threat of a little danger can deter me? Then why do you want to turn back? It's the nightmares, Hank. I now realize they are messages from the Demon King. He's been whispering in my dreams for months. How can you be so sure? She took a ragged breath before answering, as if putting it to words would make it real. I heard his voice tonight, when that dead man spoke. He rejoiced that I was here. He told me to press on, no matter what the rest of you choose to do. A shiver ran down his spine, as if the darkness itself had touched him. He felt the inner beast wrestle against his restraint, urging him to retreat. Then we should listen to that feeling you have, he said, a note of sincerity cutting through his voice. Turn back, Bella. Her eyes ignited, a fiery contrast to the somber night. Is that a dare? No, damn it, he said firmly. We're monster slayers, seasoned in the art of the hunt. But this is different, something beyond what we know emerging from a realm we do not understand. Her voice eased lightly out of her mouth like a tired musician barely touching her bow to the strings. The Demon King is waiting for me. He's waited a long time. That is unsettling, he admitted. A steely resolve came over her. He saw it as she straightened, hands on her pistol handles. I've never shied away from a challenge. I can't turn back now. Why, Bella, why can't you just walk away? He reached out to grasp her hand, and she squeezed his back for the beat of a hummingbird's wings, then all the strength went out of her hand. Her voice was suddenly cold, and he wasn't sure if he'd said something to anger her. Thanks for your concern, but I'll determine my own path forward. She turned and walked back to the fire. Hank watched the jungle for a long time, and endeavoured to put her out of his mind. It was simpler here than anywhere else he'd ever been. The moon was close, calling to him through the trees and the beast hummed along to its song. The life of India had a pulse to it that could never end. It was an enormous, unconquerable organism, and his savage side could attack it forever in a frenzy and not harm it. Or he might just run off into the forest and become one with it. No one would miss him. He clenched a tree branch to ground himself. I'm Hank Bravo, a man. And a fool, Primcourt said. The Brit had stolen up near him, you stay away from Bella. She's my fiance. Hank's lips quirked into a half smile. What are you worried about, Primcourt? If she's your fiance, you have nothing to fear. Hank turned and found the Count of Primcourt clenching his teeth, his hands balled up in fists at his side. 
Do you know why Bella can't leave? It's because of you, Bravo, the man spat. What? The claim flabbergasted him. When they issued the warrant for your arrest, they set the bounty so high that she knew you'd be killed, the end you deserve in my estimation. But when Bella found out about it, she utilized every favor she had to get you pardoned. With the stipulation you agree to join the Fiend Fighters team and travel with us here to India. The one condition your president had was that she must travel here with you and watch you closely to see that you harmed no one and acted in a trustworthy manner. Hank leaned back against a tree, shocked. He wished to deny it, to say something to make it untrue, but he knew Primcourt wouldn't lie about this. She was in danger here because of Hank. Primcourt's punch caught him off guard, a haymaker that might have knocked many a lesser man off his feet. Hank barely noticed, feeling the blood trickling down his nose and across his lips to drip off the end of his chin. At some point, Primcourt went away seeing he'd get no rise out of Hank, but he'd already dealt a blow that had Hank reeling and not with his fist. He remembered her words about him protecting her on the ship. He must keep her alive. She'd face these nightmares and come somewhere she was prophesied to die for him. Did that mean she cared for him still, despite the ring on her finger? Hank ran Primcourt's words through his head and frowned at the dark jungle. The Fiend Fighters. That's a stupid name. Chapter 37 Jane and Ram Jane stayed behind at the stone with Ram, both watching the spot where his ghastly friend had stood. I'm so sorry for your loss, she said, keeping her voice low because it felt like such a pathetic offering. He was an honourable man, saved my life more than once, he told her. What were those things you said to him? That bit about being a servant of the sacred order, of the shield of the sun? Ram told her apologetically, I cannot speak of this except to a select few. Moss said similar phrases to me when she was teaching me. She also told me about the great circle of energy that we're all part of, she said. He turned to her and stepped off the rock. Are you truly of the blood of Merlin? His eyes had the hardness of coal, yet sparkled with life. She found she wanted to either take a step away from him or a step forward. Instead, she split the difference and didn't move an inch. What was wrong with her? Such inappropriate thoughts. She found her voice. I don't know, I'm told I am, but now that I know the sources better, namely Mr. Primcourt and Dr. Frail, I'm not entirely convinced. He smiled, showing off boyish dimples. Was this the first time she'd seen him smile? She couldn't recall. She couldn't recall much at all, really, while he smiled at her. He was looking at her like she was some grand puzzle to figure out. Maybe you are the one who can defeat this great evil, this demon king, he declared. I hope that is so. He has robbed me of most of my family, and now a man who was as close as my own brother. She wasn't sure how to respond to that, so she asked instead, Why is he called the Demon King? I'm not sure I understand. He put a finger into the air as if a lecturer. I think there is a translation and cultural difference here. In the Christian world, demons are the followers of Lucifer. Here, the idea of a demon is more like a monster or perhaps an evil deity. There are many gods and supernatural creatures in India, and some refer to the bad ones as demons. I see. She'd thought that might be the case. They watched the jungle in silence for a time. How she'd hated him only a few days ago, but now it gave her great comfort to know he was close. He had this confidence to him, a steady presence like a reliable clock. Even now, after that shadowy messenger, that walking corpse that had once been his friend, had delivered its ill tidings, he might be shaken, but still resolved. She saw in the thrust of his chin and the set of his posture, tense but controlled the way a tiger stalks, that he would continue. Some people could teach stubbornness to a stone, her father had told her, and she thought that Ram Singh might be such a person. He sat now on the rock and rested his rifle close to hand, his anger controlled. She only knew it was there because of the way he tightened his fingers on the hilt of his sword, clenching it over and over. He asked, Will you go on despite the danger from bandits and snake cultists and other nefarious opponents? She took a long, haggard breath. I should turn back. My mother will take it hard if I am killed. I must continue my family line. An honourable decision. 
I will see you back to the train if you wish it. Hopefully they are still running. She pursed her lips, then told him, I'm not sure I will go back, however. What does a family line mean if it has no honor? And I believe the honorable thing to do is to fight here for my home. His eyebrow rose. Your home? She inclined her head. Yes, India is my home. He rose and gave her a half bow, sweeping one arm back in a quite formal gesture. I guess you are a native as much as I am. His formal way of honoring her surprised her, and she found her hands straying to straighten her vest, and her wishing she wore a dress. She decided suddenly then, I will go on. He stood to his full height, towering over her without meaning to. I'm very glad to hear it, he told her, but his smile had gone away like the sun dropping behind hills, and his eyes were back to being unlit coals. He sighed. That was a very good threat, the corpse gave, about wandering for eternity as a restless spirit. She gave a firm nod of agreement. Yes, one to make all Indians quail and quake in terror. And all transplanted Europeans as well, Ram added. She considered giving him an earful for that remark. She wasn't afraid, not in the slightest. Well, maybe a trifle concerned, but nothing more. Ram frowned deeply. Zothan, the dead man who brought the message, had a wife who died last year in the famines, leaving behind two young children. What will become of the poor dears? Jane asked, feeling a wrench at her heart. Ram said, I will see to his butchers, but he is not the only one whose passing will leave a tale of woe during this expedition. Pushing on means more blood will be spilled. She tried not to be like other British people in their attitudes toward the natives. Her mother called all Indians and others with brown skin blackamoors, excepting only a few, like Mira the nanny, who she treated almost like a faithful dog. But Mother was hardly the only one who thought this way. There was a distinct caste system among the British, just as there was one with the Indians. Only the highest Indian nobility were considered close to the British, but even one of the native Rajas, or perhaps even the great king known as a Maharaja, would be secretly considered of an inferior race. Jane tried hard not to think in such a primitive manner, but she admitted that she found these tendencies or presuppositions in herself. For instance, Ram caring for the family of Zothan surprised her, and her face coloured as she felt shame for thinking him less than he was. Every time she expected base, primitive behaviour from him, she found herself wrong. Perhaps part of it was the attack on the estate and the murder of her brother. That had only been a week past. Or had it been longer? No. It had been two weeks, she realised. She was losing track of days since they'd started this trek. The days blended into one another. Regardless of the amount of time, however, the sting of betrayal from those she had trusted still pained her like a fresh wound. Harry had been an unfeeling ass much of the time, yet, in his own way, had cared very much for those around him, and hadn't deserved to die. After all, none had starved among those who worked for him, could it be that a person was just a person, that the decisions they made defined them, not skin colour or culture? These were not popular thoughts in her world. In fact, many would have thought her liberal in the extreme were she to voice such an opinion. For now she turned to more immediate concerns. How many of the men will we lose tomorrow? she asked. He shrugged and shook his head, his face locked in a scowl. I don't know. I will attempt to encourage them to continue but I don't have much hope of success. She suspected that in the morning they would find some of the servants, and maybe even a sepoy or two, had run away overnight. To put it in perspective for herself, she wondered what she'd do if Satan sent one of his demons to threaten her. That was the equivalent of what had happened. As Ram had said, Indians lived their lives surrounded by omens and portents, and the threats from the creature could not have gotten much worse. The servants and most of the sepoys were Hindus, meaning they believed they were constantly being reborn, attempting to improve their status. Depending on how well they lived, they either came back as something better or something worse. The shadow corpse had threatened that they would never be reborn and would never have a chance to reach the highest heavens. Or was that right? She tried to recall what she'd learned, then realized it didn't matter right now, not to her anyway. Some would go, and some would stay, and there wasn't a thing she could do about it. Ram's lip took on a sober line. Moss will be pleased with our progress with your meditation. 
I will be able to report to her I have done my best, despite you fighting me every step of the way. She gave him a scathing look, but couldn't maintain it as she realized his remark had some merit. She'd made his task more onerous than it might have been otherwise. Opening her mouth to apologize, she instead asked, Do you think I can be a wizard like Merlin? It's difficult to say, he replied. He looked her over critically, face set in an evaluating frown, as if inspecting one of his soldiers at a dress formation. You don't look much like a wizard. Is that so, she asked, voice filled with righteous indignation. Perhaps if we get you a magic wand. He brought his hands up and made a triangle shape on top of his head. And one of those pointed hats. His lips quirked into a smile, the dimples coming back. She found, despite herself, that she smiled back. Chapter 38. The Village. The next day passed in much the same way for the expedition as they burrowed deeper into the hinterlands. Only Radu, Hank, and Nimrod seemed untouched by the loads they carried. Even with his wolf-added endurance and strength, however, Hank grew tired of the pack which dug at his back, and of taking his turns to carry one end of the bearer poles, hauling frail's infernal crates and bags. And he was not the only one. There was quite a bit of grousing about it. But the most amusing moment of the day came from their resident giant. Nimrod suddenly set his end down and growled, The bugs are eating me alive! Hank, who was on the other end, felt the weight lurch and tilt and slam against his back. What's the idea behind just dropping the load like that, you cretin? He whirled to find Nimrod wiping an entire colony, it seemed, of enormous white ants from his neck and legs. Hank stepped over and helped the big man clean the bugs from his clothing, slapping at them. Get off me, you lout! Nimrod finally bellowed, and Hank went back to his end of the poles with a grin. He studied the big brute and realized he had some affection for the man. Nimrod clearly had the goal of changing his ways, and Hank found it admirable. He promised himself he'd be kinder to the man in his dealings with him. They ate a cold noon meal in a quiet glade, none having the energy to speak much beyond necessity. Far too soon, they pressed on again and trudged along for hours, the jungle and the path never ending until a rich valley of cultivated fields appeared through the vines ahead, along with the lazy lifting smoke of several cook fires. A shared sigh of relief rippled through the group. Signs of civilization, however humble, meant potential rest and refuge for their weary bodies. I suggest we stow our belongings here on top of this hill. It is far enough away to offer some distance if the villagers are not friendly and we have to run back here, but close enough we can easily retrieve them when it is time to journey on, Ram said. The others concurred and they made a less than tidy pile of the gear and veered toward the village, leaving behind a detachment of sepoy guards and some of the servants. With daylight fading, the weary travellers yearned for anything different than trudging through the wilds. A glittering lake appeared, the glassy moss-green surface reflecting the burnished hues of fading day. Tucked against the shore stood a small village, thatched rooftops, looked over by towering coconut palms, swaying in the evening breeze. And amazingly there were people working in rice paddies and fields. One elder raised a hand to welcome them from across the lake. I know this is silly, but I feel as if we haven't seen people in weeks, Jane proclaimed, all signs of her weakness having departed, apparently. Hank unexpectedly found the sight of people moving about their daily lives a salve to his mood as well. I agree completely, Miss Avon, he said, even though it's only been a week at most. Hank felt like one of those old-time explorers who'd been months away from any form of habitation and suddenly spied a clue that they were not the only dwellers on the earth. As the expedition members stiffly stretched and rubbed at sore limbs, the elderly villager who'd raised a hand came out to meet them, Ram whispered, I'm not sure I speak the language here, but I'll do my best. Don't they all speak the same tongue, the Indians? Primcourt asked. Jane snorted. There are many languages and peoples that make up India. Ram stepped forward and called out a greeting to reassure the village elder. After a brief exchange, the elder nodded and Ram turned back to them. Ah, he understands Hindi, he said, his brow glistening with sweat. The village itself was good-sized, sprawling in the low places where a trio of hills met, 
though it was hard to gauge population or exactly how large it was, since it was interspersed with jungle and dozens of palm trees. Low thatch and packed clay homes lined dirt roads, sprouting patches of grass. Tethered goats stood in front yards and sheep milled in crude pens. The traces of everyday rural life comforted the travellers, reminding them that humanity endured even in this isolated wilderness. Surprisingly, they found a hybrid of eastern and western elements as they looked over the place. Some structures followed traditional designs, open-aired buildings using natural materials, but others displayed British touches, angular roofs, glass windows, painted doors in the style of cottage country manors. There must be a company agent here, good show. I'll have to find him, Primcourt said. I'd kill for a brandy and a little touch of civilized comfort. Villagers began congregating, staring and murmuring. Most eyed the foreigners with unveiled curiosity, but Hank detected hints of apprehension on a few tense faces. Considering their remote location and the unrest in the countryside, it was unsurprising residents might react warily. The headman spread his arms wide and spoke. Ram provided a quick translation. He welcomes us to their village and apologizes that their accommodations will be quite modest. The headman smiled broadly and added something else with effusive gestures at the surrounding homes. I inquired about Padmapur, the village that was empty. He says that the people went away after some rebels began to stir up trouble, Ram interpreted. Primcourt stepped forward, ask him if he knows about the attacks on the towns. I have, and he confirms it is the forces of the bandit Thakur Thapa. The headman says the man has gathered many men since there is a new government. Primcourt blustered at that. There isn't a new government. Now Thapa's burning company towns on the orders of rebel leaders, Ram said, after the headman spoke for a bit longer. You tell him there's no new government, Primcourt ordered. I won't, Ram replied. It won't do any good and might actually harm him should he repeat it to any of the rebels. Primcourt ground his teeth. Ask him about carts. Ram spoke some more with the headman. He says they have no carts, but that we are welcome to rest here before continuing our journey. We will be honoured guests. Yes. Specifically, he mentioned that the friends of Prince Ram Singh will be treated with honour, Jane added. Ram didn't seem to enjoy the attention, but he nodded once. No, we'll stop for dinner, but then we are off to the river, Primcourt replied. Ram listened some more to the headman and then translated, He says that the way to the river is difficult in the darkness. Dangerous, even. He suggests we remain here until morning. No, not after what we saw back near the train station. We won't stop and rest while people are dying, Primcourt responded. It was the first time that he had expressed any regret over leaving the ravaged towns behind, Ram felt a sudden bout of comradeship for the Count, who was only trying to do what he thought was right. Very well, he says they will feed us and then give us the guidance we need, Ram said. And the agent? Primcourt asked. After a brief back and forth, Ram informed him. They say there is no longer an agent here. He went away when the trouble started. Damn, Primcourt said. Will it be safe to stay here even long enough to partake of a meal? Clara asked. Hank considered that. They'd seen no sign of the bandits. We'll need rest before we reach the river, Ram said. We should at least eat here. I agree, my feet are in a sorry state, Primcourt admitted begrudgingly. With arrangements somewhat settled, the headman energetically called out instructions to the crowd. A group of young women in vibrantly hued saris hurried over, jabbering excitedly to each other, noting Ram's hesitancy. The headman gave assurances that the girls wished only to guide the guests to the village square where the community was gathering to welcome the visitors. Reassured, their expedition fell into step behind the chattering guides. The girls giggled and smiled back at them. Hank found their youthful enthusiasm infectious after the sight of the burning towns. Even Nimrod cracked the faintest grin at their friendly, incomprehensible chit-chat. The procession wound through the darkened streets, passing houses where people peered at them curiously. As they entered the village square, they found an open-walled company warehouse that stood empty near a sturdy stone well. Next to it burned the beginnings of an enormous bonfire. Orange flames crackled merrily. Locals smiled broadly, their hands extended in greeting as they emerged from pools of shadow. In this heat, who needs a fire? Nimrod complained noisily. 
Low tables awaited them, bowls steaming with rice and the flat, unleavened bread called chapati, which was present at every meal, as well as colourful vegetables and other mouth-watering dishes redolent with heady spices. I'm famished and this looks excellent, Hank said. A good meal can turn the whole day around, Radu agreed. The rest of their group seemed to concur. They took seats of honour on reed mats without needing any encouragement and began to eat. Even aloof Nimrod tore into the meal with gusto. Hank especially enjoyed the hollowed gourds holding a yogurt drink with potent spices that made his eyes water, but his lips smack in appreciation. Meanwhile, village girls performed graceful dances to the quiet melody of sitars and tambourines, their bare feet tapping complex rhythms in the dirt. Mesmerized by the hypnotic movements, Hank found himself transported, forgetting the arduous miles behind and unknown miles yet ahead. For now there was only this fire, this feast, this community offering unexpected succor in the wilderness. As melodies transitioned seamlessly from one traditional song to the next, the headman moved to stand before the flames. Raising his hands, he addressed the gathering in a resonant tone. Ram leaned in to translate the man's words. He welcomes us to this blessed land that has nourished their people since ancient days. The headman began a long tale while Ram translated. Hank soon lost interest in its winding, confusing mythology. It was something about the creation of the world and beasts and half-snake men. Bella settled in next to him. I'm anxious to move on, though I must admit I didn't expect to end the day with feasting, she said with some warmth. She'd mostly avoided him to this point, and he wasn't sure what the sudden change in mood meant. She was like early spring weather. It was hard to know if there would be ice, heat, bluster, or a day filled with beautiful sunshine. He cleared his throat. Bella, I would like to speak with you. And I you, but not tonight. We still have a long march ahead of us before we can make camp. Perhaps tomorrow. Several of the villagers gathered in a circle around them, dancing sinuously along with the music. People came and went. They all were strangers to him, but Hank noticed one young woman with a bright red headscarf disappear into a hut, then come out again only a few moments later, joining the dance with a large grin. He says that the great shadow snake protects them from the demons, Ram droned on. At a thunderous clap from the village headman, the music stopped. The villagers halted their dance. Only the crackle of the fire made any noise at all. The headman pointed a bony finger at his guests, and his lips peeled back in a savage snarl. Something's wrong, Nimrod observed. Suddenly, one of the sepoys who was speaking with a comely young woman was choking, clutching at a knife that she plunged into his breast. Hank thought it must be some accident, but the beast thought differently. They were in a trap. The headman bellowed out words that Hank didn't need to have translated. The people of the village all drew weapons, purpose-built or improvised, whatever sharp thing they had close to hand, and raised them high overhead, facing their surrounded visitors. Chapter 39 Ambush Ram called out, Defend yourselves! What's happening? Jane hissed, apparently in shock. Ram strode to her side, his sword out. The sepoys were in some trouble. Several of the village girls who'd led them here had been circulating among them, and now they attacked the confused sepoys with concealed blades. Hank saw other shapes closing in, dark on one side and firelit on the other. The villagers' faces, where they were visible, shone with maniacal glee while they held aloft gleaming blades. Thump! His blood! The wolf was there, so much larger than normal, inspired and grander because of their current predicament. Raw, untempered power flowed through him. He may as well not have consumed any of the elixir at all. Blades flashed in the gloom as the murderous villagers converged toward the square from all directions. Hank counted nearly two dozen bent shapes stalking from the surrounding alleys and between houses, their hands gripping knives, hatchets and rusty swords. He glimpsed flashes of Nimrod unleashing his vicious might against three attackers, while Frail protected a frightened Clara, swinging a chair wildly against encroaching foes. Bella also joined the action, firing her pistols into two men charging at her, dropping them both. It had been foolish to trust so blindly, but the villagers' guile had been perfect. Now the expedition was in desperate trouble. 
How can we survive such an ambush? Jane called out in distress. Let's discuss it once we're out of this mess, Hank responded with a swagger he didn't feel. Their only hope was to withstand the maddened horde threatening to engulf them. Primcourt fired his pistol, downing a screeching villager racing for him. With a piercing battle cry, Ram launched himself at the nearest attackers while wielding his golden orange tiger blade. Ducking a wild machete slash, he cut the man down without even looking at him, dropping him howling into the dirt. Pivoting, Ram struck down a torch-wielding assailant next. He was a whirlwind with a sharp edge, and where he lashed out, men died. Hank also dove into the frenetic melee, shoving down the beast's desires to be unleashed. His blade became a blur amidst the confusion, parrying strikes and slicing into exposed limbs when opportunities arose. He attempted only to incapacitate where possible. These were not hardened warriors after all, but only men, women and children, driven to maddened fury by who knew what means. What savage bloodlust has stirred them to such murderous ferocity, he called out when there was a moment's respite. I should have listened to the headman's tale, Ram said, while slashing a man who was poking at him with a spear. He kept mentioning the protection of the Shadow God and the fury of the Naga, Snake Men, but I thought it was just him speaking of old village legends. Now, I think this village is in league with our enemies. Whatever their reasoning, the ambushes kept coming, their raw numbers seeming to multiply as all vestiges of compassion or conscience fell away, leaving only wild murder in their eyes. They had become a faceless horde, mere obstructions to be eluded or struck down. The expedition members became separated, and Hank realized he was fighting within a small island of space beside Ram and Jane, while around them seethed a mass of blade-wielding foes. Back to back, they formed a ragged ring of steel and fury, slashing and stomping at every villager within reach. But still, the ambushes kept coming, passing fallen comrades without a glance to hurl themselves against the tightening noose. Clara cried out as a hurled rock glanced off her temple, opening a gash that streamed crimson down her ashen cheek. Only Frail's sturdy grip kept her from collapsing into the trampling mob that would show no mercy. Bella and Primcourt were with them, offering what protection they could. Bella held her sword, and Hank felt pity for anyone foolish enough to step in her way. On all sides the night came alive with aggression and pain, a feral madness goading the villagers toward greater depravity. It seemed only a matter of time before fury and attrition overwhelmed the bleary-eyed members of the expedition. We must break through and make for the jungle, Ram shouted over the din, but there was scarce space to breathe between the encircling bodies, let alone attempt an escape. A pack of attackers thrust into their midst, savagely striking down a sepoy, and once again cutting off Jane, Ram and Hank from the others. In the pandemonium, the three of them traversed across one street and into another muddy lane, trying to get back to their friends. Where did all these people come from? Jane asked. Hank thought it a clever inquiry. They'd only seen forty villagers when they entered. Now, there were a hundred at least. A pair of bedraggled sepoys fought their way over to Ram, gasping for air. Come, let's get to Frail and the others, Hank motioned on, raising his arm with effort. Then light blossomed behind the mob billowing flames of grass roofs catching fire. Hank wasn't sure what had started the fires, but they spread quickly, and soon thick smoke hung about the village, while each house had become a pyre. As waves of heat forced the team into a tightening radius, a massive form bulled through the press from behind. Villagers ricocheted off Nimrod's imposing bulk, as the taciturn brute stomped steadily toward his beleaguered companions, flinging down any impediments with casual swats. Hank swore he saw a blade glance off the brute's temple, with no effect. A nail-studded club hit Hank on the shoulder. He barely felt it, his adrenaline surging like a tidal wave. But the wolf inside him felt it, and it roared to life. His bones cracked and rearranged themselves, the pain both excruciating and exhilarating. His muscles swelled, each fibre twitching as if charged with the power of lightning, stretching his skin taut. His hands elongated and grew into fearsome claws, the nails hardening into vicious talons. The transformation snaked up his arms, his biceps and triceps bulging as if pumped full of molten steel. His clothing strained against his expanding form, fabric tearing and giving way. Thick, coarse fur sprouted all over his body, 
completing his transformation. Hank was no more. In his place stood a creature of primal ferocity, a werewolf unleashed. The villagers, once so eager in their pursuit, paused, their faces drained of colour. Hank, now the wolf, growled, a sound so low and menacing it seemed to shake the very ground beneath them. They had unleashed a monster, now they must pay the price. Chapter 40 Unleash the Wolf Jane watched in horror as a burly villager, wielding a menacing nail-studded club, struck Mr. Bravo. A shudder rippled through Hank, followed by a guttural howl that silenced the chaos around them. His eyes turned to her, and she saw they blazed with a golden glow, just as she'd seen them on the day he had saved her. She had not believed it then, but she believed it now. The present fighting stopped with his monstrous bellow, all in the courtyard regarding him with dread as he transformed into a beast. Jane had once watched a cocoon for several days as a child. An ugly, fat little green caterpillar had gone into it. What came out, however, was a beautiful butterfly of gold, purple and red. A similar change happened here, yet in the opposite way. The handsome Mr. Bravo's skin and limbs stretched and popped, they twisted, Fur grew out of his paws, his mouth grew into a long muzzle. He called out in savage pain, his body arching. Then he was part wolf, part man, a werewolf. Jane saw Primcourt out of the corner of her eye. He was not surprised, nor were Bella or Frail, though the latter looked excited at viewing such an event. The big villager who'd struck Mr. Bravo came back to his senses all at once and drew back his weapon for another strike, but the wolf leaped forward and cut the man down with a single vicious slice of a claw that spilled much in the way of his necessaries onto the ground. And then the ambushers were mostly racing away, screaming, while the village burned and a werewolf stalked among them, killing without discrimination. Come, hurry, let us go, Ram said, grabbing her hand. He yanked her away towards the trees. The others followed. She looked back and saw the hulking wolf bound at a man and rip out his throat with its strong jaws. They ran on, each group taking different paths. She and Ram were alone again, suddenly, and on to another street. How did this damnable place get so large? It was just a little village, she muttered. It seemed no matter which way they turned, there was another street filled with burning huts. Clack, clack, clack. Claws scraped on the hard-tack dirt of the streets nearby. A pair of villagers with long-handled farming scythes leapt to attack a dark, furry form. There was a furious mix of blade and claw. Then both men were down, and the wolf was panting, gazing around for other targets. Ram silently pulled Jane away from the scene. They ran out onto another street, and... There was the werewolf. A handful of darkly clad attackers emerged from the shadows. Cultists, and the werewolf was among them, this time scrapping against much better opponents. Where in blazes did those cultists come from? Ram asked. I wager they were here all along, waiting to aid in the ambush, Jane replied. She pulled Ram away this time. Let's go! Finally they reached the outskirts of the village, and Jane stole a glance back. Her heart sank as she saw the werewolf, Hank, lock eyes with her. For a moment she felt an indescribable connection, as if he recognised her. Then his eyes narrowed, and he bounded toward her with a feral intensity. Hide, Ram whispered as he pushed her behind a hut, then turned to face the creature with his tiger sword ready. I am a servant of the light. I am a protector of the innocent, Ram called out, his voice shaking. The werewolf came on. It scrabbled across the distance unnaturally fast. There was no chance that Ram could stop it. Well, she was not going to let Ram die. She stepped out onto the street next to him and raised her pistol. No, Jane, flee, Ram ordered. We'll face it together, she told him. She tried to summon her magic. She wasn't sure what she could do with it, but she tried to calm herself and work one of the forms that Moss had shown her. The energies did not appear. Her heart thumped in her breast. She forgot the magic and fired something more tangible, her pistol. This new weapon that Frail had given her had very small bullets, but the discharge was powerful enough and she thought she hit the creature with her shot. If it was injured by her attack, it gave no sign, other than to skid to a halt, sniffing the air. Jane held her breath. 
keeping the little metal pin sight trained on the breast of the creature, ready to fire again. After what seemed an eternity, the werewolf released a frustrated growl and dashed away. Jane's heart pounded as she watched him disappear into the dense jungle, his howl piercing the night sky, almost as if bidding farewell to his human life. She and Ram looked at one another. I must go after him, Ram said in a low, grim tone, and kill him. Why? Jane asked, though she thought she knew. It was as Moss had told her. This was a creature against the natural order. It is my duty, he replied. It is mine as well, she answered him. Moss gave me that charge, she added, in order to forestall his refusal, which she was sure would come next. His face was reticent, but he simply told her, You know your own mind. If you wish to join me, then come, but we must move fast and quiet. And if I tell you to run, you must run. When I tell you to hide, you will hide. She nodded, looking at the unforgiving jungle ahead of them with reluctance. But when Ram plunged into it, she followed, feeling the kiss of the thick bushes as she breached the wall that delineated the village from the wilds. The others emerged from the village at about the same time and raced along the road leading up the hill toward their belongings. Nimrod was last of all, dragging a wounded sepoy. A black-clad snake cultist stepped out from a darkened hut and raised a musket. Watch out, Bella yelled to Nimrod, raising her two repeating pistols. The cultist fired. Nimrod spun and fell, carrying the sepoy down with him. Bella fired in return with both pistols, letting go with three shots each, and the cultist staggered back into the shadows of the hut, clutching at his chest. He fell, one unmoving black boot in the road. Primcourt, Radu, and a few of the sepoys went to help Nimrod and the wounded sepoy. Get your hands off me, I'm fine, Nimrod bellowed as they tried to raise him to his feet. He let them take their wounded comrade while he brushed himself off and walked calmly toward the others, showing no sign of wounds. I thought that shot struck you, Mr. O'Toole, Clara said with wonder. I'm flattered at your concern, he said with a wink which made her scowl. But as you can see, sweetheart, I'm right as rain. He turned about showing her his back, and there was no blood or obvious wound. He had several holes in his shirt, but all of their clothing was the worst for wear after the close calls in the village. Hurry, let's be on our way, Primcourt ordered. He had a bloody gash on his cheek. Where are the lieutenant and Miss Avon? Radu asked. One of the sepoys pointed at the black wall of jungle lining the road. They went in after the Beh Daya Sahib. Bediya, what is that? Primcourt inquired snappily. Speak plainly now, man. The wolf, the sepoy answered. We must go to help the prince. Dark shapes gathered at the edge of the village, many breathing heavily, some covered in blood. They watched the members of the expedition. They'll come after us, Bella said, reloading her pistols. She found she loved these multi-chambered guns. Not super accurate, perhaps, but few firearms were. Yes, we must get to safety, Primcourt ordered. Are you going after the prince, Saib? A sepoy asked. Primcourt replied, No, I must get these people to safety, then we'll come back for the prince. He pointed up the road. We'll defend the hill where we dropped our provisions. The sepoy seemed conflicted. He rattled on with his peers for a full minute. A crazed man raced out of the village with a raised curved blade. He was bare-chested and covered in blood. Bella waited until he was close and shot him, this snapped the sepoys out of their indecision. One of them declared, Very good, Sahib. Lead on. What about Hank? Sir Radu asked. He'll have to fend for himself, Primcourt replied. He don't look like he needs any help to me, Nimrod assured him. Sir Radu dug inside his own pack, which he'd carried down with him into the village, and removed an aging ringmail hauberk, like something that should be in a museum. It was partly corroded, rusted from the wet air, the cloth surcoat over the top torn and dingy. What are you doing, Radu? Don your armour later, Primcourt ordered, glancing back with interest at the village. We need to make haste. Go without me, I'll find Henry Bravo and bring him to you. The knight pulled the heavy armour coat over his head. But he'll surely rip you to shreds, Clara said. There's savage maniacs everywhere, Radu, Nimrod called out. Take care of him, Sir Radu, Bella said. The knight waved at them and strode toward the thick trees. That monster will kill him. Frail said. Bella shook her head. I don't believe he will, at least not permanently. Confused, Frail and Clara shared a look, 
but then off they went, while Radu traipsed into the jungle, heading deeper into the wilderness, as the haunting howl of a werewolf resonated in the distance, accompanied by the eerie glow of the burning village reflecting off the tree line. Despite it only being perhaps three quarters of a mile away, they were all weary and it was dark, so that the walk around the lake and up the hill took them a full hour. No one pursued them that they detected, and Primcourt and Nimrod had kept a close look behind them. Out of breath and legs having lost all their strength, the members of the expedition were thankful when they reached the small cleared hill where the servants, a handful of sepoys and their provisions, waited. Bella grabbed Primcourt's arm. I'm going back to get the others. He turned and tried to see her eyes under the brim of the hat in the black, but could make out little. He felt like a coward for not going himself, but the truth was that Bella was twice the fighter he was, and he knew it, and that was being generous to himself. He just wished he knew whether she was going to help everyone, or just to help Hank. Very well, please be careful, he told her. Frail brought Bella a bag filled with curious mushroom-looking bulbs on sticks. Do you see these little cords? Pull one and throw the thing, and it will pop with a flash of light that will last for more than a minute. But do not look at it or you'll be blinded. She hesitantly took the bag and thanked him, but he wasn't finished. He handed her a metallic canister, about the size of a loaf of bread, which had a rubber nozzle on the end. He helped her attach the straps connected to it over her shoulders. This will emit a concentrated blast of flame. When you first open the valve here, he tapped the point where the rubber nozzle joined the metal tube now on her back, then you will depress the lever here on the emitter handle. She was shocked to say the least. A blast of flame? Yes, the flame will only last for a few seconds at the most, but it will cover a good thirty feet in a sticky burning gel. Unsure about such a gift but not wanting to waste time, she told him, Well, thank you, Doctor. Frail beamed, and even in the dark she could see his white teeth. Two of the sepoys joined Bella. We will return with you to find the Raja, one of them said. She nodded at them, not feeling particularly brave about going back. She felt somewhat comforted when one of them muttered a nervous prayer. Primcourt was not excited about the prospect of her returning into the madness either. What's your plan? he asked her. She gave one of her lopsided smiles and said, What plan? Chapter 41. Stalking the Wolf. Jane felt no shame as she instinctively groped for Ram's hand, as soon as they entered the jungle, and found that he'd also reached for her. It is dark as the pit of hell in this jungle, Ram whispered very close to her ear, and Jane swallowed at his nearness, though she agreed with his assessment. The darkness was like a living thing that pushed down upon them, a blanket of suffocating shadow. Everything is strange in jungle like this, he told her, Keep hold of my hand while we are in this thickest part. I'm afraid if we separate even by a pace or two, we might lose one another. She nodded, though she knew he could not see it. Very well, she said, as if reluctant. Though once they'd agreed that this was their method, she felt better and let him guide her along while her eyes adjusted. He held tree branches away from her so that they did not slash at her and took the brunt of the bushes so that she might pass through unharmed. Soon they came into a thinner patch, and she could see well enough that it was no longer necessary to grip his hand. Still, she held on, not wishing to forgo the comfort of it. A low-pitched howl echoed through the forest. It came from very close, and they both stopped, trying to make out any signs of movement or to look for those eyes the colour of the moon. Once there was a crash in the trees, but neither saw anything in the gloom. Jane thought it might have originated some good distance from where they stood. Behind them vegetation rustled, and boots clomped, and they hurried to press against a banyan tree as several loping shapes ran past on the other side, carrying flickering torches. A few muttered incoherently, and she thought they must be some of the crazed villagers. The mad babbling of the group sank right into her, and she shivered, wishing she could see better. She closed her eyes, shaking, then rattled off the spoken spells Moss had taught her. It was calming to list them off. The language soothed her. She repeated them over and over. Finally, she saw Ram clearly, pushed back against the tree, his sword blade held half raised so that he might slash it down on any who might discover them. I can see you, she whispered. He glanced round at her, his eyes searching and not able to find her. 
How? It is blacker than tar in here. She glanced at her arms, seeing the goosebumps, and realized the magic had caught hold of her. Somehow she'd adjusted her vision so that she could see better, using arcane power, as she had the night with the leopard. She recalled then that Moss had told her she could control her senses with one of the phrases, though she'd heard so much that night it hadn't really been of import until now. Magic, I surmise, she said. Her whole body felt light, like a bird. It was absolutely the wrong time to do it, but she reached out and touched his face. He jerked back but then stopped, reaching up to grasp her fingers. He held her hand there for a moment, clasped in his larger, strong grip. Then he let her go. She pulled her hand away and he smiled. Wait, I can see as well, Ram told her very close to her ear. His grin faded to a look of puzzlement. That made her shiver again, his breath so close to her skin. Oh, did you turn on a light? You must put that out, Ram said. And she looked down, and a glowing white ball floated near her hand. It looked like a very small moon. Oh, that is not the thing, not the thing at all, she proclaimed. Put it out, Ram whispered more forcefully. I'm not aware of how it happened, and I don't have the faintest idea how to put it out. The ball sparked and vibrated for a moment. She recalled when Moss tried to make a second one, the same thing had happened, but then both had died. She thought the same tactic might work for her. Closing her eyes again, she whispered all the spells Moss had taught her. Then a second ball popped into existence. There's another one that's not helping, Ram told her. She opened her eyes, expecting them both to wink out as Moss's had, but no, they both glowed with strong light. Oh, hell, she swore. You there, a voice bellowed. It was a pair of snake cultists, starkly lit, the hollows of their eyes and cheeks in dark shadow. One held a long musket, the other was armed with one of those thin pipes that blew darts out of the end. Ram raised his pistol and fired, and the two cultists dove behind trees, the one with the long gun blasting away at them. Ram dragged her to the back side of the banyan. The glowing balls followed. She fired her own pistol and heard the satisfying thunk of her bullet striking solid wood near the two cultists. For a moment she thought she needed to reload it and then remembered that it was multi-chambered. Instead, she began to count her shots. One. In front of her, a trio of muddy shapes stirred like clumps of dirt rising from the ground and trudged towards them. These were no cultists. In fact, they might not have been people at all. They stood the height of children, but were formed all of mud and tree branches. When they drew close enough, one opened its mouth and revealed sharp fangs. She must do something to stop them. What are those? she asked. Ram turned back and flinched. I haven't the barest notion. Don't look friendly, though, do they? She concurred with his assessment. She must stop them. She must stop all of their enemies, but what could she do with the magic? She didn't know. She tried to recall the different cold spells she'd read in Frail's book. Thankfully, she possessed a fine memory for recall and had practiced them all many times now. She spoke one quietly. A slick of ice formed on the path in front of the three creatures. It was flat, unmarred, and blue and white. It shot down like a sunbeam from one of the glowing channel balls near her, though it consisted of a blue filmy smoke rather than the light of the sun, and it took no energy to do it. Behind them, the man with the long musket fired another shot and cracked a limb of the banyan near Ram. Ram fired back. One of the creatures reached the ice and stepped onto it without slowing. Its foot squeaked, losing its purchase. Then the other foot came down as well, and both slipped. The creature tried to remain upright, legs kicking front and back, but it fell and hit its head on the ice, which shattered into a thousand shards. Jane raised her pistol and fired at another of the creatures. She thought her shot hit. There was a kind of sucking sound on impact, and the creature staggered, but then continued its slow pace towards them. She'd fired two shots, or was it three? She couldn't recall. She muttered the words from the book again, and more ice formed. She needed something else to happen, for it to... What? To project? She tried the spell again, and felt a difference. A misshapen ball of ice the size of an orange fruit shot out of one of the glowing magic balls, smacking into one of the mud creatures. It hissed and staggered and scratched at its face, tearing mud and brush away as it pulled off the ice. Then the man with the blowgun leapt out of a shadow and raised his tube, pointing it at Ram. 
What had been a slow, controlled, thought-out process before became an instantaneous expulsion of words and a speeding ball of ice raced across the distance to smash into the cultist. Ice went in the dart tube, splitting the end open. The force hurled him backwards and his head smacked against a trunk with a sickening crunch. He fell bonelessly. Meanwhile, the musket wielder charged from his hiding place and levelled his own weapon. Without pause, Ram shot him through the heart and he collapsed, sputtering and grasping at his chest. Jane and Ram sagged against the tree, glad to be unhurt. Then she asked him breathlessly, What do we do about those things? She pointed at the muddy, childlike figures still coming on. You appear to be managing capably, Ram answered. I haven't the slightest idea what I'm doing, she replied, but then thought that appraisal of her own skill in error. She was remembering things and using them. She'd known when she fired that ball of ice at the cultist what was going to happen when she thought the words. But how had she compressed it all like that? How had she fired it in the blink of an eye? She wasn't sure she could reproduce the effort. Ram charged forward and sliced at one of the creatures, chopping its hand away, then stepped back near her. Take that, you infernal creature, he said, with some satisfaction in his tone. Simultaneously, Jane closed her eyes and recited again the spell she suspected had brought her magic channels to life. Pop! Another appeared. She felt it. When she opened her eyes, she thought she would see them all sputter, ready to wink out. But no, three of them hung near her, all going strong. How can I have so many going at one time? She asked in wonder, though she knew it was not the best time to find out she could do such a thing. Oh, that is not what I'd prefer to happen, Ram said dryly, but he was not speaking to her. She saw that the creature whose hand he'd cut off was growing another one, while all three of the things lumbered toward them. Perhaps it is time to put some distance twixt us and these mud monsters, she proposed. Yes, I think it might be, he answered. They ran. Chapter 42 Sir Radu The moonlit jungle loomed before Radu, dark and foreboding, and somewhere in its trackless depths, his friend Henry Bravo roamed in the grip of the werewolf's savage curse. As Radu entered the wilds, he reflected on how extraordinary it was that he now found himself in this strange land so far from his native Transylvania. Though centuries had passed since his undead life began, he'd never ventured outside the familiar Carpathian mountains and forests. Nothing could have prepared him for the wonders he had witnessed since joining Hank on this perilous quest. He had sailed on a ship propelled by steam, gliding across the water at an exhilarating pace, not in the least hindered by either wind or current, and now he stood in India, an exhilarating and confounding realm. He'd ridden metal beasts that raced on iron tracks through the countryside, seen birds of every colour of the rainbow, and eaten delectable dishes he'd never dreamed existed. And foremost, he had beheld the kaleidoscope of humanity itself, more diverse than anything his limited worldview could have envisioned. There were so many types of people in this exotic land. He marvelled at them, marvelled at it all. Yet perils abounded in this far-flung place as well. More than once unfriendly forces set upon them. Radu's ancient sword had tasted blood and evil magic alike beneath these distant constellations. But such philosophical musings must wait, now Radu required his trusty pommel drake. The knight paused, gazing upon the wall of blackness awaiting him, the impenetrable jungle like a living fortress barring passage. The snaking vines and towering trunks seemed woven to bewilder travellers, and somewhere in its mist-blanketed depths Hank needed his help. Though fearsome in the archaic tales of his own era, the forests of Transylvania could not rival the primordial menace of this jungle, no mortal swordsman could expect to carve a path through such a colossus easily, nor evade the fanged predators that stalked its verdant floors. Yet for Hank, Radu would dare to try. No matter the dangers, he would devise a way. His oath went beyond sworn duty or hollow honour. His friend had stood stalwart against the dark hellhounds threatening to endlessly consume Radu's body. He deserved no less in return. Do not worry, comrade, I'm coming, he whispered. With blade in hand, Radu slipped through the unfathomable jungle, 
Thorny vines clawed at his chainmail, snarled roots threatened to snare his feet with every step. The mighty trees themselves seemed poised to smother interlopers in their ancient embrace. No moonlight penetrated the canopy's strangling tangle. In fact, very little light existed at all. Thankfully, he brought his own, his eyes shining like lanterns once he'd pulled his spectacles up to rest on his forehead. Radu severed vines and tore roots from his path like gnarled fingers grasping at his ankles. Pommeldrake cleaved through leaf and branch alike, littering the forest floor with mulch and woody shrapnel. Still the primal jungle contested each yard, as if a sentient beast. Yet on he pushed into the fetid heat, grasping darkness, and whatever hidden horrors lay in wait. Finally he came out onto a trail where the forest thinned somewhat, though it stayed as black as the deepest cave inside. Chittering, nocturnal creatures clung to the boughs above, their glowing eyes and rustling movements unnerving after so much unnatural quiet. Radu ignored them, focused only on deciphering the web of sights and sounds for any trace of Hank. Somewhere ahead, his companion did battle with the raging beast within. Eventually, he stumbled upon a swathe of destruction that heralded his friend's path. Splintered branches and trampled foliage suggested a reckless passage carved through the flora. Radu followed in the wake until he stumbled upon a scene of slaughter that brought him to a sudden halt. In a small clearing lay the corpses of three cultists, their blood-drenched robes bearing the serpentine iconography of the shadow worshippers. They'd been gutted, shattered limbs jutted at grotesque angles, the results of pure savagery. The metallic scent of spilled blood hung heavy in the air. Radu stooped to examine the crumpled assassins. Rigor had not yet set in. This carnage was freshly wrought. The wolf's trail remained hot, but so too did that of the cultists. Radu's search must quicken. He ventured deeper into the oppressive jungle. The wolf's scored tracks were easy to follow now. Dark furrows gouged into the earth by vicious claws unconcerned with stealth. But other signs suggested the boots of cultists now stalked the grim werewolf. When the clomp of boots sounded behind him, he whirled and spotted distant sparks of torchlight between the vine-choked boughs. He slipped into the undergrowth. Moments later, a dozen robed cultists materialized from the gloom, their blades gleaming. Radu held silent and still, and the figures slipped past his hiding spot, unaware of the concealed night. Stealing himself, he stalked the party from the rear, using the jungle's many shadows to conceal his presence. Still, he dared not fall too far behind. What most concerned him was that the cultists might find his friend turn back into an exhausted man. If that occurred, Hank would be vulnerable to the killers. For untold minutes, Radu shadowed the cultists as they traced the werewolf's path of devastation through the trees. Then a chorus of unnatural shrieks pierced the stillness up ahead and was swiftly silenced. The figures halted, exchanging hushed words in their sibilant tongue. With hand signals, the party extinguished their torches, then crept forward, using only the lambent moon as their guide. Radu matched their stealthy approach, daggers of anticipation twisting in his gut. The cultists had found their quarry at last. May the fates grant him enough time to make a difference. Sliding between branches, Radu arrived at the massacre only moments after the cultists. In an enclosed grotto, Hank, in his lupine form, stood blood-drenched and panting over a pair of savaged cultist corpses. Snarls still rumbled from his barrel chest as his pale golden eyes reflected the sparse moonlight. The newly arrived cultists fanned out, wicked blades glinting, eager for revenge on the creature who'd killed so many of their fellows. Hank turned with bared fangs, fur bristling along his arched spine, they outnumbered him and arranged themselves with swaggering confidence because of it. One cultist raised a bamboo tube and put it to his lips, aiming it at Hank. With a piercing cry, Radu burst from cover and slammed into the man with the blowgun, smashing him down. Then he barreled into the rear of the cultist formation before they could encircle Hank. Daggers flailed toward his head and neck, but his rusted mail turned them aside. Enlivened by combat, Radu beheaded one figure with a clean sweep of his ancient broadsword. The corpse crumpled, dark spray jetting behind it. As he wrenched his blade free, Radu glimpsed Hank's lanky bestial form lunge into the fray, claws and fangs shredding resistant flesh with savage efficacy. 
but the wolf showed none of the restraint or finesse Hank displayed as a man. He was a force of primal fury, intent only on ripping the life from as many foes as possible. Two more assassins fell in shreds. Radu spun to parry a hatchet-thick blade aimed at his ribs, the impact jarring his bones. Sidestepping the next wild swing, he hamstrung his attacker before caving in the screaming cultist's chest with a powerful punch of his sword hilt. All around the cramped grotto, the clash of steel on steel and howls of the wounded created a deafening roar. Radu dislodged his sword from a cultist's spine, just as gnashing jaws tore into the throat of the next black-garbed zealot. Hank's muzzle came away dripping red, eyes crazed with bloodlust. Only three assassins remained upright. Two turned and ran into the forest. The last living cultist found himself suddenly alone. Bewildered, he backed up. He died quickly as Hank leapt forward and crushed him in a pounce. Radu was horrified to see Hank's blood-drenched head then swivel toward him, yellow eyes alight with predatory hunger. The human intellect was gone, drowned out by the wolf's primal needs. Tovarish, it is I, Radu, the knight entreated. But if any glimmer of recognition penetrated the beast's psyche, no outward sign manifested. The slavering werewolf stalked closer, trampling the twitching wounded underfoot. With no choice left, Radu raised his sword to meet the coming storm. Chapter 43, Defense of the Hill. Nimrod heard crackling brush just beyond the hill. The expedition members lay in a semicircle, the principals, the sepoys, and the servants, each staring down into the brush and trees, which were far too close to prevent any enemy force from getting to, within spitting distance. After a few moments, a deer raced by, speckled and small to American standards. When it was gone, Nimrod wiped sweat from his forehead. The little doe had startled him and gotten very close before he knew it was there. That could mean disaster when their enemies came for them, which he was sure they would. He considered the madness in the village. This was a dangerous place, India, and he wasn't sure he should have come, regardless of any pardons. Lizzie had wanted it, though. She'd asked him to set right his wrongs, to become a lawful man, and he had a tough time telling that waif of a woman no on any matter. She had that kind of sway over him, a realization that both terrified and pleased him. She had also curbed his out-of-control temper, an impossible feat he'd always assumed. He never decided to get angry. Sometimes he wasn't even sure why he was. He couldn't trace the fury that rose up in him to any source that made sense. Sometimes a stubborn buckle would infuriate him, or his inability to read a piece of paper in front of him. When he burned food, he'd kick the pot over and smash it to pieces. Any man who dared speak against him, he throttled, sometimes nearly to death. He'd always been this way, and he'd been sure that it was his nature, as unchangeable as the tides, as unstoppable as the wind. Yet Lizzie wouldn't stand for it. Not that she'd get angry herself. She just wouldn't speak to him when he got violent, except to remind him that he needed to control himself. The first time... Her behavior had surprised him so much he'd not even known how to respond. But this quickly became their way, and soon enough, he'd become a much calmer man. Now that he considered it, he hadn't killed a man for a long time, at least not until the moment in the village when those crazed people came at him and the snake cult crackpots at the hotel. It had been at least a year since he'd done anyone any harm, and he hadn't lost his temper more than a few times in that entire spell. Except for Hank Bravo, he felt little irritation toward any of the members of his crew. Sure, he'd like to mash Hank's face into a pulp with his snooty arrogance and confidence. The man always seemed to know what to say, always making some cracking comment. He'd like to crush the man. And now that he knew good old Hank was a werewolf, that might even be a challenge. One he'd relish. Lizzie's face swam in front of his eyes. She was the most beautiful woman in the world, and he couldn't believe she'd taken a fancy to a lout like him, he must learn to control his temper. Maybe in that way Hank Bravo was good for him. The man was a continual challenge, like the way those old churchgoers like St. Francis of Assisi had endured pain and hardship, because they felt it made them better people. Perhaps Hank Bravo was Nimrod's stigmata. Behind him, Frail rifled through his damned crates and both Primcourt and Clara tried to quiet him. For a sick man, he was excitable when it came to sharing knowledge, 
and now apparently to sharing his inventions. Maybe Dr. Frail, like Hank Bravo, was meant to be the thorn in Nimrod's side, the test of his patience. Finally, he could take no more of the racket which was sure to attract anyone hunting them, and he sprang up to silence the man. But Frail turned then, and handed Nimrod a very strange, tube-like weapon that reminded him of the small cannons sometimes equipped on ships to sweep the rails during boarding actions. This one had six distinct barrels and a crank on the side. This is a multi-fire repeating cannon that is operated by turning this lever on the side, the doctor told him. The weapon was unruly, unbalanced, and had a giant curving metal piece jutting out the opposite side of the crank, giving it the appearance of an unusual creature with two misshapen horns. Nimrod took the thing, and Frail had him balance it. The doctor said, Normally we'd mount this on a tripod, but I think you're strong enough to hold it, aren't you? Sure I am, I can do it, he replied. If there was one thing Nimrod didn't like, it was people questioning whether he could do something. Sahib, something's approaching, whispered one of the servants. Frail hurried and strapped the thing to Nimrod, adjusting it at his sides and across his shoulders. This is the magazine, Frail tapped the curving horn. I have three others and some replacement ammo, though most was left behind. Primcourt came and waved them down, pointing at the road below. Nimrod tried to crouch while wearing the big thing, but couldn't do it easily. He glanced down the hill and saw twenty furtive shapes climbing towards them in the black. Steel-edged weapons glinted in the moonlight. Frail grabbed a little stick with a bulbous end and pulled a cord from it. Cover your eyes for a moment, he instructed, then tossed the thing towards the shapes. There was a searing flash of light. Nimrod had not followed Frail's directions to cover his eyes, and the blinding flash left spots across his vision. The little stick exploded like a firework and burned like a flare, giving it a strong pink glow and a good deal of smoke. In the light, several of the shapes climbing up at them shrieked in terror. It was men and women carrying weapons, some villagers and some cultists. Fire your weapon, Nimrod, Frail instructed him. Nimrod did as he was told and pointed the barrels in the general direction of the people climbing at them. It felt like having to manhandle a steer just to aim it. But he turned the lever. The weapon fired several shots at once with a sound like fifteen hammers smacking on metal one after the other. Nimrod stopped turning the crank, and if it had not been attached to a harness, would have dropped the thing completely. As it was, the weapon swung from his hands and smashed his hip, causing some pain. All these things at once, the flash of light, the mystical burning pink smoke and fire, the blast of some fearsome weapon at the top of the hill, even though Nimrod's initial shots went wild as he tried to control the weapon, had the effect of frightening off their attackers, who all raced back down the hill and plunged into the trees. Frail grinned, and Nimrod smiled as well. He hoped they'd come back. He wanted another chance to shoot this gun. From the other side of their small perimeter the brush rustled, and a pair of servants who'd lain down there to watch leapt up and ran towards Frail and Nimrod. With a loud bellow, several other dark shapes hurtled towards the line from still another direction. We're surrounded, Primcourt called out. It appeared Nimrod would get his chance to fire the gun again. Chapter 44 Bella and the Sepoys Bella and the two sepoys veered away from the village toward where she thought Hank had gone. They found a trail that angled into the jungle, skirting a pond the sepoys told her was called a jeel in the local tongue, then found a forester track that cut into the trees, heading in the right direction. She carried her pistols ready to fire, holding them steady, but her mind was in complete turmoil. What would she do if Hank had murdered Ram or Jane? She'd have to kill him. Her throat tightened at the thought, and she forced down a hard swallow. She'd have to do it. A screaming villager raced across their path and all three stopped, raising their weapons and crouching, but the man ran off into the forest, arms waving frantically in the air. What madness has set upon these people? Bella asked. Neither of her companions had an answer for that, and after a minute of waiting for any of the madman's fellows to appear, they pressed forward. The trees thickened around them, the spreading branches like limbs reaching down to cover the trail. Shadows writhed. The first time she noted one moving strangely, Bella whirled, pointing her pistols up into the boughs of the trees. But there was nothing there. What is it, Mim Sahib? a sepoy asked. She shook her head. 
She was breathing heavily, though she'd hardly done anything worth calling exertion. It happened again a few more times, but soon she concluded it was just a fancy of her anxious mind, a trick she was playing on herself, and she ignored the sensation that the shadows were alive. They wound through thickets of bamboo, browned and bending, and she snagged her boots and trousers more than once on thorns from tightly laid bushes. Sprawling neem trees covered much of the land here, their trunks sparser than other kinds of trees, yet their canopies spreading wide above like puffy balls of black that joined as if they were one giant blanket of vegetation. Monkeys chittered in those branches, leaping about and howling, and Bella considered shooting one or two to cease their racket. Then the sepoy to her left suddenly vanished, and she stopped, turning her pistols his way while getting the attention of the one on her right. They walked closer to where the man on the left had disappeared and found a patch of black bushes, but no sign of him. Perhaps he has continued walking, she surmised, and they trotted ahead to where he would come out if he took the same path and found nothing. They backtracked along his path. The remaining sepoy's teeth chattered as he mumbled prayers, if Bella had to guess. A distant howl echoed through the night. Hank, she thought. A pack of jackals answered with their own baying. If something grabbed him, why did he not call out? She asked, and this did not help the other sepoy's confidence. His shoulders hunched tight into his neck, and he shook, staring round about them with his long musket held low at his waist. He looked childlike. She wondered if he was any older than fifteen. They set out perpendicular to their original route now, seeing if they might spot the other sepoy if he'd accidentally turned the wrong direction. But the terrain soon dropped into a little cut of river brush, and the dim light failed considerably. Snakes, the sepoy said when she was about to step into the brush. He shook his head and pointed back to the woodcutter's trail they'd been on. They stumbled and clawed back up to the trail. Ahmed is gone, the sepoy said. Tears were in his eyes. She considered sending the remaining man back to the others, but wasn't sure he'd make it. I have to press on. Can you continue? She asked the dark shape. He made some head bob that meant nothing to her. She reached out and grasped his wrist. Can you go on? Yes, Mem Sahib, I go on. Follow me closely. Stay right by my side, and for hell's sake, if something grabs you, yell out. I promise to do the same. The soldier's head was shaking so hard she could see it now, even in the dark. Get control of yourself, she told him. Yes, control, he replied, and he tried, taking breaths and rubbing at his face with one hand. What is your name? she asked. Veer, he replied. I'm Bella Blackthorn Veer, and I'm the deadliest monster hunter in the world. I've killed more ghouls and goblins than all the other monster hunters put together. I've staked vampires and stabbed werewolves right through the heart. When monsters go out into the night, I'm what they fear. She pulled out her silver blade. This blade is lined in silver, which is the metal of purity. It can harm or kill almost every kind of creature there is. She sheathed it and unclipped her dagger. This dagger is also worked in silver. You stab a creature with it and it's going to kill it. It was not much of a lie, though it wouldn't instantly kill any creature it touched. It would harm them. More importantly, she could tell her words were having a positive effect on the boy. He was not quite so jittery. She clipped the dagger to his belt and looked him in the eyes. He nodded vigorously. She told him confidently, One thing I've learned is that every monster can die. All you have to do is to kill it. When she pushed on, he followed her instructions and stayed tight on her heels. Soon, though, after they wound through some tight bushes, she thought he must have moved away because there was another shape to her left. Wait. There was also one to her right. She hesitated, and Veer lightly collided with her. He was still behind her. She grasped his arm and pulled him along as unobtrusively as possible. If they stopped, she feared who, or whatever, walked beside her would notice. She couldn't quite make them out, as desperate as she was to do so, until they stepped out onto a cleared bit of ground where the moonlight was stronger, and she saw they were dark-garbed snake cultists. They carried muskets and viciously sharp blades, and wore black from head to toe. Veer whimpered, but thankfully quite low, and this told her he had realized their predicament as well. She expected the cultists to notice they walked amid a pair of enemies, but they never seemed to. The group just trudged on. She might have just peeled away or stopped, but she couldn't be sure if there were others behind them as well. As casually as possible, she readied her two pistols, when they were close to a tree trunk where she'd have some cover. 
she whirled around and kicked Veer in the chest, so that he fell over with a woof of air. Then she brought her pistols up and fired over and over, as quickly as she could pull the triggers. The explosions of fire in the black were blinding. The acrid smoke tore at her throat and nostrils. She brought down the cultist on her left, adjusted, shot another through the head, winged another. On and on with such cold calculation and speed, the cultists did not even fire a single returning shot. Soon her pistols were smoking, and a handful of cultists lay all around them, in unmoving clumps. She reloaded as quickly as possible while moving from man to man, putting a bullet in each head that needed one. Why did you kick me? Veer asked. To get you out of the way, I didn't want to shoot you. Veer was once again shaking. She grasped his sleeve and ordered, Follow me, we need to get away from here. As they stalked on, Bella shook her head to clear her ringing ears. Chapter 45 Last Stand Radu ducked back and claws like daggers rent empty air as Hank slashed at him. The beast was swift, each swipe missing by mere inches as the knight ducked and sidestepped his assailant. But he didn't always miss, gouging and slashing Radu a handful of times, though it would take much more to stop him. Snarling jaws snapped together an inch from Radu's face. Only a last second retreat prevented him from losing a chunk from his head. The near miss left the werewolf exposed for a heartbeat. Stealing himself, Radu lashed out in a practiced maneuver, raking his rusted broadsword across the creature's muscled torso. Dark blood splashed the forest loam. A wounded howl shook the grotto, sending nocturnal birds exploding into panicked flight. But the injury only enraged the beast further. Hank pressed in with renewed zeal, heedless of the sagging flaps of flesh Radu's strike had opened along his ribs. Pain was no deterrent. The curse transformed his friend into a force of fury, unburdened by the frailties of the flesh. So Radu reluctantly raised his blade again and again, finding no pleasure in spilling Hank's blood. Yet still the werewolf came on, tireless in his onslaught. Radu backpedaled as gnashing teeth sought purchase. If he fatigued, the beast would claim him. Hank found Radu's flesh again, cutting him across neck, back and chest. The battle stretched on as moonbeams shifted between swaying boughs. Radu's armor now hung tattered, jagged furrows ripped into the side, evidence of slashes by the wolf's ruthless claws. Ikor oozed from Radu's wounds, the knight's unnatural essence draining as he weakened. Even so, Hank showed no signs of flagging. His lycanthropic stamina was proving the decisive edge. But then a sudden blast of ice smashed against Hank's muzzle, and the wolf staggered backwards in confusion and fury. Radu turned in surprise and found Miss Jane and Lieutenant Singh standing in the clearing. Glowing balls of light hovered near Miss Jane. Radu had seen such things before when Princess Veronica worked magic. The Indian warrior carried his golden orange sword and stalked forward towards Hank. To kill it, you must take its head or stab it through the heart with silver, he said. Radu held up a hand to forestall the warrior. No, we mustn't kill him. The lieutenant's eyes widened. You're quite wrong about that. We must destroy him. Hank slashed at Radu's back and the ghoul tumbled to the ground. Ram launched himself at the werewolf, his jab with the tiger claw sword aimed at the creature's heart. This would be the end of the fiend. When his blade reached the spot where the creature had been, however, it was no longer there. It moved with unimaginable speed, turning aside and lashing out with a claw to rake Ram's shoulder. Thankfully, only the razor-sharp nail tips touched his flesh, though it still felt as if someone had lit him aflame. He whipped his sword back and forth to keep the creature away from him, and the thing almost seemed to smile like a cat with a mouse. Then a blast of white ice formed on the werewolf, a thin layer though it slowed the creature for a few moments. Kill it! Jane cried, and Ram leapt to plunge his saber into Hank's heart. This time it was Radu who blocked his effort, the hooded knight rising to knock the blade aside. He is not evil, Radu called out. Ram let out a harsh chuckle. Did you not see all the damage he wrought in that village? And he's likely mortally wounded you as well, Radu, with his vicious slashes. You, who are so quick to protect him. His closest friend. You don't even bleed, Radu. What sorcery is this? Jane called. She could see like an owl in the dark, clearly making out the lack of blood, 
despite the terrible damage to his armor. My armor has blocked it, Radu said unconvincingly. Hank rushed at Ram then, and Radu batted Hank aside with one shoulder, tossing the werewolf into a growling heap. On his way down, Hank lashed out with a claw that tore open Radu's face covering. No, Hank, Radu called. There is something most bizarre about you, Radu, Jane said, studying him closely. Your eyes glow with the palest white blue. Are you a magician as well? No, madam, I'm a zombie, Radu informed them with his typical guileless honesty. He was no great liar and was thankful to have his secret out in the open. What is a zombie? Jane asked, though she thought she knew it was something that Moss would call evil. I know of these creatures, they are undead like ghosts, yet they retain their body, Ram told her, backing up now to stand beside her. I cannot believe we have been travelling with such monsters in our midst, Jane exclaimed. I would not have called either of them evil. Hank climbed back to his feet, blood dripping from his jaw, hunched and snarling. Don't worry, Jane, Tiger Claw will send both of them to the hell from which they spawned, Ram told her. Bella and Veer heard the fighting just ahead. She needed to reach her comrades, so she could inform Ram and Jane that Hank and Radu were under the protection of the British government, tell them that Primcourt had known about the two of them. Just then, several black-garbed shapes appeared from the bushes nearby. Cultists. One of them nearly bumped into her, eyes wide with shock when he saw who she was. She lifted a pistol and pressed it to his chest, firing. He tumbled backwards in a blast of smoke and flame from the end of her barrel. Veer fired his musket at another, then tried to jab a third with his bayonet, though the man parried the attack. Bella shot another, still looking at the strange glowing light ahead of them. She must reach Hank. She must save him. At the hill, Nimrod unstrapped the repeating cannon gun contraption. One barrel had misfired, and another was warped and glowing red. The enemy, a mix of cultists and villagers, had fallen back again, and Frail prepared another one of his lighted pink candles. A couple of them burned on the hillside, and it was dry enough that a small, steamy fire had kindled among the underbrush on one side, though it did not spread. The bodies of their attackers lay strewn about three sides of their perimeter. On the fourth side, the more open one which the road passed through, the bodies began much farther away. Only a half-dozen sepoys remained alive, but they'd armed a handful of the servants who had fought with some distinction against the shadowy swarms who raced up to the lines. Really, though, it was Frail who had saved the defenders with his devices. His flares lit the area so the enemy had no hiding places en route to the camp. His small explosive devices had devastated the enemy, firing a net at the attackers to entangle a half-dozen and break the momentum of the entire affair. He also had two portable cannons, not much bigger than a musket, that fired a grass and man-shearing load of grape shot. That had done the real work of keeping the enemy at bay. Every time the small cannons fired, the deafening roar left Nimrod's ears ringing and the forty pellets, each as large as a grape, shattered trees and people alike. They tore long rivulets through the dirt and made the bushes steam. Of course, Nimrod had not been idle during the assaults either, with most of the others who could fight gone, it had been up to him to plug holes in the line or go where the fighting was at its worst. He'd done most of the dirty work using the strange crank gun, mowing down three waves of attackers almost single-handed. The enemy had done their share of damage as well. Half the servants were dead or wounded, most of the sepoys were down. Primcourt had taken a bullet in his arm, which was now lodged near the bone. Two musket balls had grazed Clara's shoulders, leaving smooth runs deep in the flesh. The doctor had taken a ball in his side, though it passed clean through his skinny frame and had seemingly done little damage. Nimrod had been wrong about the doctor, he must admit. The man made airs like he was soft and weak and looked like death warmed over, but Nimrod felt a sort of awe of the man now as he regarded him. He was walking around with a bullet hole in him, calmly using his inventions to kill dozens of the enemy. Nimrod believed the man was one of the deadliest he'd ever encountered. He suspected that if the doctor had enough time and sufficient tools, he likely could find a way to do just about anything. Sahibs, came an urgent whisper from a sepoy, which yanked Nimrod out of his consideration of Dr. Frail's skill. The soldier who called out was one of the handful of surviving warriors. In fact, the entire group numbered less than fifteen now, 
and they'd pulled back to the smallest cleared area they could, where each side of the defense butted back against another. Frail was almost out of tricks now. I have two more surprises for them, and that will be the end of my repertoire, I'm afraid, he explained. This is our last shot with the cannon, Clara declared. Sahibs, they are coming, a sepoy called. Nimrod turned back to the bloody business of fighting. The shadows around Hank, Radu, Ram and Jane stirred. Your allies have come to aid you, fiend, Ram said. But Radu saw the very darkness itself coming to life and he swallowed with uncertainty. As the shadows formed into a dozen vaguely human shapes, Radu announced, These are no friends of mine. Then Ram exclaimed in shock as his brother glided down from a patch of murkiness up among the canopies of the trees. I told you to stay away, you fool, Anand said. He appeared almost as a normal boy, though his eyes glowed crimson. Who is this? Jane asked. The angular shadows around the boy shifted as he turned to regard her. Who are you, woman? Jane Avon, she replied. He is my brother, Ram told her whom I thought long dead in the attack that killed my mother. The boy, however, had his own titles. I am no longer a Nan Singh. I am a Night Shadow, one of my master's hounds, known as the Phantom. The werewolf had recoiled from the appearance of the shadowy figures, but now it growled. And what do you want here, creature of shadow? Jane inquired. The child spoke, its voice changing, so that there seemed to be many people all rasping out the same words, I've come for you, Merlin's heir, and for one other, the Lady Bella Blackthorn. The others I've come to kill, if need be. Ram held his sword aloft, taking a few steps to the side to put Jane behind him. You can't have her. Anand faced his brother. I can still let you and the others live, Ram. If you turn back now, my mission will be completed. Give me the two women and be on your way. Ram shook his head, and Radu came to stand by his side. We shall never do that the knight proclaimed. The night shadow hissed. Don't be a fool. You can't stand against my shade wraiths. We'll kill you in seconds. Better you are alive and free than dead. No, Anand, come to the light. Let me free you from your demon prison with the kiss of the tiger claw, Ram said. Zothan gave me the same offer when I found him, the child said. And as he did, he began to transform. His features stretched and his body grew taller. A fold of shadow bent around him, and then there was no boy any longer, just a cloak of darkness with glowing red eyes standing at least seven feet tall. Zothan? Ram's throat seemed dry. You killed Zothan? The night shadow, as he'd called himself, whispered, He killed himself when he did not turn back after my warning. Ram let out an oath. Please tell me you didn't do this, Anand. I warned you, brother. I told you to stay away, but you didn't listen. Anand... The phantom held out a clawed hand and a red-bladed sword formed, the back edge inlaid with spikes, the blade itself curved and gleaming. Ram leapt forward. The werewolf must have been waiting for something to unlock it from its fearful cowering, because it likewise jumped at the shadowy creatures. I am a servant of the light, Ram called out loudly enough that it rang through the trees. His golden orange blade struck the red one in a shower of sparks. Chapter 46. A Poison-Tipped Dart Bella turned aside a slashing scimitar and jabbed her blade into her opponent's wrist. He called out in surprise and pain, stumbling back and dropping his sword. She didn't give him much time to suffer as she pierced his heart, then stepped away to survey their predicament. Three dead cultists lie around her. Veer was bleeding profusely but had killed two other attackers himself. A handful of others had fled which left only a pair of cultists between her and Hank. They stood ready, swords unwavering, two stout shadows unwilling to get out of her way. She drew out one of the mushroom sticks Frail had given her and yanked out the cord as he'd instructed. Cover your eyes, she ordered Veer and tossed the thing at the feet of the two cultists. She wasn't sure what to expect, but shielded her own eyes as well. The blinding explosion of sparks and light still caught her off guard and bright spots of many colours danced across her vision. Veer exclaimed in shock, I'm blind, and fell to the ground, joined by the two cultists, who rolled around with their hands pressed to their eyes. Bella was not a bloodthirsty woman, but she had no intention of leaving two cultists behind her 
and so she dispatched both men quickly. Then she pulled Veer to his feet and dragged him towards Hank and the others. A sudden sting caught her wrist, and she glanced down to find a needle protruding from where she felt the tiny prick. Cold spread from the spot, running up and down her arm. Poison, she whispered, drawing out the thing and looking round. She spotted a cultist triumphantly holding a small, hollow bamboo tube hiding among the bushes. The air wavered, yet she had enough presence of mind and motor control to drop her sword, yank a pistol from her belt, and shoot the offending cultist. His smile slipped away before he tumbled to the ground. Veer felt her let go and reached out blindly. What was that shot? What has happened? A cultist shot me with one of those darts, she answered. Numbness enveloped her limbs, and she fell against a tree, smacking her head with some force, but feeling nothing. The wound both burned and froze, the feeling spreading all along her body. What do I do? Veer asked. He wobbled, his own wounds most severe. Bella's head lolled, but she swung it in an exaggerated motion like a drunkard, towards the clearing ahead where the odd light glowed. She was sure Hank was there with the others, but there was little she could do now. Veer sagged down next to her, holding his side. Tell me what I am to do, Mem Sahib, and I will try. I do not know, Veer, she replied, the world growing fuzzy and dim. Hank came back to himself while battling the shadows. He couldn't have explained how it happened. He was just suddenly in control, even though still in werewolf form. Perhaps the beast was frightened. There was certainly good reason to be. Their shadow opponents were filmy black, human-like in shape, and insubstantial in form. Attacking the graceful, silent demons, if they could be called that, produced little effect. His claws tore through them, but the wounds poured back into place almost immediately. Conversely, when the dark creatures attacked Hank or his allies, they had no such problems, and their sharp hands cut through him just fine. During a brief respite, he announced to his comrades, I have regained my faculties. Radu gave out a small growling cheer while fighting his own battles, but Ram and Jane glanced Hank's way with less enthusiasm. The woman had three glowing balls floating near her head, and she threw out lances of ice that smashed against the shadows with little impact other than a tinkling of exploding frost. Ram fought the spindly tall cloaked being, his brother, who swung its massive arms at Ram, tearing branches and splintering the trunks of trees when it touched them. The two were a blur, the giant night shadow using its arm span to keep its brother at a distance. Ram's sword never stopped, the man himself twisting, diving and lunging. He was like a human whirlwind, and Hank thought him perhaps even a match for Bella in sword fighting. Even so, the night shadow was backing him up, occasionally a razor-sharp sliver of its cloak jabbing out to impale him. So far the lieutenant had dodged most of the strikes, though he was bleeding from several small cuts. One of the shadow creatures flung itself at Ram, and the soldier jabbed it with that golden orange sword he carried. The thing howled and screeched, collapsing to the ground. Then it whined and hissed like steam from a kettle, and dissolved into a black slop, which boiled off into the air. Ram, use your blade on these others, Hank called out. The Indian paid no attention to his urging other than to tell him, Stay away from me, creature of evil. Hank thought the man justified in his words. He'd lost control. Again. He hoped he hadn't harmed any of his companions. Jane, however, saw the sense in the suggestion and gave Ram the same request. Your blade works against these creatures, Ram, and we need the help. She wasn't certain what to make of all of this. Even a fortnight passed, she would not have believed a single moment of this day. She'd have believed herself in the midst of a bizarre, waking nightmare. Yet the magic had come to her most naturally tonight. When she was in the grip of it, it was like standing in a field and having the wind buffet her, or like the pull of a river against her when wading. Yet she was part of it. She was the river, was the wind. Though perhaps the river was a better analogy, her talents remained in the realm of cold and frost, water, elemental magic. That hadn't changed, but in a very minimal amount of time, she'd seen what she could do with it, with no spoken words or hand movements needed. She was still an infant in these powers, she knew. She could hurl balls of snow or smaller slivers of ice with great force, and she had once tossed up a wall when a shadow creature rushed her. However, it was a poor shield, and shattered like glass the moment the creature touched it. 
They were not attempting to harm her, the things, but that one had tried to swallow her in its grasp before she fired a stream of snow at it that hurled it back in a heap. There were so many, however, and she didn't think Ram could get them all, even if he listened to her pleading. He was a mass of bloody cuts, his brother having gouged him twice with those long, swinging claws of his. She saw Mr. Bravo fighting with fury, right in the middle of the shadows, a blur of wild abandon on both sides, his attacks doing nothing to harm the things. Sir Radu was having the same lack of success, his sword passing through the shadows, without causing them any more than a moment of stumbling before their liquid-like natures sealed themselves. Was Mr. Bravo evil? That was what Moss had told her. All creatures of this kind were evil, according to the old mentor, and she had even specifically mentioned werewolves and the undead. Jane had been terrified in the village when Mr. Bravo was stalking her and Ram, but he had turned away from them instead of attacking, and now he called out to them as if he was once again their steady companion. She could not forget that he'd also saved her life back at her estate. Would an evil entity have done that? None would have been the wiser had he held up a moment and allowed Deepak to cut her throat. She also regarded Sir Radu. He was a somewhat absent-minded yet polite man. She'd assumed he was just a little simple or perhaps a little aged. Now, however, she could see protruding bone where the creatures had torn his sleeve and his shredded hood revealed a ghastly waxen green face with eyes glowing a nearly white blue. Was he evil? He'd never done a thing to harm her or Ram, and had even stood between Hank and them, taking damage himself, rather than let Hank harm them. He was also quite concerned for his companion, doing his best to protect Hank, even as the werewolf attacked the brave knight. She found it unlikely he was evil. As the good book said, Ye shall know them by their fruits. She hesitated to label Mr. Bravo good, but she certainly could put Radu on that side of the line. Perhaps there was more nuance to these beasts than Moss understood. Ram, she called, reminding him of what she'd said. He gave no impression that he'd heard her, furiously attacking his brother with all his might. The agile swordsman caught his brother's sleeve with a slash of his sword, and the thing howled in pain and reared back, smoke rising from the wound. Bella was dreaming of comforting shadows when Veer shook her awake. You must stay awake, Memsahib. She swatted at his arm, the blow weak as a gnat sting. Let me be. What do I do? You must tell me, the boy pleaded with her. The urgency in his voice caught at her and she opened her eyes. He was very close, the whites of his eyes large in the dimness and his teeth visible. Do, she asked. She could not connect his question with anything going on with her dying. Yes, Memsahib, what do I do? There is nothing to do. Nothing that can be done. You cannot die. The need in his voice again pulled her from her stupor. He wanted something desperately. Finally, it came to her. She was dying. She would be leaving him here alone. Or so he must think. But that was not true. Just ahead of them, in that eerie bit of light, she wagered her companions were in the midst of some dire battle. Take three of those mushroom light sticks and throw them between here and that glow yonder, Bella told Veer. She explained briefly how they work, slurring her words. Pop, pop, pop. He exploded three of the things. The intensity of the white, pinkish light and the smoke brought her to a state of alertness. She coughed. Go to that circle of light and find our companions. Tell them I'm hurt and ask for their assistance, if it is possible that they can render it. She dozed again, and only seconds later he was shaking her. Why wouldn't he let her rest? She angrily declared, I already told you, tell our companions, uh, I have gone and come back, Mem Sahib. They are in the midst of a grievous battle with evil creatures. He coughed at the end, and she saw he was turning a shade so pale he must be dying himself. The young man was a fine soldier. He wasn't going to quit, and that realization prompted her to not abandon him. It gave her the will to move the little part of her she still controlled. Take this, she took off the metallic bottle that Frail had given her. You're going to use this to help them. Chapter 47 Death of a Compatriot Hank fell to his hands and knees, 
Blood poured from a dozen wounds. The creatures he fought were vicious, the edge of each shadowy claw thin as paper, but their slices did not hurt or bleed much until he moved. Then the cut slid open, and the raw pain nearly overwhelmed him. This thinness did not apply only to their claws. When they wished, they turned sideways and became so slender, they disappeared. Already weakened from his battles with Hank, Radu staggered and stumbled. One arm hung at his side in tatters, and his head drooped, his sword held low, as if he might drop it. Ram had backed away from all of them, trying to shield Jane. Ram's brother, large crimson eyes glowing beneath his cloak, did not pursue him. He hunched, and Hank believed he might be weakening. Take the girl back to our master, the cloaked creature ordered. A few of the shadows slipped away, merging with the dark shade clinging to the trees, before pouring down out of the darkness next to Jane. Meanwhile, the river of power inside of Jane was drying up. She couldn't eke out much more of the magic, and wasn't aware of a way to recover what she had lost. But she had a pistol. She drew it now and fired at one of the shadow creatures, but the bullet merely passed through it, making the creature shiver and shimmer. It stumbled, then righted itself, sliding towards her like a ship gliding over water. Help, she called out, but her three compatriots were all done in. Ram tried, in fact they all did, but more shadowy creatures stepped in between her and them. There was nothing that could be done. The channels she held open stuttered, fizzing like a smoking blob of metal dropped into water at the smith. Desperate, she reached out and grabbed one of them. It felt solid, pliable, almost like the slick skin of a fish, yet clean like glass or porcelain. She'd only wished to prevent it from vanishing, but now holding it and feeling it slipping away, she wondered if it might have a more direct use before it winked out of existence. She hurled the ball at the nearest of the shadow creatures, the ball flew true and the impact was a blossoming explosion of light. The creature recoiled, hissing, and she saw its true form, a greyish person with dead eyes, and skin pulled tight over bones, as if there was not a single extra ounce of tissue there the way an animal looks when all its fat and skin has cooked away. Mr. Bravo shoved his way through the other opponents, taking cuts along his side, but ignoring the devastating punishment to get between her and the shadowy rates. He slashed at the exposed, grey-skinned thing, his claws digging a deep furrow in it. It shrieked and yanked away from him, clutching at the wounds. Jane shot it in the head and it fell backwards and disintegrated into a steaming pool of black liquid. Mr. Bravo turned to her. Thanks to your magic, it seems, we've found a method to kill them. Apparently so, she replied. Ram placed himself between them. Get away from her, fiend. Ram. He helped to protect me, Jane said. Ram swallowed hard. His shirt was drenched with blood and sweat, his face slick and pallid. I... yes, I saw. Can you make any more of those glowing balls? Hank asked her. She sagged, shaking her head. It is extremely difficult and tiring. Then, bursting from the jungle in a mad dash, a sepoy charged past her, holding a burning contraption in his hand. Cover your eyes, Raja Ram, he exclaimed, then hurtled the fiery stick into the middle of the clearing. Jane was startled, but had enough sense to follow the directions the sepoy gave, shielding her eyes with her hands. The explosion of fiery pink light was like the burst of a firework, but much closer than she'd ever seen one. The shadow creatures recoiled, a few of them revealing their underlying wasted bodies. Fiddling with something at his side, the sepoy lifted an arm, and an explosion of flame and scorching heat engulfed the world. Clara lay dying with Frail at her side. He applied bandages, but Nimrod had seen such wounds before. She'd taken a musket shot near her heart. She would die soon. Frail kept working on her, hands shaking and drenched in her blood. Please, hold my... my hand, Clara told him. I can't just now, dear. I'm going to save your life. He looked up at the people gathered around. There is a chest with tubes of medical sealant. Did we bring it? Clara coughed and grabbed his hand. I'm dying. You must prepare for the next wave of enemies. Nimrod glanced round. The dead and dying lay everywhere he looked. No one had been spared wounds on either side except him. The servants had taken the last assault hard, but they'd also fought well, or the enemy would have overrun the defenders. The enemy has left the field. Nimrod said. 
Clara studied him, her eyes weakening. Thank you for protecting Dr. Frail, Mr. O'Toole. Of course, ma'am, Nimrod replied. He picked up a bandage and strode to Primcourt, who lay near a stone, bleeding as well. His face was pallid, his chin on his chest. Frail called out a few more times, Please, someone, find me the tubes of glue. They are white. There aren't any, Nimrod told him. I've checked. We left them behind, Clara said. Nimrod could no longer see the doctor or the dying woman and was glad of it. He focused on the wounded Count. Primcourt's face and clothing were as red as if dipped in blood. Where are you hurt, Primcourt? Nimrod asked, trying to ignore the scene behind him. The man didn't stir, and he felt a hole in Primcourt's side from a bullet and three slashes high up on his abdomen, not deep, but bleeding profusely. Clara? Frail asked in a whisper behind him, and that stopped Nimrod's work. He held perfectly still, but didn't turn around. Then it grew silent, even the chatter of the birds and the other creatures of the jungle falling away. The doctor asked again, his voice strained, Clara. There was no answer. Back at the site of the battle with the night shadow, giant pyres of flame engulfed the jungle. The trees and the foliage burned, as did the shadow creatures. Many of the foul things were ash already, as if they'd been fashioned from dry timber. Their leader, the Night Shadow, shrugged off his cloak, which was burned near to Cinder, and underneath his covering Ram's brother revealed himself to be a grey-skinned creature like the others, but two feet taller, impossibly thin. And with oversized claw-tipped hands, the fingers of which reminded Hank of spider legs. He no longer burned, the flames extinguished with tendrils of gloom that he summoned with a flick of one of those spindly, spider-leg-like fingers. But burn marks covered his leathery hide, and smoke rose from his shoulders and one ear. He either didn't have the ability or the desire to save his companions, and another of them collapsed into a pile of orangish coals and white ash. Hank and the others lay on the ground, stunned by the explosive force of the weapon the sepoy had unleashed. Whatever the contraption had been supposed to do, Hank was certain it was not supposed to immolate its bearer, though it had. The hideous night shadow flicked a hand at the burning sepoy, its claw ripping through the burned flesh. My master told it true. You bring foreigners and their abominations to these lands, brother. Spittle fell from its lips, and the crimson slashes that were its eyes, jagged like wounds, glowed with anger. Ram pushed weakly to his feet. Your master is the abomination. You are an abomination, Anand. He bent and retrieved his sword. I sentence you to death, Ram Singh, by order of the demon king, the night shadow declared. Then he raised one hand and slipped into the shadows and leapt down right by Ram's side, swinging the foul red blade at his brother's head. In contrast to its minions, who formed like liquid poured from a pitcher, the night shadow stepped out of the darkness hole, instantly and attacked like a viper striking. Ram slapped the enemy blade aside and the two dueled for a few moments, each hammering blow an explosion of sparks as their blades met. The others rose to their feet to help. The night shadow leapt once again into the murky black and this time came down behind Radu, slashing his back deeply. Radu swung Pommeldrake backwards at the thing, but it was gone by then, in another spot cutting Hank across his arm. Then it dropped once again near Ram and thrust the evil point of its foul weapon like the tip of a dragon's claw at the lieutenant's heart. Ram was just barely able to dodge the blow. Nearby Hank heard a pained groan and turned to regard the vaunted Sir Radu. The zombie knight sagged, the slash to his back deep enough that his muscles and tendons were not functioning properly. Radu, Hank called. But then there was no time to worry about his friend because their insidious opponent became a blur, dropping in and out of shadow, slashing at its foes, except for Miss Avon, whom it did not attack, moving with such speed that they thought they were fighting ten foes, all of whom could appear and disappear at their leisure. Jane knew that she must aid her fellows, and so she tried to find the place where her magic had gone, like dipping a bucket down into a well but she found there was nothing left inside her own spring of water. She'd used it all up, and a powerful weariness, as though she'd been a week without sleep, settled in her bones. And there was something else. The mental, magical barrier was there, the one she was afraid of, the limit that she could not cross for fear of losing her abilities entirely. She hadn't broken through that wall yet, 
and didn't wish to do so now and yet. She knew there was another store of energy beyond it, and Ram was in danger. The Night Shadow's blade cut Ram once, twice, and a third time, as it did its trick of vanishing and reappearing around him in quick succession. He cried out in agony and sank to his knees. No, she called out. She couldn't stand by and do nothing. She pushed past that barrier. It tore as thin as paper, and she found, inexplicably, a tap of magical energy outside of herself, one fed from all the living things around them. It filled her, this wellspring of living energy, and she did the thing she'd done before, without thought and without knowing how to do it. Four channels opened at once, and slender streams of ice fired from each one, so blue and sharp they looked like surgical blades. And though two of them missed, her guessing at where the creature might appear wrong, two others slashed through it with great force, severing one hand from the wrist and tearing a jagged rent in the creature's side as it passed all the way through. Anand called out in agony, sounding very much like a little boy, and staggered back. Smoke poured from the wounds, a greasy miasma leaked from his side, smelling of rotten pumpkins, but he raised his sword, preparing to strike off Ram's head, and Jane shot four more streams of icy power at Anand, these more like pillars or battering rams. They smashed into the night shadow and hurled him backwards against a tree, which sheared with the passage. That magical connection, that center of power, was weakening, strained to the point of tearing like muscle or breaking like bone. Yet she mustn't stop now. She must end the creature. She strode toward it, the pyres of flame she passed winking out as her frigid aura touched them and found the night shadow trying to rise, twisted unnaturally, black ooze issuing from its wounds. It smiled at her, teeth cracked and mouth askew. Heir of Merlin, you cannot stop me. I will heal. I am a servant of the living world, she said. I end thee, hideous abomination, in the name of the natural order of Prithvi, the living earth, and I send your soul to its next life. See that you live it well, that you may be redeemed, Anan Singh. Her blades of ice flew from her channels once more, the slender ice sabers taking off its head, then stabbing it through its heart, and it exploded in a great burst of smoke and grisly purple fire. A piercing whistle filled the air until it was nothing more than a pool of black ichor. Ram coughed behind her, and she turned to see him holding a hand to his side. Blood issued between his fingertips. A surge of energy coiled up inside her, the same sort she'd felt when their laborers had risen up in rebellion and attacked her estate. Not Ram. Ram cannot die. She placed her hands on him and he opened his eyes, staring at her. The living earth was all around, Prithvi as Moss had taught her. She pulled at it. Something harder tore inside of her, more of the barrier meant to keep her safe. She summoned a channel then, as large around as a barrel, but there was no time to be shocked at the immensity of it. Ram clutched at his tiger claw sword. I wish this to go to my father when I die, he told her. She poured the Prithvi into him. All of it she could hold. An explosion of blue light came from him. He screamed. She found herself on the ground several feet away, covered in a dusting of snow and frost. The magic winked out then all at once like someone blowing out a candle, and she imagined she felt a stone door slamming shut, cutting her off from it. She attempted to flex that magic muscle, but it didn't respond, as if she'd drawn too much at once and now it ran dry. This gave her a momentary pang, but was a problem for another time. For now, she must see to Ram and the others. Behind her she heard Mr. Bravo coughing, and when she turned back she saw him kneeling once again, a man, aiding Ram by wrapping part of the lieutenant's shirt round his wounds. For his part, Ram's eyes were closed and he gave out shallow, ragged breaths. Chapter 48 A Missing Comrade Hank used his wolf senses to find their companions, he first tracked Bella's scent to where she and her sepoy had clashed with snake cultists, surprisingly near where Hank and the others had fought their final battle with the night shadow. Her rose water scent was strongest there, though he did not find her no matter that he laboriously scoured the area looking. Thinking perhaps she'd left, he backtracked using her scent, hoping that he'd find her hale and well at the end. At the end of her trail on the fire-blackened hill, 
where they'd left their provisions, with small pillars of smoke still rising, he found the handful of survivors. Primcourt was asleep, bandaged across his torso, while Freyl and Nimrod were walking about the camp with two of the servants, trying to save any of the wounded they could, though with little success, it appeared. The sight shocked Hank. The servants and the sepoys were mostly dead, laying mixed with piles of the crazed villagers and several snake cultists. It had been a hellish battle on the hill, and there were scores dead. The survivors worked to gather their own dead, and he caught sight of a diminutive figure lying in an orderly row of bodies, draped in a camp blanket. Fearful of what he might find, he hurried over, his heart pounding in his chest, and took a tense look under the blanket. It was Clara. He felt an overpowering mix of emotions, relief and guilt, a sharp sting of sorrow, a weariness that might never be relieved. Numb shock the sort that allowed one to proceed in the face of such tragedy. His eyes took it all in. It was one gruesome blow after another, looking at all the bodies. When he'd had his fill of looking at them, he turned to see Frail making a great effort to ignore him. Tear tracks ran through the dirt and blood on the man's face, his eyes blank. He never once glanced at Clara, avoided it as if seeing her body might make it real. What of Bella? Hank asked knowing it was a cold question but unable to do much for the dead other than grieve. Nimrod, who was the only one among them not wounded, pointed back the way Hank had come. She took two sepoys and went to rescue you and the others, though I thought it was a fool's errand. Hank frowned. I tracked her back here. She did not return. Nimrod gave a bare shake of his head. She did not. Hank gazed back in the direction of the final battle with the Night Shadow, where Jane waited with Ram and Radu, both too injured to move. There was a good mile between the two. I didn't see her, Hank told them, though he said it so low he was not sure they heard. What of Lieutenant Singh and Sir Radu? What of Miss Avon? Nimrod asked Hank. They were all alive the last I saw, though Ram is grievously wounded and I don't expect him to live out the day, Hank replied. Nimrod picked up two of the bearer poles and set them alongside his broad shoulders. Let's go get them, he said. Hank nodded and bent to also grab a jug of water. The expedition is finished, Dr. Frail said. His voice was hollow, and both men turned back to look at him. His spectacles were missing, likely lost amid all the fighting, and his clothing torn and bloodied. A dirty bandage wound around his side. He resembled a man who journeyed through the darker side of hell. They all did. Nothing is finished, another raspy voice called. We press on and Primcourt pushed up to a sitting posture. His face was a grim mix of the white pallor of blood loss and a blackened cake of dirt and grime from gunpowder flashes. We will regroup and we will press on. The three others studied their expedition leader with incredulity, but none had the strength to comment on his pronouncement. Let us gather our things and continue, Primcourt ordered. He attempted to move but called out in pain and ceased his vain efforts. Ignoring the count, Frail grabbed a bag of essentials and stepped up to Hank. I'll go along. Perhaps I might be of assistance with Ram. Thank you, Doctor, Nimrod said. Hank could not focus. He was doing what they must to save his companions, but he could not stop himself from glancing round at every bush and shade tree, wondering, where was Bella? As they departed, Primcourt's voice followed. Hurry back. We must be on our way. In the grim reaches of Narakund, the demon king felt the death of his night shadow. He raged and schemed, and when his anger had cooled like a freshly forged blade, he called his two other night shadows and their minions. They were not as precise or as tactical as his phantom had been. The two sisters were cruel. Everything they saw, as the tradesman said, was a nail, and they were the hammers. He would set them loose now to destroy these encroachers before they could reach his shadow blade. This is the end of Merlin's Air, book two in the Beast Brigade series. We hope you enjoyed it. A preview from book three, Shadow Hunter. Creed Bravo needed to kill a vampire tonight. If he didn't, he was sure he'd be dead himself. Killing a vampire is no simple task, however. Not when one was as inexperienced as Creed. He was not his brother Hank. The man had killed a thousand monsters. 
Creed had been a lawyer before a pack of vampires turned him. His most audacious act had been choosing to take the bar, no matter that he didn't sleep for a week ahead of the exam. Well, now Creed was in a lot of trouble, and he wanted to survive. Creed, a hard voice called from the front of the tavern. Creed was hiding in the back, in some crates, and at the sound of Scudder's voice, he started. How had the man found him? Creed, come out here. If I have to come get you, it'll make it worse on you. Creed slipped out of his hiding place, trudging up there like a dog that knew he was about to be kicked. Scudder was alone, a big-bellied stout man with a permanently scruffy face, slovenly clothes, and an unlit cigar hanging from his mouth. He wore a dirty bowler hat, which he kept cocked at a jaunty angle. His eyes glowed crimson. There you are, Creed. I didn't think you'd come out. What is it, Scudder? What do you want? The foul vampire chuckled grimly. Don't play the fool, Yank. You know why I'm here. Creed was aware of the reason. Scudder had been a tentative ally of Creed's pack of vampires, at least until the new mistress Veronica had arrived in London. She'd gobbled up all the smaller packs, killing any who did not fall in line. And she'd chosen Scudder to be one of her new leaders. I don't want any trouble, Creed told him. Wish I could just let you be, mate, but Veronica told me to wipe out Dom's entire pack, and that's what I gotta do, you know. No hard feelings about it. Others have joined her, why can't I? Creed asked. Scudder made a loud smacking sound with his lips, then proclaimed, Now what would she want with a petty worm like you? You can't fight, can't do no special tricks. You got nothing she needs, Creed. To rise as a vampire, you got to have something that gives you an advantage. The tavern was empty except for the pair of them, the tables and floors still dirty from the custom of the night before. Creed gazed around, hoping for an avenue of escape or an ally to appear, but there was no one to help him, and he had no allies left. He told Scudder, I can learn to fight, my brother. Oh, right, your brother. Famous monster killer, is he? Well, that don't make you tough. Do it. Scudder grabbed Creed's shirt and yanked him close. The man's breath stank of rancid alcohol and a wet cigar. Creed had not spent his last few hours as idly as Scudder might have imagined. He'd visited a certain warlock in the city and paid the man a good deal of money, his pack's entire stash, in fact, along with a pint of Creed's tainted blood. And what he'd gotten in return was a special stake made of white oak with silver inlays, a potent vampire-killing weapon that was now tucked in his belt, though his hands shook too much to use it. The big man leaned in even closer. Well, do it. Are you tough because your brother is? Creed shook his head. He fiddled with his belt but failed to grab the stake. Scudder noticed. He squinted and looked down. What are you doing, Creed? Then he saw the wooden weapon and his eyes widened in surprise. Were you going to kill me? He laughed and shoved Creed away. Creed crashed into a table which broke under the impact. He groaned in pain. You think a little worm like you can kill me? Creed rolled to his stomach and tried to crawl away. Strong hands grabbed him and yanked him back, rolling him over. Well, I never thought you had it in you, Scudder said. I just want to live, Creed told him. Scudder grimaced. I know, mate. It's too bad, really. He studied the stake in Creed's belt. That's a nice-looking weapon. How'd you like to be killed with your own stake, eh? Never known a vampire to carry a stake. Pretty smart. Maybe I'll just take this one. He reached down to grab it, and as his fingers closed on it, the flesh sizzled and smoke spouted. Ouch! Scudder cried out. He tried to drop the stake, but his fingers wouldn't open. The longer he held it, the worse it got, the smoke growing and his hand blackening. Creed backed away and used a table to pull himself to his feet, scrubbing at his eyes with his sleeve as he watched Scudder writhe in pain and try to pry the stake loose from his fingers. Finally, the big man managed it, and the stake fell to the ground. Creed picked it up and showed Scudder his gloved hand. It's white oak and inlaid with silver. Vampires like us have to wear leather to hold it. Scudder's chest heaved from the shock of the pain and he held his burned hand. You tricked me. Creed jabbed the stake into the big man's heart. Yes. Scudder died instantly, and Creed searched through his clothing quickly. He found money, a knife, a soiled handkerchief, and finally the red dragon badge of Veronica. That's what he needed in order to get close enough to talk to her. He stood up to leave, but he knocked loose a small pouch from Scudder's pocket. Two yellowed bone dice rolled out. He frowned at them, 
picked them off the floor and studied them. Creed had never been a gambler. He'd always taken the safest course in every decision, the polar opposite of his brother, Hank. When they'd been children, he'd never climbed trees or swam rivers as Hank had. He'd always watched from the bank or the ground. When it had been time to choose a vocation, he'd become a lawyer at his father's insistence. He'd never practiced in a courtroom, however, because of the risk involved. He'd only ever had one girl, and when he'd found out about Mildred's family and their poor business choices, he'd broken it off with her. He regretted that decision to this day. She'd have made a fine wife. She'd been a fine woman, been worth taking a chance on. He realized now all his risk avoidance hadn't kept him safe. The vampires had come for him. Perhaps it was time to become a gambler. He rolled the dice. Veronica held court in the garden of an abandoned villa, bored to the point of tears. There were hours yet until dawn, and a long line of petitioners. She considered turning her minions loose on them and murdering them all. That would be messy, however. These people in England didn't know that side of her. She'd held it in check, even during her bloody removal of the old packs and covens to replace with her own. She was wiser than she'd been in her youth, not given to flights of chaotic terror without cause. She turned her attention back to her current subject. The vampire before her had a grievance against a witch. Something about a spell he'd purchased that she hadn't delivered. The witch vehemently denied the claim. She covered her mouth to stifle a yawn. Veronica was a princess, and this was how her father had taught her to rule. One must hear the peasants' problems so that one can help them. But oh, how it bored her. She thought about the list of grievances she'd heard so far. A vampire had gotten drunk on blood wine and fell asleep in a clearing. When the sun came up, he'd still not awakened in time to get to shade. He'd burnt to a crisp. His friends wanted compensation from the blood wine vendor. A witch had consorted with a pair of satyrs, and they'd robbed her cash of spell materials. She wanted Veronica to refill it, saying the pack should have protected her. On and on the litany of petty problems came. Finally, Veronica grew irritated and waved them all away. As the group turned to go, she felt her blood rising. She needed to kill soon, to feed as well, but to kill was the important thing. Then she saw a low-ranking vampire, a worm shuffling away with the others while holding a bag sodden with blood. She perked up. Now that was likely an interesting story. Bring that one to me, she said to her servants. Soon the man knelt in front of her, holding out the bag. What's in it? she asked. Scudder's head, the man said, his voice cracking with fear. You killed Scudder? Why? He was trying to kill me. Ah, you are one of Dominic's pack. Yes, I was. What are you now? Just someone who wishes to be left alone, he said. Why come here, then? You might have run, I hear your accent. You could have gone back home to America. The man pointed at the pair of hounds lounging at her feet. You said you wanted all of Dominic's people dead, and I don't think you'd have let me be. You would have sent your hounds. He was right about that. She considered this man. He was unimpressive in appearance, thin and slight, and she could sense he was freshly turned. He had no gifts, she assumed, yet... He had some steel about him, certainly if he'd killed that bit of dung scudder. The man had been a thug, but also competent and tough. She'd have wagered a hundred to one that scudder would kill this man in a fight. What is your name? she asked. Creed? Creed Bravo, he responded. Is it now? Your brother is... She let the question dangle. Hank Bravo, the man replied. An interesting landscape of possibilities opened before her. Do you know where your brother is now, Creed? No. India, at a place called Narakund. I'm headed there as well. The man kept his face blank, which was impressive, actually. Even passively, her charm should have had this worm groveling at her feet. Yet he kept his wits about him. There was more to this man than met the eye. I think you will no longer be one of Dominic's people. You are now one of mine, she told him. She assumed he would collapse in gratitude, showering her feet with his thankful tears. She didn't like it when that happened, but appreciated the sentiment. Instead, the man merely inclined his head. Yes, mistress, thank you. She almost thought better of her decision then. She sensed a strong will in this one. His body might be weak, but his will was not. Perhaps it would be better to kill him rather than let him grow stronger. She tapped her lips. No, 
She'd made her decision and wouldn't go back on it now. Besides, he might be very useful. You will come with me, she told him. With you, mistress? To India. We leave tonight for Narakund. Thank you for listening to Merlin's Air, book two of the Beast Brigade series. Please help us out by subscribing to our channel. This support helps us be able to continue to create content such as the book you've just listened to. If you'd like to pick up a copy of the book, you can find it on Amazon. Thanks so much for listening.